Bring the hell down. We're getting set to start today. Day two of the Open Sip Summit 2023. Welcome back to Houston. I know that you think you've been here, but after last night's endeavors, kind of felt like we left the city and somehow showed up on the sidewalk. <laughs> How many uh, people made it to the dinner last night? <laughs> All right. So let's get a sit down and a round of applause. And you think it's kind of So we uh, shuffling up our schedule a little bit this morning. Um, this gentleman has a slide up. I have no idea what his talk is about. What? Beyond Green and RTC, the QXIP Observability Journey. And we have... Yauchin. I'm not going to attempt his last name. Yauchin is going to... Bring us uh, some interesting knowledge and some cool observability uh, experiences. So, uh, without further ado, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Alex cried, my name is Yamcha Dushleta. What the hell is that noise? Let me see. Let me. Listen, your uh, your Tinder. Should not be on during. <laughs> should you? It should not be on during your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I'm a senior solutions architect at QuickSip and GigaPipe. Um, I lead solution design and management of the web R to C integrations for Epic and Query. Um, I'm a previous co-founder and developer on the thing, the web R to C. It's like a P2P video platform. Uh, that we developed, and um, I'm a mechanical engineer background, so I really love digging into numbers. Uh, QuickSip, for those who don't know, we make Homer, and I'm, hopefully everyone knows Homer. Guess that means I don't have to say a show of hands who uses Homer because everyone's gonna be it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so we're a research and development company. We do a lot of open source. We just love open source and being able to give it to people to use. And we obviously also have commercial solutions for observability. Uh, our headquarters are in Amsterdam and Barcelona, um, in lovely Spain. They have beautiful weather right now. Um, we have worldwide deployments. We have you know tiny startups that use Homer. We've got um, commercial big one, Fortune 500 companies that use us. So all over the world, we get to enjoy the global context of WIP. Uh, we've got a very self-sustaining business model. We got um, essentially our goal is to have good partnerships with our customers to see their problems and try to help their specific use cases with the tools we make. We try to make modular tools that really just um, click together uh, to solve multiple problems. Uh, we use the Robinhood open source model, so which means that those who are paying are also paying for the open source development. Um, and that way we were able to you know, carry on providing great tools to everyone and not just those who can pay for it. <coughs> so, observability. Um, there's lots of void observability use cases, you know, for real-time call tracing, we got search, correlation, and to end lake correlation, uh, data extraction, we do media analysis, log and event ingestions, API integrations, we've got some tricks for compliance that are helpful. We do WebRTC um, tracking, data science, we, we do uh, you know, Janus integrations and many more things. Uh, we'll go over some of those use cases today. This is kind of our journey of how we extended from Homer and, and VoIP only to observability as a whole. And we'll talk a little bit about how you can get started observing not just your VoIP systems, but also the, the, the hardware it runs on. And we'll talk a little bit about the roadmap for 2023. So much to look forward to. As I said, monitoring is dead. Observability is the name of the game. People, you know, they are not, not just interested in PCAPs, packets, and SIP um, anymore. We want to know, you know, what are the metrics for our boxes? What are the metrics for the calls? What are the logs that we want to see? And can we trace them? Can we see what's actually going on inside the system? 
Um, essentially, we want to move to full stack observability because our SIP systems are really just guests on another hardware. And we want to be able to see you know, how does our SIP system work and how is the health of the container underneath it? How are things working together? Is, is, things, uh, is our system working smoothly? Is the network moving uh, packets across smoothly? Or are we uh, you know, essentially victims of our own hardware? So, you know, Quixit is known for the HEP protocol. We have got Homer, we've got HEPIC, our commercial version of Homer. We've got Heplify, Capture Agents, RDP Agent. We've got our Korean stack now, which is a, a drop in replacement for a lot of things like Loki, Prometheus. You know, we've got metric, metrics, Zipkin um, spans. Uh, we have Datadog support, Elastic support. So it's really a drop in for the tools you're already using but to bring it all into one space instead of having to have you know, five or six different uh, solutions for your, you know, one for logs, one for metrics, one for traces, bring them all together into one space where you can go querying them, you can attach your Grafana to it, the tools you're already using just in a simpler and more um, capable, extendable stack. Um, we've got a bunch of open source micro tools, uh, you know, little transformers, data, uh, gatherers, connective tools, um, modules that go on top of uh, things like Homer and, and uh, BI tools. We've got you know lots of OSS contributions. We love open source. We love working and collaborating with teams and just bringing out um, the tool experience that we have built over the last years, you know, last 10, 15 years, to to bring more robust tooling out to those who we don't, you know always amplify what we do, we, we just make tooling when we need it and we give it out. Um, but the people who are using it are very happy. Thank you for the applause earlier. I think that just reinforces my point. That's all you get. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Alex. Oh, that's another one. Thank you. <laughs> so a lot of stuff what we built, that we built is dynamically composable. So uh, we have some component that is able to talk to some other component. And that way, you can build solutions that are really complex out of simple components. And that's, you know, that's kind of the lifeblood of, of how we develop our stuff. We want to be flexible, composable, and so forth. So, uh, first use case for observability. Um, one of our big solutions is the real-time call tracing and search. We help your engineers not have to go look deep into every single leg separately. You know, you have to go dig through SPC logs. You don't have to uh, try to find this one SIP message um, that you know is not working out, is messing up with your system. You don't have to do PCAPs. You don't have to look at Wireshark. You just open uh, our solution, and it will show it all. It's it's anything, anywhere, you know, anytime. You just open it up. You see your calls and how they're flowing. Um, we put them together in transactions, so you don't have to look at them as just SIP message by SIP message. Uh, you have media statistics, you see the flow, you have graphs, you, you see how, you know, which IP is talking to which IP. Uh, you can put the logs in with the CDRs and, and just see more detail. We also have automation for end-to-end -end correlation, so, you know, you've got leg 1 and leg B and leg C, and they all need to be somehow correlated. I'll talk about that in a little more detail. So we're cutting down the time to resolution for issues from hours to seconds. Also, the searching, we just make everything available about your call to search. You know, it's not just the standard headers, it's the custom headers, the IPs. You've got correlation IDs that you specify that you can search by. The statistics, uh, you know, show me all the calls that are months less than three. I just want to care about those. You've got uh, your call statuses, due duration, call quality, you've got some user grouping. That's all available for you to search, so you don't have to keep digging and then manually scroll until you find the one you're looking for. So here's a, a preview of what Hepic looks like, for example. It, you know, you've got the, the search result at the top. You've got a detailed flow of what the call looks like. Uh, this is end-to-end -end correlation, so you'll see you know, each IP at the leg as it goes. Uh, you can click on any of those messages to see the full packet detail, uh, some additional stats for each of those, and you can, you can see some of the tabs. You know, we have a timeline, we have the session infos, we've got media reports, a lot of which um, we'll look at in a little bit. Um, 
and the logs, and you can export these to share with your customers, or you can export them to share with another engineer and say, hey, I'm seeing this, can you have a look? So very simple, straightforward, and, and powerful. End-to-end -end correlation. If your flow has, looks like a spider, then correlate the legs, right? Um, our goal is to make it easy to correlate all the legs. So we, we have a cascading search um, script that you can define your logic and how your legs correlate to each other. You click on a call to see the detail, and in the back end, it just goes, finds those additional legs we know already exist and puts them together into this one view. So now you really have end-to-end -end, uh, correlation based on your use case, on your flow. So it's not just some basic default. We do have well-tested defaults for most use cases. They're already there, but if there's you know, a special case like uh, you know, XC ID headers, key asserted ID, or you got a from user that has just the first three letters will match to another leg, that's all possible to just extract. Uh, it's cascading, so it will find the next leg and then try to find another leg from that leg. So it just goes down the rabbit hole until it finds your end to end. From any position you call on the middle leg, you'll find the, you know, the forwards and backwards. You call on the front one, you'll find all the way to the back. So end to end, um, it's really super, super helpful. We have a lot of customers that you know, have those kind of cases where, oh, we need to extract this one part of, of a call header and then match that part with another part in a different call header. It's all possible thanks to for this, uh, for this solution. Um, Real-time RTP analytics, you know, there's a lot of stuff um, people do, like record the RTP and then have to go check it out later to see how the quality was. They have to um, process all the PCAPs. You know, they have to stream them from one client to another to be able to see how, well, how did it go. Obviously, it's a nightmare for privacy and GDPR because you're actually recording someone's call. Um, you know, it's a lot of work to try to see how did my stream actually go. What we do in our solution is we just do it on the fly, in memory. Uh, we don't look at the payload. We aggregate the stats as it goes, so it's real time. Um, you know, you've got the automatic SIP, SDP, and NGCP correlation, so you know this RTP is supposed to be for this, for this call that will be attached to it automatically. You've got a very small bandwidth to actually see the real-time metrics. So um, along with that, you get MOS, you get SSRC changes. It looks for big jumps, uh, you know, one direction uh, detection, you know, only one person is streaming. You've got the time series integration, so you'll actually see the stats over time. How did my call go over time? Uh, I'll have a picture in a minute. And it's so light and fast that it's cloud ready. So we, you can put it in your cloud containers. You can get it along with the stuff that you already have to listen in uh, without having to save the RTP, without having to you know, go through a PCAP and wait till the call is over to actually see what's going on. Uh, this is what it looks like when you go and click on the media report tab inside of Hepic. So you see uh, these intervals um, right here. At certain intervals, they will essentially report back the stats of how your RTP stream was doing. Uh, you can you know, hover over it to see the detail. What was the MOS? What was the jitter during this interval? What's the packet loss? You know, was there anything weird about it? You see a graph underneath, kind of how it was going throughout the call. Um, there will be colors, you know, if the MOS was bad, you'll have like yellow and red, so it will show you nicely. And then along with that, it gives you the RTCP report of the, the end client. Um, uh, the client device, so it will tell you how they experienced it. So maybe your network is all great, but their experience was bad, so obviously there's something to troubleshoot. <coughs> So, real-time CDRs, logs, and event correlation, that's all stuff we offer out as well. There's so much hidden value in these, uh, in these SIP messages and, and in the TDRs that often you can just kind of lose it, right? It's uh, occultus and multis, or in, in other words, it's hidden in amongst all the many things. So there's so many uh, little data silos where you, you can't go and you can say, oh, you know, if I could only give a PCAP to my client, or if I only could show them that, you know, we're, we're all fine, and then it's their leg that is the problem. And so we kind of offer this integration with, you know, 
uh, query is, is one of the drop-ins. Prometheus, Remetrix, we've got InfluxDB kind of content compatibility, we've got Zipkin traces, and that can all be shared out uh, to customers. We were able to, you know, you can use our APIs, and there's another slide as well that talks about that. Um, you can use our APIs to share that value with customers, with your business intelligence. You can like just get more value out of your SIP traffic than just, oh, uh, there's a problem on this server. Um, we also have a great uh, you know, integration with WebRTC. Jamas is one of the, the major ones that we integrate with, but many more are available. Um, WebRTC can be a bit of a black box. We know a lot of customers complain about not being able to see much on those legs. Um, often you don't have a way to get the client front end logs. Um, and obviously there's a massive scale uh, often associated with WebRTC, so you, you get in kind of this little bit of an anthill, but you can't really see the insights. And so we developed um, some big tooling, you know, along with Querion, which is already uh, available to send logs to from anywhere, really. Uh, you've got RTC events and logs that you can gather from your end clients if you want to. Uh, you know, we calculate and, and aggregate the, the RTC stats so you can actually have an insight of what's going on inside uh, the WebRTC streams. Um, we've got, you know, if you have a SIP gateway, you can correlate with that so you can now see not just your leg and, and your side of the traffic, but also the WebRTC end together, end to end. Um, with experience, we are able to filter out the good sessions. We can you know, say, oh, well, well, we don't care about those logs. We can just kind of discard those for you and just show you the ones that are really problematic so that you can focus in on the WebRTC sessions that are have a struggle so that you can uh, figure out what's actually going on. Uh, we got a big customer that has something like 500k concurrent calls, sorry, streams, sessions. I just keep saying calls, the world, right? And uh, we're able to analyze them. We are able to give them metrics for Prometheus, you know, our query in Prometheus version. Uh, we're able to give them traces. They're able to have insight on what actually is going on inside Jonas and where it might be failing. You know, they, they have some clients that their SDP doesn't, the exchange doesn't work out. So we're able to count those and say, here's your statistics on how many of your clients aren't able to connect. Um, you know, we have statistics on Moss, we have statistics on how is the packet loss across all your different servers, how is the packet loss per session and per stream. So they're able to really dig in and find where is the problem at. And I think that's a relative new solution that, that's we're really proud of because it, it really it opens up this door for this whole ecosystem of WebRTC to see a little deeper on what's going on. Uh, also, we you know we can export them to object like we can export these analytics to object storage. We're able to make that available to data analytics uh, platforms. We're able to just open it up and add that value for them too. And so um, you know their data science team can take it into their data lake and put it together with other stuff. Uh, that they're already gathering from their clients and really see the whole picture. Now they have another whole data set that they can put together and say how we're doing as a, as a provider. So what I was talking about earlier, the, the API interactions are all real time and they're open. So you can you know share this information with your customers. Uh, often you'll see some um, Providers have like a, a self troubleshooting PCAP exporter or a, a flow um, customer portal that you can go in and say, hey, how, how are my calls on your system? And so that's all powered by, likely all powered by our API underneath. They're able to go in and pull up a call and say, how did it go? And then share that out to a third party and they're able to see, okay, my flow was like this, oh, and it was this server of mine or this gateway of mine that was failing us. We, you know, we can enrich the CDRs with MOS scores that we we're gathering. We can add all that media information to the CDR, so you can share that with uh, other customers. There's customers that use dashboards for reporting, for alerting. That's all available through the API. One of the big cases is also fraud detection. Uh, you know, we have customers that need to do 911 tracking. They need to know if, did the calls arrive, um, did everything work out, and then 
when was the call placed. All these thi things need to be available uh, for them to be able to track um, how their performance is and then obviously the compliance part as well. So that's all available through our APIs that are open for you as, as a customer to use. So um, switching gears a little bit to eBPF. Um, eBPF and querying together uh, allow you, and I don't know how many how many people are uh, familiar with eBPF. Give me a show of hands. Two, two people. So eBPF allows you to go into the kernel um, and listen in to your applications. Are you able to see things like how many sockets are open? Uh, you know, how is the performance of the CPU uh, usage of this application on this box? Um, you know, it really opens up all this information about an application without having to actually go and uh, change the code or um, modify the way that your application works. You can hook in to different uh, kernel points and say, give me this information about these applications. And together with Career, you can really take that information and share it back with, with the centralized point with all the other stuff that you're already gathering about your system. So you know, you've got uh, information about the instance, their CPU usage, the memory usage, the storage and network, uh, there's logs, it's all available now through EPPF, uh, and then Querin brings it to, together with all the other stuff you're already gathering. So Voice Center contacted us and said, we've got an IMS system, please help us gather some information about it. They challenged us, so yeah. then, you know, yeah, exactly, they challenged us, and uh, it turns out IMS is pronounced uh, a mess. <laughs> so I think, you know, SIP, diameter tracing, stream analytics, all of that, plus tens of applications and, and containers, metrics. We've got um, the whole system. We wanted system logs. And obviously, we wanted to see the current metrics, the KPIs. And EPPF in Korean, was it able to, you know, was it able to be the solution? Well, Here's a graph that is assembled from eBPF of how all the systems work together inside this IMS, and each of these, um, you know, each of these boxes allows you to go in and see the detail of how is this part of my graph working, how is this part of my system doing, and you get to see it real time. It also monitors itself, so querying itself is being monitored by querying and the EPPF to say, hey, I'm still here, I'm still reporting back, you know, everything's doing fine. It's, it's just showing you that EPPF is just this powerful way without much of a change to see your whole system. So each individual of these boxes gives you the instant, the CPU, the memory, the storage, the network, the logs, uh, you can, you know, really dig deep. You can set alerts. You can say, hey, if this, uh, if this instance or this uh, node is starting to spike up in memory usage, please let me know. Um, obviously, uh, because it's monitoring, it's also smart enough to say, okay, you're probably using this kind of uh, instance on the cloud, and this is probably going to cost you this much, and it gives you a real-time estimate of how much it's going to cost you to run this system. Including, a, um, including an idle cost if you're oversizing your containers. So it really gives you that insight together. So EPPF allows you to see the whole system. It puts it all in a graph. It allows you to dig down into each container inside that system to see what it's doing. And it also lets you project cost. So a little downer, because I know last night we had this big um, group talk about compliance and the regulations. Uh, we offer a lot of features to help you with compliance. Um, you know, we have full data encryption at rest. Uh, we have user fields that can be hashed, and then you can still search for them even though they're hashed. So that you're able to, you know, be compliant and, and not expose uh, PII and are able still to, to search for calls that are problematic. Uh, our RTP analysis is passive, that means we're not saving any payload, we're not saving uh, PII or PCAPs of the RTP, but you still get the full insight of how it was going. Um, you know, data is safely put in the regional uh, silos, so data is where it's supposed to be, 
but because it's uh, distributed queries across clusters, you're able to search from anywhere. Um, so we call it capture local, search global. Uh, obviously, we have user and group level permissions for all of this, so it's very straightforward uh, for you to apply you know, restrictions on what you can look at uh, which data. So, how can you get started on observing your services? Well, first of all, start with Homer if you don't already have it. It sounds like everyone already has it. Add query on top, and you you got essentially a whole box of things that are open up for you. You can connect, obviously, via HEP through OpenSIPS, FreeSwitch, Asterix, Camellio, you know, again, RTP Engine, RTP Proxy. Almost everyone has a HEP module. And, uh, you know, connect everything else through querying into the same system. So we support essentially the things you probably already use. Prometheus, OpenTelemetry, Loki, Elastic, Influx, Datadog. Um, anything you can imagine, if there is an agent for it, we probably can support it right away. Um, we want you to use the agents you're probably already using. If you have a Grafana agent listening into your uh, instances, use the Grafana agent and just point it at uh, query instead. Uh, you know, Telegraph, the Hotel Collector, Logstash, Promptail, you know, plus dash, our own solution. You can just point it at Quirin, we'll eat it, and we'll let you have full access for your, you know, Grafana, for your custom apps. It just supports the same APIs you're already working with today, and it's just available now in one space. You don't have to open three or four different apps to get the same uh, data. We have a lot of recipes. We've got a, you know, uh, we've got the Homer channel on Matrix that everyone's welcome to join in. Uh, the address is uh, down here below, and if you can't see it, just send me an email, and uh, we'll get you we'll get you the link. Um, you know, jumping over to the roadmap, we've accomplished quite a bit this year already. So we we launched Query in, in the cloud with uh, our D partner Gigapipe. Uh, we open that up now as something that you can just click, uh, sign up, and then start using. Uh, we also launched Hepic Cloud, so you want to use Hepic, but you don't uh, uh, host it yourself. Hepic Cloud allows you to do that. You can just sign up uh, right now for the beta and get jump uh, jump in. Uh, in quarter two, we also added S3 uh, to Korean Cloud, so you, you can save your data in S3 instead of uh, in hot storage, and then you can bring your own cloud. So we support double cloud, you know, Altinity's cloud solution, and ClickHouse Cloud. Those are just three of the big ones, and they're supported as a bring your own cloud. So you can host uh, querying on on our Gigapipe uh, partner website, and you can bring your own. So if you have a ClickHouse development, you just you bring it in. Um, we get uh, the Korean Cloud IMS with Voice Center, which uh, Shlomi will talk about tomorrow and today, I think, as well. Right? And you know, we'll have a workshop as well. That if you're really interested in, in this uh, part, you know, ask a lot of questions, bring the questions to the workshop tomorrow that Lorenzo will be holding because he, he'll be happy to change what he's working on in the workshop depending on your input and what you'd be interested in knowing about. Will be the second part of the day. Yeah, the yeah. second part. Don't talk to him like that. <laughs> And also we have the uh, EPPF integration for CoRoot and Bodigos. Those are two uh, EPPF solutions that are pretty good right now. They're open source, so you know you can get started right away. Uh, what we're planning to finish up the HEP agent with uh, EPPF support, um, and then in quarter three, uh, probably one of the next talks, Lorenzo will will uh, give. He will talk about Homer nine. It is coming. It will have S3 storage. It will have in-memory OLAP, EPPF support. So a lot of the great features we've already been using uh, in our commercial side will also come over to Homer 9. And obviously we're planning for a Christmas release. <laughs> oh, we're not <laughs> yes. I love Homer, it's great. So QuickZip and Gigapipe have partnered up very deeply. We're essentially working together as if we're one company. Um, we're just, they are offering the mesh cloud services and clusters. Uh, so they're doing all the cloud side and we're developing the Go on. So we work, uh, you know, we work together to offer this for anyone that doesn't want to deal with, with uh, setting things up in their own system and having to host them and maintain them. So observability is now available for everyone via Korean Cloud and Epic Cloud. So this is just to show how easy it is. You just go to gigapipe.com, 
Uh, you can sign up for the Happy Cloud Beta if you're interested. Uh, it offers Career in Cloud. Uh, on top of that, it's essentially two buttons. You go in and you say, OK, I want Career in added to my project. Boom, it's done. Uh, you want the Epic? Boom, it's done. Here's some of our information. If you're ready to come along and into our journey of observability, you know, Homer and Happy sit and then we've got Epic. They'll tell Epic.cloud. We got Korean.dev, which is the, the open source version of Korean, and we got Korean.cloud, which is the cloud version. Uh, there's so many other tools we offer uh, via metricodo.in and decapipe.com. Come check us out. Send us an email. We're super happy to help. We enjoy this stuff. This is our lifeblood. So, just as a reminder, support open source before you ask open source to report and you know, support you. We, we love open source, we like giving respect, and we also like when we get respect back and help each other out. It's a community. So, now it's time for questions. Alex? That was awesome. Thank you. Um, Let's, uh, let's also get another round of applause. Uh, QuickSynth is also one of our sponsors this year. I failed to mention that, but let's give you a round of applause. Thank you for your support. Not possible without the sponsors. It's not possible without you, but it's not possible without the sponsors. I think between the two of you, that's really what the community is. So, listen to the questions. Come on. I know it's early. There we go. There we go. I do want to mention Lorenzo and Alexander, for those who know, they're watching right now and they're just eager to answer your questions. So if you want to Stalkers. Jump, yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you want to jump on the Matrix channel right now and also ask your questions there, hey, they're just eager to answer. Hi, do you mind that from 8 by 8 Hi, Lorenzo. Hi, Alex. Hi, Josh. How are you doing? Hi. Um, just wanted to ask on the cloud-based services, um, can you go into a little bit about how my data is separated from other people's data? How that how that how that manages how that's managed? So. Yeah. So in general, you you choose your region that you want your data to reside in. That's what you set up when you set up the project, and then the data is separated out separately by your organization, your project. So there's no way for other people to just come into your data and start looking into that. It's separated in a separate. Um, Partition all together. So that's the way we keep it separate and safe and, and secure. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Let's see. Show me again. Throw it up. Don't be afraid. Let us know that you put the order on this one. <laughs> oh, there's one over there. Okay, I'm going to go here first because he's closer and I'll come right over me. On the demo, um, specifically around how there's no, you know, peak out or anything like that. But then I think on one of the slides you were showing just an example of potentially an operator that had a self-service pool where they could potentially view that information. Are there anchors or hooks into like separate repositories that may have that information, or or that apply? So you can export a decap of the SID messaging flow and then give it, give it out that way. But what I meant with not having a PCAP for RTP, so we don't record the RTP, but we do have, obviously, a repository of information about the SIP flow. Yeah. OK, one, one over there. So uh, I have a question about query specifically, because I think, because I mean, I've seen Grafana. So we're using Grafana and using uh, Promptail and some of the, those other agents. So, it, so query would be would that be like a different data source where we're going to use the agents or going to push all the data into that and then set that up? I could set that up under Grafana as another data source. So I can just pull the info out of there. Yeah, yeah. So you would you would select essentially a Loki or a Prometheus data source and just point it to query instead of Loki or Prometheus, and it would reply the same way as you would expect from a, from the original data source. So even though it's one data source, you can store logs and you can store everything. Yep. Everything in that one. Yeah. Yep. First in time series and everything in there. Yep. yep. Okay. So it, cool. it it eats whatever comes in and it saves it, you know, in a format that is able to be queried from the other side as well. So it does distinguish based on the API endpoint. So if you're using a, a prompt KL query 
and the endpoint enables reply of PromQL format, and so you're able to read it that way. If, it, you, know, if you do a low-key search, it'll be a low-key reply. So it does keep it separate based on the endpoints that it supports. Anybody else? Here we go. A fish. Uh, the correlation scripting thing that uh -huh. you showed up here, uh, is it available for the open source version? Or is it on the commercial side? I don't know, but this is a great question that Lorenzo and Alex want to answer on Matrix. So okay. just jump on there and ask them. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? I did want to uh, point something out. Oh, anyway. <laughs> Um, there was something in here that near the end that is a very important message for the source. You need to show respect both ways. And I'm not necessarily saying that there are people in this room that don't show respect to open source projects. But this is something that other people need to learn. People underneath you that are just coming up, you're mentoring them. You need to give them, you know, this sort of like a holy grail, it's one of the ten commandments to open source. Don't expect it to serve you only. It, you need to serve it back. So thank you for bringing that point across. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. And Pimsa, again, our sponsor, please give them a round of applause. Let Lorenzo and Alex know and make sure it's so much of the future. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Speaker. Mr. Jeff Pajaka. He's going to try and Seduce sweatshirts, I think. Do you need the gun? The one that shoots them out, like into the crowd? Oh, that would be perfect. I don't know. She only used it last night for another purpose. <laughs> she didn't remember. <laughs> That's a problem. Test, test. Test it again. Testy, test, test. Let's see what's going on. How's everybody doing? Enjoying your Houston? Is it humid and sweaty enough for everybody? Let's see. Bring this over here. Okay. All right. It's for Joseph. Uh, I'm Joseph Jackson. I have a. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, sorry. You run this thing? Well, no, I'm good. Okay. Gotcha. Go ahead. So, uh, Joseph, just so you know, give him uh, a little bit of slack on today. He's, uh, he's been thrown into this role. Yes. Uh, our original speaker, unfortunately, had uh, data center catch on fire. And uh, if any of you have had that happen, you, you kind of know why he's not here and Joseph's taking his place. So, he's going to be. Talking to us, talking to us about dialogue insight, enhancing open source dialogue observability. It's a lot of observability today. Yes, that seems to be like the watch word. Yeah, we're watching you. Yeah. We're watching you. But I'm from the Joseph Jackson. So, uh, thanks for everybody for coming. I am Joseph Jackson. I, unfortunately, I have to apologize for two things. As Alex mentioned, I am not the original speaker. Brian Bullock, Pyrotel, they had a, a data center fire. Uh, but he's a buddy of mine, and he asked me to step in his place, so I've done that. Um, who is all here use uh, Prometheus and Graphon? Can I see a show of hands? Okay. And then the, so, as Alex said, observability is seems to be a very common topic. And in the vein of observability, who wants a free branded hoodie from A and I Networks? Yeah, <laughs> get one. <laughs> Oh, you get one. Sorry, he was up first. No, and we go way back there. Yes. This guy's way back here, man. Oh, I'm coming. I'm coming. Free <laughs> And right there. Cool. That's it. <laughs> they didn't give me that many. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, Ryan could be here. He's the original developer of the software. Uh, Little thing about Ryan, though. Once again, I'm not Ryan, I'm Joseph. <laughs> but he's been working at Voip since 2009. Created, he's done a lot of stuff behind the scenes. He has some commits to OpenSIVs. Um, and is all around a really brilliant guy. So 
I recommend anybody get online, talk to him. I can make an introduction. I'm not a brilliant engineer like he is. Here's a little bit about me, though. I'm just a network engineer for AI Networks. I happen to know people like you guys that are way smarter than me, and I just glom onto you guys, and I look good in front of my boss. Man. I have cute dogs, I like pizza, and I'm okay at naming things. I came up with the name for Dialog Insight, which is just a Prometheus style exporter for open sips. Apparently, Querion can do all the same things that Grafana and Prometheus can do. So if you run Dialog Insight, you can probably import it to Querion and use that platform instead. Because got to get the Homer guys love. I love those guys. I would say that the biggest benefit to observability tools, from my point of view, is the pretty graphs. Right? I'm a visual person. I want to see what's happening in the network, and especially executives want to see what's happening in the network. But they don't want to see text-based stuff. Right? They, they don't want to see reports. They want to see graphs that show really beautiful things. So these are some of the standard uh, observability tools. A and I networks ourselves use it, and then along with the uh, Pyrotel, I'm sure everybody here is definitely aware of all, all these tools. So what is a dialogue observability? To me, that quote from Wikipedia is great, but it's really all data visualization tells a story of either what happened in the past, what's happening in the present, and if you use the right tools, you can see what's going to happen in the future. That's, that's really where I think observability comes into play the best, is being able to see the story of what's happening on your network and your platform. Um, benefit of the real-time abilities of Dialog Insight and these tools for you know, Prometheus metrics and exportation is it's live. You know, I know with on our network at AI Networks, we have a mix of open sieves, um, asterisks, and ribbon switches. But the ribbon devices, you know, they generate a CDR file exporting every 15 minutes. You're not going to be able to see the granular minute by minute changes to the network if you're, you know, if you're relying on old style CDRs. Um, using the, the, uh, the observability tools like Dialog Insight, you can get real time, real time detection of changes in the network, uh, and just really just see what, what's happening with your equipment. Uh, and it's not uh, impacted by pipeline issues, CDR importing, things like that. Uh, what is Dialog Insight? It exports Prometheus-style metrics for OpenSIPS dialog profiles. So I know OpenSIPS currently has a Prometheus module, and it tends to export all the statistics, but it doesn't. It's not going to export the, you know, the customized profiles that we create within the routing script to say track, you know, utilization on the trunk group, you know, kick inbound, you know, ingress, egress, traffic, things like that. Uh, with Dialog Insight, I'll give you a little story. I was chatting with Brian and uh, his colleague Carl from Pyroto. We're separate companies, but we do a lot of business together. Like I said earlier, they're brilliant, so I like talking to them. They, you know, I might have a good idea. Brian goes, "Oh, clever. Let's let's see if we can make that happen." So we were talking about how can we get. You know, better insight into just the open source platform of all the traffic that's crossing our proxies. Um, we had one of our own uh, Prometheus exporters, but it was very limited in scope. It was only going to export the uh, the profiles that we'd already predefined, and it that was pretty much it. It's great for what we wanted to do. We could get graphs for ingress traffic and egress traffic, um, but Ryan saw a way to make that way more robust and dynamic. And I do have to admit, I haven't had a lot of experience with it. It's a brand new software. And that's why he was coming out here to you know, demonstrate it for the world. Unfortunately, that fire happened. Um, it is a GPL open source exporter. You can 
Kid uh, from Ryan's GitHub. And if anybody needs a, a, a link, I can provide that. He has RPM and dev packaging. And it, it uh, communicates with the uh, MIHTTP process built into OpenSIPS. So the exporter, um, it connects to the local local loopback, gets all that data, turns it into Prometheus style metrics, and then you can consume them in Prometheus, Querion, any of those Prometheus styles um, to see what's going on. Here's a common dialogue observability pattern. I'm sure everybody's familiar with setting these dialogue profiles where as a SID request comes in, you create a counter, have a label, it puts it out. Um, before we started using these two type of tools, we did everything from just CLI-based scripts. So but that's not going to provide historical data um, or the pretty graphs that the executives like to see. So you take a look at an example of stack graph you can get in Grafana. I'm sure most of everybody's seen this. Uh, this is just an example of how you could have multiple ingress trunk groups and egress trunk groups stack them on one observability panel. You could go be able to see that. Single trunk graph. Pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the one of the things I liked about Ryan's tool was um, that uh, you could have within the routing script of OpenSIPS, if you set the dialogues into you know, branch routes that go to, say, jurisdictions, you can graph the things as you know, intermediate, interstate, international, offshore, toll-free. So you can get a one shot, you know, one quick look at where's most of my traffic going to. Uh, we can see active dialogues, but we don't even really know what they're doing. Um, an example like our in-house exporter that we had before we uh, talked to Ryan about it, um, it was just showing the amount of calls on a trunk. And you know, that's interesting to see, but it's not really giving you a lot of insight. So we can insight. Um, these are, this would be an example of what the what the metric would look like outside, you know, with inside of uh, Prometheus itself, and then having uh, Grafana is going to build on those graphs. Add some more insight. Um, trunk group, you know, each set in the, the OpenSIP script, you can create these profiles, I'm sure. Said, um, you know, for your jurisdiction, um, and all I believe all these are also dynamic, where you can go in, tell the tell the exporter as long as as long as OpenSIP is already exporting that, you don't really you don't have to restart OpenSIP at all. You can just uh, go into it to that. Um, here's some more uh, term trunk out breakout term trunk breakout for origin trunk group. Um, just the more pretty graphs. Does most people use Grafana here? Yeah, like you guys always use that. Are you doing things like this, or are you using SNMP? I try not to use SNMP anymore just because it's slow. It's not the the real time granularity that Grafana would give. So. That's why I'm a big fan of Prometheus and Grafana. An example of how you get the jurisdiction breakout on a, uh, a rich trunk. Um, joining labels enhances observability. Um, so by using multiple labels together, we can now observe more clearly what the dialogues are doing. We can also see how it changes over time. Uh, trunk from A was making a whole bunch of interstate call, intrastate calls. But then at 1 p.m. swap to interstate. interstate. Um, that could show, you know, see calling patterns from your customers. I know Piratel themselves, they have a lot of uh, notification traffic. So when the storms come through Texas, uh, they like to message me and say, what's happening? Because they can see a bunch of calls going to Texas um, to let us all know that a tornado is going to come kill us. Better understanding of resource utilization. They have done a lot of work over the last week on getting RTP in 
connections, transcoding metrics into Grafana as well. Um, I didn't know this, but I think there's an RTB agent guy here today, I believe. Uh, it already has built-in Prometheus metrics, yeah. from what I understand. We, I haven't had a personal um, experience with it, but I was pretty impressed by that. So um, you could see how many calls you're transcoding, how many calls were set up that might be transcoding, but since RTP engine is smart enough to know that it doesn't, it doesn't have to transcode. Um, here's transcoding utilization, which is always helpful to have to make sure you have enough compute resources, um, especially on transcode. Monitoring, um, see the ratio of requested transcode to actual, um, to, uh, to increase utilization, enabling transcode on more calls. Perhaps on that. Um, I also like to use Grafana for anomaly detection, especially with the open SIPs, Prometheus exports that you get, like not 503s, 500s, things like that. We have the Prometheus and Grafana alerting say if, if the past seven days, 503s was at a certain level and they've all of a sudden they increased, it could generate more than that which can be a lot more reactive, more proactive rather than reactive, and without having to wait for a customer to open a ticket about you're sitting a bunch of 503 sets. Just, you just further add more information into these um, Prometheus metrics for the state of the call. Is it is a 100 trying bit sent? Um, where is, is a, an attempt happening? Has media been negotiated? Is it finally answered? And then you can finally see all the calls and what state they're at at that time slice on the network. Here's a good example of the top K um, 100 weighting trunks. So you can see if this would be a good way to detect if you're needing more resources for your boxes, if there's a large amount of 100 weightings. And there's not, they haven't progressed yet. You probably need to uh, add a bit more resources. Um, generally, we always strive for a low amount of 100 weights. We want the calls to be established as soon as possible. Grafana does support alert. Um, we generally, at A9 Networks, generally use it for anomaly detection or if. The past historic trends don't follow currently, it'll generate an alert. So if we have, actually, Pyrotel, they have a lot of um, testing customers. And in the middle of the night, I guess, started getting alerts that there was 30,000 calls coming from them, and the previous night there was 12. So it woke me up, let me know that there's something happening. I, I am Carl and Ryan. They're like, oh, we're just doing a test of, of our customers' IVR system. Um, so I can silence that alert and not have to worry about it. But generally, that's one of the that's our main use case at AI Networks for Rafana and Prometheus is the observability and alert. And then, uh, <laughs> short little talk. Sorry about that. Um, but anybody have any questions that I hopefully can answer? Your question. Why are you talking longer? Um, just. Not, not having a great morning. <laughs> Listen, I think you've recovered very well. Thanks. I, I you just throw me here. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough hoodies for Yeah, that, that was a part of that. Um, that and you'll be gone. Car. <laughs> oh, my we Oh, my throat. Are we talking about the same thing? <laughs> I don't know about the Houston area, but up north, I'm a dead, I'm known for a really strong friend. <laughs> this is uh, actually in three counties, he's champion Max thrower. Yes. <laughs> um, as any good text, I you know, if we don't have any questions about Prometheus and observability, um, we can talk about percentage shit too. I love that. <laughs> Give me a chance, man. We have some questions over there. That man right there. Who is that there? Someone's got an arm up. How how frequently are you exporting? Um, so, as Prometheus does a scrape of the metrics, the 
the exporter queries uh, the HTTP interface from OpenSIPS. So however fast, however, what's your cycle time on Prometheus scrape will be how fast you're going to get those data. We do, for our edge proxies, we do 10 seconds. And the, the scrape interval, like it'll, I mean, it'll finish this within one to two seconds. So we have 10 second granularity of our <coughs> I answered your question. We have another question? Yep. David is pointing at somebody. I have to say a question. Oh. <laughs> that goes to show how useful you are. I guess, I guess, I guess the follow up would be that the slide you had where the state kept updating as the call was progressing, that is essentially just a snapshot, is it, then, of the current number of calls that are in 100 trying, for example? Correct. By trying. Yeah. What about anybody else? Do we have some more questions? Anybody? Come on. I know somebody's got one. We can just talk about life, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. We can talk about arm strength. <laughs> Do you want to arm wrestle? Um, okay. I'll I, I, only, I only Polish arm wrestle, okay? I don't know if Pol I haven't done Polish. I got it. Now, okay. You've never done a Polish arm wrestling match? Okay. That's where we pull at each other. You can take uh, the laptop off. <laughs> okay. Which one helps you? Come on. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody needs to be back there. <laughs> no, 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 it's not working. You see the guy's arms? Stop <laughs> <laughs>
uh, bring your child to work day. Uh, and so he brought me in and he put me, you know, showed me the laboratory, his lab, that he was developing uh, the television camera. And he said, hey Norm, check this out. He had a pattern of, you know, a test pattern. I'm sure he's, some of the older folks might have seen television test patterns. And he had a camera and he had an oscilloscope. And he moved the camera in front of the, in front of the pattern and you could see the wave on the oscilloscope change. And I'm like, wow, I was just, literally, I was just a kid, just bring your, bring your kids to, uh, to work day uh, at RCA Laboratories. And uh, that was my first experience with, with technology and innovation. This didn't exist before. We didn't have cell phones. We weren't, we, hello? We, we didn't have cell phones. We weren't, you know, sending text messages, making voice over IP calls. We weren't doing anything like that. So, um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Dad. As I said, he's not with us any longer. But my whole life has been uh, focused on engineering, on high tech, on trying to innovate and go the next level. Not be, not be happy with where we are today, but how can we move it forward a little bit? Uh, it's not about being famous. It's not, as I said, you don't know my dad, you don't know his name, but you sure as heck use use a camera that can take video, uh, show video every day. So um, you may not, people may not know me, I'm not looking for it. Uh, I just spend my life trying to help innovate, move the ball forward, and that's, that's a bit of the motivation behind uh, why I, said, I thought that creating a Rust module for uh, open SIPs would be a really interesting uh, way of progressing and moving the ball forward. So uh, that's that's a bit of an introduction. Um, uh, I would like to thank, I'm not going to say that I am a great programmer, developer, engineer. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time. There's things I do all day long. There are things I don't do. Um, I got hung up on the on building this module. Uh, I did call for some outside help and Jake uh, came to the rescue. Jake uh, is just, I'll, uh, I think I have another slide later on that goes into some of the interesting things that Jake has done, but he's a, he's very involved with the Rust community. Um, I believe one of the other slides that I have uh, indicates that, that he is the number one contributor to Stack Overflow uh, with the Rust tag. So he, he knows Rust, he knows uh, the FFI, the Foreign Function Interface. Uh, which is exactly what we needed to help uh, build this open SIPs module. And so um, I would definitely like to uh, give a shout out to Jay. He's, he's a uh, very experienced, very good developer, uh, has got a tremendous Rust background. Uh, so let's go right into a demo. I hope, uh, you know, there are not too many folks have done demos, but you know, we'll see, we'll see if, it, if it works. Uh, I've got a really small open SIPs config here. Um, it's the Rust module that we've got, this Rust experiment. Uh, as you can see, some of the, the folks that are developers here that do write open SIPs, uh, scripts can see that uh, this module accepts uh, integers, you know, as a count. Uh, of course, we take the typical, the, the, correct, the correct number is 42 in the hello world. Uh, it will also accept a string. And okay, so the flavor of the week is ChatGPT, and so what, what kind of a demo can I give with, without attempting to throw some ChatGPT in there? Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that we were doing uh, for our initial test was to uh, implement some regex kind of functions, and I looked at the regex module, and of course I found a safe fault, so uh, I committed a, uh, uh, or I presented a pull request to fix a, a set fault that we had, I think, both and got that uh, pushed into the master branch recently. Um, not much, this is a config, as I said, it doesn't do a whole lot uh, other than call this experiment, this Rust, Rust module that we've got going on. I'm using the options, I based, we based some of this off of the options module, the existing options module, because it provides a pretty easy way to get SIP messages into and out of open SIPs. Uh, without, you know, without muddying the waters with, you know, all the other modules and all the other crazy things. So that's the big. Um, to execute, 
to execute the, the test, we're going to run SIPSAC. I'm sure people know what SIPSAC is. As you can see, we've got a, uh, uh, a custom header that we're going to send in and attempt to, uh, uh, attempt to see what happens. Uh, this is the response. This is so when the test, when the, the demo doesn't work and the demo gods are not smiling on us and the test fails, this is what's supposed to happen. You'll see I highlighted uh, a couple of lines. The X Rust header is goes back to the um, uh, mod arm parameters that I showed you earlier, the hello world, the 42. Uh, then there's some random data that comes back. Uh, but the second highlighted line shows the chat GPT result we're expecting. So you can see it running, you know, OpenSIPS 3.4, blah. Um, so at that, we're going to actually try to run the demo. Um, I'm running this locally. Uh, the only time we're going to go out to the internet is hopefully to uh, see some chat GPT. But before we do that, I'm going to show that this module also supports the management interface, the MI command, right? People said, oh, am I this or am I that? Well, am I is the management interface to open SIPs. So I'm going to run this. Hey, look, nothing happens. Just get an OK back. Um, but if I just call SIPSAC, hitting the same open SIPs, you'll see that there is a Rust uh, header. The Rust header has our hello world and our 42 that we expected. And then the third number is a 5. And this is important because I'm going to go back and run this MI command again and see that we now have a 6 here. And it's like, OK, great, Norm, you can count. Um, the point is that the module is keeping state. This state is not stored in a database. It's not stored you know, in a cache. It's a variable inside the module that is keeping state. Um, and for the folks that you know that are that may be module developers, um, you'll you'll know that this is something that's that's actually pretty interesting. And I'm not sure if any other modules that OpenSIPS have does this yet. But it's you know it's an interesting feature for functionality that this Rust module can actually do. Uh, the the reason it's kind of interesting is that these MI commands hit, uh, may hit different uh, processes or different tasks that OpenSIPS is running. Um, and so being able to have a single module that maintains state is, is very, very interesting. Um, so uh, that was one of the things I wanted to show off with the module. The other is, of course, the Chat GPT, the flavor of the week, as I said, we'll, we'll see. It should be going out to the internet after it times out. That's why that C5000 is there, because, hey, it takes a little bit of time. And look what happens. We now have a header that comes back. It's highlighted. Can anybody see that? Okay, no. Well, put on your, on your reading glasses. Uh, but we've got a Chat GPT header that comes back with a response. So. To show that this isn't just contrived, I'm going to do, try to do a real-time demo. Does someone want to give a, something of a really quick chat, chat GPT query? It's not going to return a whole book that uh, I can key in, and we can see if this thing actually works. 30-second radio ad copy for open SIPs commercial. 30 <laughs> seconds. Radio ad copy for... for and open, open SIPs commercial. We'll give it a shot. Oh, sorry about that. He didn't like it. Forget something. Right again. The demo gods may not be smiling. Uh oh. Try something that I know is working. I hope that, uh, what was it? Um, generate a regex to 
validate and the email address. I know this worked. I just wonder if my demo is broken. Oh, it would be so bad if the demo gods are not smiling. There you go. So I don't know, I don't know why the, the radio ad uh, copy didn't work, but as you can see, this just generated a regex, well, ChatGPT generated regex, to validate an email address. Um, can we try maybe, somebody else want to try a shorter or some other ChatGPT query that will give us something? Tobin, where are you? You live on ChatGPT. Max? Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> anyway, it sort of works. So yeah, we continue on with the talk. God, I really like somebody just to go it wasn't something I came up with. Anyone? Why are we here? <laughs> Why are we here? <laughs> Let's see what Chat says. My mistake. I am a virtual assistant designed to interact with you and answer your queries regarding open oh, okay. <laughs> That's what that's why we're here. <laughs> no, that number will only increment when the MI command is executed. The the state yes, good question. Uh, that's why it's not incrementing because it's it's the MI command, the man excuse me, the management interface command. So here I ran it again. And we'll go back to that chat GPT query and we'll see. There's a setup now. Again, that's keeping states are really interesting for the module developers. Keeping state in the module without having to go out to a database or a cache is, is, is very interesting. Uh, okay. So, go back to the demo. So, that was the response. Yay. Uh, so the question is, why, why do you do this Rust thing? You know, we've got 180 modules. You can see on the left, you know, they're broken down into 12 zillion different categories. Uh, I tried to explain why, what the motivation was early with my story about that and, and the RCA laboratories and the development of television cameras. Uh, but to innovate so others can stand on our shoulders, that's exactly what this is all about. I mean, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for folks like like T Lab Bell Labs to to start start this process. Um, the Star Trek the, the Star Trek quote also makes sense. You know, we are breaking trail. We are moving the moving the ball forward. Uh, and that's why I that's my motivation behind behind doing this. Um, OpenSense does have some language support. It's like okay, why bother with Rust? What is Rust? Some folks here might not even know what Rust is. Uh, hey, it's got Python, Lua, Perl support. Um, they can all be called from open SIP scripts. Uh, these three languages are interpreted. They're not compiled. Not going to get into, would prefer not to get into any uh, heated discussions about the, the benefits or detriments of one over the other. If you guys are engineers, guys and gals are engineers or programmers, developers, you already know the difference. We don't need to have that discussion. Um, but for open SIPs to call these these languages, it needs to call a little piece of middleware, which is the module, uh, like mod Python. It's really a C program. Uh, so if you've got open SIPs core, then you've got the C program, which is this module, and then it'll go and execute the actual Python script or Lua script or Perl script. So it's not really native, per se. It's not like OpenSIPS is actually calling Python. OpenSIPS is calling like a C module that then calls Python. Uh, and I think that's a bit of a di distinction because with this Rust module, we have OpenSIPS actually calling Rust, which is pretty cool. Uh, so again, what is Rust? Why did you use Rust? I'm not going to go there. Just go to the Rust web page. You know, we've heard this before. The thing is wonderful. It can do everything. You know, it'll cook your breakfast. It'll slice your bread. It'll make your coffee. It's wonderful. It's the greatest thing in the world. Yeah, right. You know, we've been in this business long enough. Uh, so it's like that was a little bit of my first impression when I first heard about Rust uh, years ago. So. 
let me take another step back. Again, going into innovating and and, and why are we even why do we care about us? So the first game I ever played, this was in Florida. So I, I have an engineering engineering degree, computer science out of the University of Florida. Um, I don't know where you were in 1985, but that's the year I graduated. So <laughs> So before I graduated, the first game I played, which I'm pretty sure was on a CPM system, this is before DOS was invented, was Adventure. I don't, I, I'm not even gonna ask anybody in the audience if you've ever heard of Adventure, or if you know Adventure. <laughs> oh my god, I got somebody in the back. But Adventure is the bomb. That is, this is the first computer game. And you know, people innovate, and they move forward, they fall forward, and they do things, because you know what today, what I'm waiting for is, Starfield to come out sort of by the end of the summer. So this is Starfield, and you know, I'm not saying you need to be a gamer or anything, but the uh, the point is that that going from you know the video the adventure game that was running on CPM to something like Starfield is this whole evolution. You know, the invention of the television, TV camera, all the way to where we are today. Uh, why things like the you know, Things like, like developing code in Rust, developing open SIDS code, you know, voice over IP, all the things we're doing, this is why this is what we're doing. We are moving the ball forward. All of these things we talked yesterday, regula regulations. We are so far ahead that the government doesn't know how to catch up to us. That's why there's all these crazy problems. Okay, I'm not gonna get into the ball. But but the point is that the we are, we are the innovators, we're the folks looking at what's going on next. All of the metrics, we just got done seeing the, the demo, the, the talks about metrics, and how do we take all this data and, and provide some order to the chaos. That's what this is all, this is all just moving the ball forward in your particular particular area. I mentioned that Jake, uh, that Jake was helping, helped tremendously with this module, and one of his questions, and it's rightfully so, it's like, Norm, what are the open SIS folks going to do with this? Why are you gonna, spending any time on this, on this module? And again, going back to the Carnegie and Ritchie point and standing on people's shoulders, is that I don't know what people may or may not do with this module. But the point is that there now, we've broken the ice, there's an ability to lower the barrier to entry. We're able to now say, wow, SIP simply maybe with a, one of the 180 plus modules or whatever, whatever the Rust modules, maybe we could do some, some really new, interesting, innovative things. And that's really what this is, to me, that's what it's all about. So, uh, you know, why is Rust interesting? Uh, uh, as I say, you know, there's a fail to learn. If you're, if you're not trying to innovate, if you're just going to be status quo, uh, Fine, more power to you, but you know you're not going to be at that leading edge. And I will say that Rust has learned from from history. Uh, I tried to explain a little bit of my history, um, but he, somebody else can explain it much better than I can. And that's the, the billion dollar mistake, Tony Hoare. So if you've never heard of the name Tony Hoare? Again, someone that's not looking for fame or, or notoriety. Uh, he is. He's a contemporary of Kernighan and Ritchie, and folks like Dijkstra. If you're into all kinds of algorithms, it's really, really people that have spent time uh, in the computer science industry. Dijkstra, uh, those folks, Tony Hoare, as you can see, he actually apologized for creating Null. You know, um, we're not talking about all the other languages, but you know, they even have an acronym, NP. Hello. You know how bad is that? You have to have an acronym for things that it, you know, should, you know, the break. Uh, so it's interesting talking about the null being such such a unwelcome addition. Uh, why is Rust interesting? Because Rust does not have the null. Uh, Rust has an enum. If you're kind of a C programmer, you might have know what enums are, that will return a none value or some sort of typed value. Uh, you're looking at the only Rust code I'm going to put here because this isn't, I'm not, I'm not a teacher, I'm not teaching people to, to program Rust, I'm just trying to throw out at a high level, 
why, why something like Rust is interesting, why I spent some time and energy at it, and why I think it's worthy of, of having this talk. So Rust does not have a null, uh, a null feature in it. Um, something else about Rust, in C, one of the, you know, you may or may not know how to program C or want to program C, but strings are represented as a pointer to a, a list of characters with, that are null terminated. If you've been in this business for more than 15 minutes, you know all about buffer overflows. And overflows are a result, again, I'm not going to get into semantics and splitting errors, but by and large, uh, null, null terminated strings are, you know, the reason for buffer overflows. They get taken advantage of. Well, Rust does not have null terminated strings. Rust has a pointer uh, to the string and a length of the string. In case you didn't know, open SIPs since date well actually sir. So open SIPs is history. I'm not gonna go into all the history, but sir, then open sir, then open SIPs was originally developed using the concept of, of a string being a pointer and a link. Just like Rust is, just like many languages that came right after C because they realized how bad having alternative strings are. So open SIPs has been doing that since day one. Uh, I do remember years ago uh, where I was looking, I was working on some open SIPs core code, and I don't want to say it's myself or someone else, but somebody was using a string library like strlen, right, the string length. And I believe, I could be mistaken, it was so long ago that Bogdan, like, said, no, we are not going to have any, any of these string libraries, uh, null terminated string libraries in open SIPs core. Uh, I don't know yet if you relaxed that, but I do remember there was a, a, a very loud, no, we are not going to have null terminated strings inside open SIPs. You know, you wonder why it's so stable? That's one of the reasons. Again, an interesting reason why, why, why or a reason why Rust is so interesting. Uh, the NSA, for the folks in the United States, you all know what the NSA, the folks outside the country, you probably all know what the NSA is as well. Uh, they recommended getting rid of, uh, say getting rid of, they recommended moving toward languages like Rust and away from languages like C and C++. Not that C and C++ are bad languages, they were great, they were the only tool back then, so let's use the tool we've got. Today, we have other tools, we've learned from various mistakes, and the NSA did publish a uh, paper recommending memory safe languages like like Rust. It's like, okay, that's kind of interesting. You know, these are already, the, what I'm, I'm trying to do is, is paint a picture of, of reasons why Rust may be an interesting language to look at. I'm not saying you have to do anything or you should do anything. I'm just saying, wow, this is really interesting. It's getting my attention. Uh, the C++ folks weren't too happy, Bjorn, I think that's how you pronounce his name, he was not too happy with the NSA's letter saying, you know, C++ is bad, called status fake. Well, um, he did, this is his response, uh, that, uh, yeah, C++ has got some issues. Uh, and yes, let's bolt some new stuff on it to, to fix these, some of these memory safe problems. And that's all well and good, but You've got a language where you've now bolted on these fixes versus a language that has the fixes built into the language. Two completely different animals. If you've ever, I don't even need to go there. I think that was a, a good enough analogy that you bolted on a fix, you even tried to suggest people down the road in the future program in a more safe and efficient manner versus a language that comes out of the gate already I don't want to say mandating because that's not a good term, but comes out of the gate with these protections and safeties built in. So again, this is the reason why Rust is interesting. Not saying you need to throw your code base out, but this is why it's, as I said, an interesting thing to look at. So to continue, we have uh, Rust going into the Linux kernel. There is no other language, not Go, not C++, not anything else. This has been added to the Linux kernel. You know, it's an interesting reason to consider Rust to at least, okay, what is this thing called Rust? You know, why is Thorne even talking about it? Well, don't, don't, 
Look at why Mark's talking about how to like wonder why why Linus said, yeah, I'm adding Rust to the Linux kernel. You know, I think enough said with that. Um, one of the comments yesterday, I was talking to some folks yesterday, and they said, yeah, I'm also the whole Microsoft thing, and it's like, oh yeah, that's an afterthought. Um, I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan of uh, this company, but it's important to note that they've also realized that rewriting some of their code in Rust is a, a good, valid business decision. So uh, I've tried to present a couple of reasons why Rust is an interesting language to, to consider. Uh, not saying anyone should or shouldn't use it, uh, but it's something to learn about, and that's why we're here. Um, last item I think on my why is Rust interesting list is Stack Overflow, and uh, Rust is the most loved language, you know, by developers. Uh, seven, it's, I guess it's seven years in a row, um, and uh, as you can see the Python TypeScript are are there, but Rust is, and this was actually a surprising stat that that I had no idea. So if in your daily life, as you move along and develop or don't develop or consider things, you know, Rust is an interesting, an interesting language to start looking at. It, 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 in all likelihood, others will ask about it, and you could come back and say, well, I don't know anything about Rust. Or you could come back and say, yeah, I've investigated it, it's interesting. Yeah, it's for me, or no, it's not for me. But I've tried to present a few reasons why uh, it's interesting and part of the motivation for uh, developing this uh, module in Rust for OpenSys. So getting a little technical, some of the folks here can probably you know, zone out. Um, the FMI, the Foreign Function Interface, is the actual, I don't know, term. Uh, I pulled this this uh, definition off WikiLeaks. Wiki <laughs> <laughs> I pulled this term, term off, um, and, and I wanted to point out why some of the trying to do this was so difficult. And and the common common usage patterns, even for Rust developers, uh, to have Rust speak to C programs uh, are pretty obvious. You know, C calling them. You know, Rust or Rust calling C or whatever. Less common patterns have to do with with function pointers. Again, I'm not going to get into programming, but function pointers are a little more technical. A uh, few less use cases. There are zero use cases that I have found, or very zero patterns that use um, the they use the the way that OpenSIPS communicates via its modules. Again, going back to Jake, who created the Rust FFI omnibus. Um, he, uh, again, was great. I would not have been able to create the module without his support and without his help. Uh, but the open SIPs, I don't say problem, but the, the, te the technical challenge with open SIPs is that to talk to a module, the communication is via a statically linked global, statically initialized global variables in the shared library. I'm like, that's a no, that's like a mouthful, but trying to program that is like a whole other can of worms. Now, the 180, uh, 180 modules in OpenSense are all written in C, and they already have the boilerplate to do this. Well, Rust is brand new, and you know, Rust having to export. Uh, statically initialized global variables that also have function pointers. Uh, it's quite quite interesting and really, uh, really again something we're breaking we're breaking the ice at the very bottom. We now have Rust as a as a native module to Open SIPs. Uh, it's it's very it was very hard to do and uh, we've done it and it's you know it's great. Um, my particular de development environment, we don't really need to talk too much about that, but really, if you're developing anything inside OpenSIPs, why are you using Docker for Lima? It's like, you're not running, you're not running OpenSIPs on a Mac, you're running it in a Linux environment, so develop on a Linux environment. And it's easy enough to do on a Mac with a UTM. So, uh, here's the code. 
it is on GitHub. It's not. This is so so brand new. I'm still you know talking to Bogdan and the development team uh, at OpenSips to see if there's any interest in even getting this added to to the repo. Maybe there is. Maybe there isn't. Uh, but the code is here. Uh, my development environment, you know, not hiding anything. I've got nothing to hide. So uh, the code is there. I did, did not want this to be a code session where everybody's going to like, oh my god, this is only only for developers. Uh, but the code is there. It's working. You should, I, I showed you the flavor of the week, chat GPT. It kind of worked. <laughs> well, one of, two, one of two examples worked. And that's kind of it, you know. I, I want to thank everyone for your, your patience and attention. Any questions? Okay, who's got it? Yeah, Max. Show of hands. Max. Has to be right up in front, huh, Max? Oh, I thought you had a question, Max. Do you have a question, Max? Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I'm just waiting. Hey, Sanfra. Um, uh, question I got, uh, have you written any actual tests for this functionality? You mean like unit tests? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, like, uh, something like that. I've not written unit tests because the module is still under development. I haven't actually run any Rust unit tests yet. Uh, I've written some of the code. Uh, Jake has written uh, the majority of the code. I am learning Rust. Rust is not an easy language to learn. Uh, not that it's syntactically difficult. Actually, the syntax is pretty straightforward. It's the concepts. And the fact that you have to program a little bit, you have to think a little bit differently. For example, the, the not having nulls. You can't just program and expect a zero return code to come back from a, from a function and life goes on. You have to kind of think past that. And once you're past that learning curve, then, uh, then things start falling into place a little bit more. So I am very new at this. And no, I don't have volunteering to help. Thank you. Any other questions? Come on. Nobody? All right, let's give Norm a big round of applause. Norm, thank you. Okay. Our next presenter comes to us as our streamer slash master of everything video and audio. Maxim Sola from uh, SippySoft, who also happens to be one of our sponsors. So first of all, let's give them a round of applause for supporting us. Thank you. I'm good with the mic. Over to you. Over to you. Is going to be talking to us about a about embedding RTP handling functionality into OpenSips and other adventures in the RTP proxy land. By the way, if you don't know this. Max is the author of RTP Proxy. It's a core component when you're trying to build things with open SIFs. You can signal all you want, but if uh, you can't get the hello, hello, we all know what that's like. Max is. Coming, coming, coming. Coming. All right. Hey, thanks. First, uh, we got some giveaways actually. What giveaways? Hey, hey, hey. Oh, oh this guy right there. Hey! Oh. Hey! Oh. Hey! 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 Don't be afraid to take that move. Just get some people in the back.
There you go. There you go. Wait, wait. That is so Oh, 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 oh,
Sorry guys on YouTube. So one man show, man. <laughs> you're doing the audio, you're doing the presentation, you're broadcasting and you're yeah, yeah, yeah. tossing out. Yeah, yeah, so, so yeah. I, I, I switched audio off uh, so we don't get uh, copyright strike because the music is not on the sound. So if, uh, if we stream it, um, it might not really like it. Um, no. Yeah. Uh, so, so, sorry about that. Uh, so essentially, um, you just load the module and then you use your regular proxy commands um, like normally, nothing, um, nothing to configure. Um, and um, yes, basically, the status, as, uh, as Norm said, it's a very new module. So we're still kind of uh, uh, polishing it up. Uh, hopefully, we'll get, uh, get stuff uh, um, to the point where it can go into uh, repository next month. And um, yeah, basically we'll uh, look for some input. Um, well, I'm running out of time, but this is basically how it looks on, um, on the process. So we have several, several open six processes like workers. And that's uh, the main uh, process. 400 and that's all like that to be proxy threads here running around essentially uh, and uh, SIPS uh, does its thing. Um, so yeah, uh, some uh, future plans for this, uh, we need the uh, integration probably into the login subsystem. Uh, we want to integrate timeout notification mechanism. Uh, so it's basically again uh, like it fully automatic. Uh, you don't get to set up everything or anything. You just get uh, uh, immediately enabled and working. I think. Um, probably we need to figure out uh, how to uh, fetch uh, risk of risk analysis from OpenSips uh, to do like better integration. And last but not least, maybe uh, talk to Flavio and run some of his. Uh, uh, nice uh, performance stats. Well, uh, it's probably going to show the same results as the regular RP proxy, but still uh, um, would be interesting just to see. Uh, yeah, conclusion, like um, try this module for your next project, uh, see if it works, not give us some feedback, uh, uh, always welcome. And uh, there's some uh, contacts here, and I'll have a workshop tomorrow, so yeah. Uh, Any questions? Questions? No? Last ones? Yeah, one? Yeah, yes. All the way over there. Yeah. I'm not Alex, I'm not in shape. Well, Alex, thank you for the presentation. I just wanted to ask, um, how is it going with uh, fuzzing an RTP proxy? Have you managed to go through all the reports? or? Oh, Are they still yeah, I fixed the reason. Actually, one report came just yesterday, I haven't looked at it, but uh, whatever came before that, uh, I fixed pretty, pretty, like, last three days after I got it. Yeah, so it's a nice, it's nice system, so if you guys have any, any open source product that parses uh, some network traffic, really look at uh, those files. <laughs> Thank you. And not only that Maxim has been the broadcaster, the audio master, the photographer, the presenter and the speaker, is also the sponsor of our next coffee break, which I guess everybody needs. So we have a coffee break. Thank you very, very much, Maxim, for all your hard work and presentation. Thank you guys. We'll be back here in 30 minutes. 11 30 after the coffee break. Thank you very much.
Take a photo of us. Photo of us? Yeah. Still got my shorts. Wait, photo of us? Yeah, why not? Wait, 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 there we go. So, I was going to ask you, so, the SIPI, you have a right? You have, so is, how did you do you so do you fully support like the TLS also? Yeah. 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 Okay. And then kind of got distracted. Do you guys want to do Sometimes, like, it's kind of a project. Uh, okay. well, most, of the, most of the customers are uh, more like uh, organized. Okay. Yeah, I would say. I think how that works. So then, what did you do? 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 So you're selling, so you're selling the the service, some Yeah, it's basically full, full, full submission for okay. Okay. So that okay. okay, so that you're, you're just like for ITSP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, for yeah, yeah, and I think I think we're, so. What we're at, we're, uh, it, yeah, we're, we're, we're in the white space. We're in that area. So we're here. Uh, so it's just a lot of resources. So our plan is, and it's typically, you know, we're typically. We've been using but it's customs, right? Um, but we're going to be specific industry things that we have to do. I'm an expert because you can tell them, but in a contact with you, you know, they're not they're not experts in transcoding, experts in that kind of stuff. That's why this is kind of asking. 
Yeah. I'm sure we can talk to them. Yeah. 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 So we'll, uh, you know, I think we talked about that. Yes, that's yeah. not no, 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 no. So, um, yes, it's, it's, it's good. And I, I'm just trying to, you know, we're trying to look at what's, good, what's going to be next. Is that, and that's the real question. So, I think we're going to start probably the end of the latter half of this year. We're going to put up and put some, you know, start putting the programs together so we're thinking about it. And, then see the and, and the other part about it is it's all, we're being forced more and more to I really have a little thing to do it very well. That one thing that does everything kind of has a I don't think it's fine. I don't know who's in my presentation. Uh, it's a little bit, 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 uh, it's a um, like most of our stuff is very small volume. Um, so I think our largest sites we're talking about. And actually, and I should the launch will get six. Oh, it's our six million. You're way over. Uh, uh, you know, but it's, it's a matter of. It's just. It's. Okay. Hey, you did your job for presenting. So thank you.
یقیناً Microphone goes on your left. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you look dance. You know? If it was like you had another one and they were like coming out like in tennis, then yeah. Hey, let's go. Let's go! You can go back and shut your traps! Hi, dear! Well done! Quiet down! Get in your seat! Bring your cookie! Kick him out! Kick him Joseph Jackson. I mean, is he still here? Security didn't get him out? I thought for sure they would have like tackled him for like attempting to assault people in sweatshirts, but and then that whole freaking arm wrestling thing, you know, it's really threatening. Right. Chicken. It's turkey. Okay, we're gonna get right over here after our coffee break. We have uh, Mr. Peter Kelly. He comes to us from Source Box. Um, my goodness, you know, our speakers are coming up strong. Sourcebox is also a sponsor, so let's give them a round of applause. Thank you for supporting us. People <laughs> probably told us about designing business logic into open steps. I'm sure that uh, it's very interesting. I've seen some of his talks before, so please pay attention. Give him your uh, undivided attention. Be Kelly, everyone. Is this, is this turned on? What? Is this turned up? Is it you need to put it in your mouth. No. <laughs> it's like this. <laughs> I haven't received the instructions. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. no. Oh. Thanks, Alex, for the instruction. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Did anybody come to the, um, the recent conference in Athens last year? Okay. Um, so I, um, I wasn't originally going to do a presentation at this conference, um, but uh, I believe Jonathan from Connects uh, wasn't able to make it. Um, so they've asked me if I could stand in and do a presentation. So this is essentially the same presentation that I did at the Athens conference last year. So it looks like nobody has seen it, at least in person. So uh, yes, hopefully it's still useful and relevant for have you seen it? <laughs> hopefully it's still useful and relevant for, for everybody. Um, so what I like to try and do is when I do these presentations is try to tell a bit of a story um, about something that we've been doing or something that's been going on. Um, so and this one is about designing business logic to open the six, which is something that we do quite a lot. Um, so I don't view a source box. Um, we're a full service employment consultancy slash agency, um, and we specialise in design and modernisation of voice over IP platforms. And we've been doing it since since around 2012, uh, based in the UK, but we seem to have a lot of business in the US, um, Europe, uh, not so much in the UK actually. Um, and we used to do lots of calling card platforms, LCR type stuff, edge proxies. Um, and so as things evolve, we've, we've been dealing with more and more complex uh, problems, um, and such as things like US toll free, um, NAND processing, uh, stir shaker. And we also do have some full stack platform, platforms now. Um, we refer to them as full stack. Um, so in the UK at the moment, um, 
there is a drive to install fiber across the country. Uh, lots of uh, sort of privately funded uh, companies that compete with British Telecom and the like to, to open reach to install fiber. These companies don't have any te tele uh, telecoms knowledge, so we have this quite convenient full stack platform that will allow people to deliver telecoms over the top of their fiber network, uh, and it works quite well. Um, and we also have a good management platform, which uh, seems to be surprisingly popular as well. Um, so the original problem um, that I would want to talk about here is that we are kind of often approached by people um, who have an initial function voice set up, um, and they would like us to solve a specific problem. Um, and what typically happens is somebody will come to us and they have they have something like this. Um, so you know they've got some kind of voice implementation there. This one happens to be the asterisk logo, so perhaps it's asterisk. Um, they've got a database and they store information in the database like people do. And they've got a web app so they can call information to the web app. And essentially they, they do some kind of telecommunications on this, this platform they've built. Um, which is fine um, until, the, until some scaling is needed and people will tend to do something like this. Um, so we throw some more asterisk servers at the problem because we notice that you know, we're now scaling up a bit and we need to, we need to handle more, more call capacity. Um, so we've got a database and now we've got another web app in the mix. So we've got all this complexity being added. You know, we're, we're doing horizontal scaling on the web apps, of the asterisks. Um, and it's great because they can now handle uh, higher call volumes. Um, and then what people tend to want to do is then say, well, let's try and do something clever with our asterisk instances and let's do some load balancing. So they obviously discover open sieves, which is hopefully everyone in the room knows open sieves is really good at distributing calls, uh, load balancing calls between, uh, between uh, other voice notes. So we have open sieves um, and maybe we've solved the problem. Uh, but no. What happens is people uh, are experiencing uh, slow SIP performance, um, so they'll come to us and they'll talk to us about this. Um, they'll be identifying things like SIP retries. Um, they want to know how they can scale up maybe another 10 times. You know, they've already thrown more asterisk boxes at the problem, more web servers, and they're having scale problems, and they can't possibly see how this could get any bigger when it already looks like it's maxed out. Um, you know, what if there's an outage, there's only a single open SIPs in there, for example, you've got web apps that's point of failures, you've got a single database that's point of failure. Um, how do we cope with these kind of things? Um, that's something that is more common than we'd like it to be, is people are throwing up things in Kubernetes, um, and the thing just doesn't seem to perform well out of the box without a lot of uh, configuration. Um, and it's never an obvious reason why Kubernetes is not working. Um, yeah, so these are the kind of problems that people come to us with and the kind of problems we really, we really like solving actually uh, and helping people out with. Um, so just to summarise my open SIPs, um, you know, standard features that I think everybody will know about, it's really good at protecting network edges, um, it's great for authenticating and authorising calls, um, it's great as a TLS uh, WebSocket gateway. Um, you can make it act as a session border control with a bit of policy hiding and back to back user agents. Um, it's great for load balancing, we covered that. Um, transforming SIP, um, and you can also do some SIP proxying if you want to do something a bit old fashioned. Um, so, but we can also, and this is the stuff that we really like doing, perform complex logic and computation. So you can perform LCR computations, which we do quite a lot. Um, you can rate calls um, as part of the call flow. Um, you can manage ongoing calls using dialog uh, management tools. Um, you can stir shaking, all kinds of dipping logic as part of your OpenSIPS configuration. Um, and you can also do these two things. You can do fast lookups um, and complex decision making. And these are the kind of two things that I want to highlight as examples here. Uh, of what we could do to the scenario we're giving to improve it with a few of these things, fast lookups, uh, complex decision making. Uh, so initially to look at the fast lookups, um, this is the problem that we were facing at the beginning. Uh, we've got a single relational database, 
that we had many asterisks or many over the SIPs to talk into. Um, and with that comes roadblocking issues. Uh, you know, you've got your single points of failure, as I've already, I've already discussed. Um, and it's quite inefficient for real time things such as call setups. Uh, I mean, when you when you want to set up a call, you know, typically you want to do things like query who the DID, DID may belong to, you know, which account does that DID belong to, uh, how many calls are they allowed to have, you know, what the company currency should be, what the current number of dialogue is. Um, and you need to do that, all that in real time. And if you then did it into a relational database, um, you know, people probably queries that have got joins and all kinds of crazy things in there. It's just not efficient. Uh, uh, when you do it some real time on voice. Um, so, I mean, and it's obviously a bit of a valid scenario when you, when you first start doing things, but uh, there, there are better ways to solve the problem. Um, so, sometimes um, we will turn to something like uh, Redis, um, and this works really well for situations that I think has been mentioned a few times in the last few days, like DNO lists. So, we have this huge DNO list with like millions and millions of millions of records. Uh, this is the kind of thing that's really going to to put into Redis, uh, which is a, a key value store. Um, and you immediately get the benefit from moving to a key value store as well, because it, it forces you um, as a developer uh, or as an engineer to denormalize your data. So you've gone from like, using relational data, query relational data, you've been forced to denormalize it to get into a, a key value pair store such as Redis. Um, and Redis is great. Um, you can populate a master, um, and then the, uh, the secondaries can be um, can be populated with that data, and you can then install um, a copy of the Redis database on each OpenSIP server, and have OpenSIP's query Redis, so it's querying a local a local database. There's no latency, um, and it's very fast for looking for looking things up. Um, the downside is it's an extra app to manage. Um, <coughs> Within your, your technology infrastructure, uh, and it's also extra technology to understand. So you're introducing something else into the equation that you need to, to understand and manage um, on your platform. So, what we do like to do quite often is use the dial plan module for fast lookups. Um, so, I'm assuming everyone is, is familiar with the dial plan module. Um, so, traditionally, the dial plan is used for um, translating information into the piece of information that you need. So there's an example here, we've got a substitution expression um, which will find a, uh, a US 10 uh, phone number and we will convert it to an international format by putting the one in the front with the replacement expression at the bottom. Uh, so a little really basic example on the right of that, um, we're matching the request for our items on the 212 number, we'll call the dial plan translate function and it will prepend one to the front and it's done its job for the dial plan module. Really basic, really simple. Um, but what you can also do with this module is use it for key value pair lookups. Um, and so a little screenshot of the documentation there. Um, you'll notice that if you use null for the substitution expression and null for the replacement expression, then there's no translation. It's purely falling back to a key value pair lookup module. Um, so you can then put a visual string in the match expression. Um, it can be uh, any string; it doesn't have to be a number. Uh, and when you do this, then the value that you get back in the attributes column, you get given that back for free. You can do a lookup uh, from a visual string and get a visual result back. It's a pure key value pair lookup. Uh, and there's another example. Um, so, you, so for example, for this customer, we know who the customer is and we want to know what their default CLI is. Um, so we constructed a string, which is cust123 default CLI, uh, and the, the attribute uh, that is stored in the column is 1646876 So that's what we want to look up. We then construct the lookup variable, uh, put that through the dial plan module, and we get our result back. So same module, essentially passing it the same type of parameter, but rather than doing a transformation or a translation of data, you're just getting um, a string back for a, a value back for a key that you've input. Um, and we use this a lot. Um, you know, it's essentially doing, if you don't want any of the advanced Redis functions, uh, like any sorting or any 
and you can set, set look up so anything like that, then you can just throw lots and lots of data into the, the dial pad module. Uh, it's really fast, uh, it's obviously all in memory, so when you do a dial pad reload, you know, a simple cycle reload, all the new dial pad information into memory. It does that atomically, so it won't flip over to new data sets, uh, so the, uh, won't flip over from the old data set until all the new data has been loaded. Um, and the big thing it, it does in comparison to Redis, if you don't need the functionality of Redis, is it removes that external dependency on, on another database that you don't have to learn and maintain uh, uh, support. Um, and we, we find it's great for scaling. So this is typically um, how we would how we would, would, be, would deploy things. So we've got a distributed deployment of open sips. Uh, there's one in Europe, you know, one in the West USA, one in the East USA. Uh, we can use something like RabbitMQ as a message bus, um, and all the data that each individual OpenSIPS instance would need, you can just shoot it out of RabbitMQ into OpenSIPS uh, when it starts up, uh, and then OpenSIPS becomes a standalone in instance that contains all the data you need to do the job it needs to do, but you're not relying on any, any dependencies. Uh, so, for example, if you wanted to put another uh, one in Australia or something, and OpenSIPS would be able to just create it. You can have a case, send the information to Rabbit MQ, and then it would uh, come up in, uh, in Australia with all the data it needs. Uh, yeah, and OpenSIPS isn't, isn't querying external platforms, so it's uh, so you have no lossy performance uh, due to supporting the, uh, any independent hookup platforms. Uh, okay, so the second thing I wanted to talk about was customer specific logic. Um, and this is, um, so a customer would come to us and they would want to do something like concurrent call limiting, which is easy, we can do that with the dialogue module. Uh, rate limiting, again that's easy, we can do that with the rate limiting module. But then you'll get a slightly left field question, um, such as we only want to group calls to the carrier grade that the customer has specified. Uh, so this customer may have their bronze, silver, and gold grades of carriers, for example, uh, and they may want to only group calls for a particular one of their accounts to the gold carrier. Uh, now, this isn't something that's obviously solved with the existing open SIPs modules. Uh, and again, something like only group calls below the customer's maximum price threshold uh, is something that isn't obviously supported with the open SIPs modules. So this is when you can get quite quite interesting and quite quite, uh, quite clever with the open SIPs configuration. Um, so this is how this might look um, as an inbound call. First, we would need to identify the customer. Um, then we would need to identify the onward carrier. Uh, and then we would need to call out. And we've got these two specific criteria. We, know we could only route calls to the carrier grade the customer was specified, uh, and only route calls below this maximum price threshold. So. And there are tons of ways to solve this problem. There's no right or wrong way. Uh, you know, we have customers that will do a dip into some kind of room platform and that holds all pricing information as needed. They can turn that back in 302 and then you can use that data to inform your, your decisions later on in logic. Um, but if we don't have those kind of constraints, then this is the kind of approach that we, we use and you have used in the past. Um, so, um, so we have an open SIPs configuration file here, a really very basic one. Um, and this is this is what we like about open SIPs. You have your in dialog uh, section at the top, so the request has a two tag and it's in dialog, but you can deal with it there. And everything outside of that is a new request. And this is the real power of the open SIPs configuration script. You can do whatever you want here, it's like a car blanche. Uh, so we, we need to identify the customer, we need to identify the open carrier uh, and not do anything else we need before putting the calls out so uh, you're not constrained to just using module functions or, or exposed functions. So a, a real, uh, almost like Turing complete uh, programming language that you, have, that you have access to. So this is typically uh, what we may do to identify a customer. Um, we could use the permission module, you know, call the check address function, uh, pass it a source IP and source port, and what you will get back is a variable called ABP context. Um, 
And I've just given a little example there. The AVP context may contain a string such as CP equals gold and maximum PM equals 150. And these are the key pieces of data we're going to need to select a carrier to route this call. We now know that this customer uh, has a carrier preference of gold and the maximum they want to pay per minute is 150 or whatever normalized uh, amount that is. Uh, and again, it's a full, a, full, um, a full programming language, so you can basically pull out that information to variables. So we can now store a variable, the carrier preference, which is gold, and the maximum per minute, which is 150. And then you've got access to that information uh, for the entirety of the rest of the execution of that request. So then you can go and use that information wherever you need to use it uh, in the future. Uh, so we know who the customer is. Um, we've got that information stored, and now we would need to route uh, the call out to the forward carrier. Uh, yeah. So it's a, a really powerful um, scripting language that you're given here, and that's the kind of example I wanted to show. Uh, you can call subroutines. You've got access to variables. Um, you know, the subroutines can return values, true, false, or, or whatever else you need to return. You can use while loops, just in any, regu any other regular programming language. Um, and you can also intersperse this with the usage of the modules that are exposed from OpenSys. So here we're using the dynamic module uh, to select a carrier to route call out. And as you can see, we're calling do routing, uh, and we're expecting back some attributes uh, for the for the actual prefix of the calls being routed to, and some attributes for the actual carrier that the call may be routed to. And then what we can do is take that information and call a subroutine. So here we're calling check price, uh, and if that returns true, then we have found the carrier. If that doesn't return true, then we can continue in a while loop calling that function uh, until we find a matching carrier. So again, we've got an example beneath the while use next gateway. That's part of the dynamic routing module. So we're selecting another carrier, another gateway, and then we're going to call the check price subroutine to fix that information. Basically, keep doing that until we find a matching carrier. Um, so, and this is an example of what that subroutine might look like. Um, for the call of roots in OpenSIPs speak. Um, so we may have some rule attributes. You know, here we have um, carrier, you know, for a prefix that we're trying to root a call to, call to, we may know that the carrier one is going to charge 200 and carrier two is going to charge 100. And we know that we have a gateway attributes of goal. And we can do some really simple string comparisons um, to say that if we don't have a match, uh, of the, uh, the carrier preference of the customer. So if it's not gold, then we would, we would uh, return minus one from the, the root. Um, and then we can have some logic further down that we do some comparisons of the cost of the call. And if the cost was not what the customer expected, then we would also return false. Uh, at the very bottom, we would return true, which is what the return one would indicate. Um, and this basically means that we've matched all the, the criteria that the customer wants for this call, and therefore we can run the call. Um, um, and we do we do that quite a lot. Um, so um, and and we do this because it, going back to the original example, so it allows OpenSIPs to operate as that as that more standalone platform. It's really, you could quite easily, and it's a valid choice to put some of these, these decisions in external platforms. But when we're looking at something that needs to be uh, real time, fast for call setup, scales really well, can be easily redeployed in different environments, we, we often find it's, it's a really nice uh, nice way to just encapsulate logic in OpenSIPS itself because it, it's available to do. Uh, and something that we also have been doing for quite a while is this unit integration testing. Um, and I know Razvan did a really good presentation about that yesterday with the new SIP cert, uh, new SIP cert project that's been created. Um, and what we historically done is, is, is we've created our own VM environment that would fire themselves up, populate themselves with seed data, um, 
and then run through some of these complex scenarios with SIP here on each side. So if we needed to test that the, the LCR logic still works, then we could fire in a specific packet and a certain specific invite, expect a result and uh, feedback on the results. So um, yeah, um, one, of the, one of the kind of issues that's been raised against this kind of approach before putting lots of logic in any like niche telephony platform is that it's very hard for the developers to maybe access that logic and test it. So well, we, we've been integration testing these kind of things uh, for quite a while. Um, so um, yeah, so in conclusion, um, I know it was very quick, very basic examples, but what we essentially have been able to get to is like a really complicated uh, setup that's somewhat struggling to scale to essentially replace just open SIPs with just some more logic in the, uh, in the, main, in the main script execution. Um, and it's just really to show an example that you don't need to just keep adding things, you can bring things back and then put that logic in there. Um, yeah, so you know, from our perspective, um, OpenSIMS is definitely more than more than just a SIP routing engine. Um, the modules are great, they have a specific purpose, um, but you can use that to your advantage, you can get them to store data on your behalf, which is in memory, it's, it's great, you can easy, easily access it and use it then um, in a way that suits your situation. Uh, and you can do kind of all kind of crazy things. Uh, we have a platform out there that's doing uh, like exchange lookups in the US and then it's determining jurisdiction and then it's looking through 200 plus carriers for prices that match a specific jurisdiction and then routing those kinds of calls. Um, and typically performance tested that and it was it maxed out at 18,000 calls per second because we have this encapsulation of everything within open SIPs. Uh, and the thing that was actually maxing out was the syslog engine. Uh, so we took that away and it would go even, even, even higher. So uh, yeah, we like, we like it and we like pushing about it and see what we can do with the, uh, the open SIP script. So um, um, that's it. Thank you. That was awesome. Question on the fly. Thank you. Uh, we have any questions from me? Go back to slide. Yes, sure. Um, there's a question at the front. Can you go back to slide? Yes. Yeah. The answer is yes. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, from a from a, you seem like you have a handle on the technical aspects of it. How do you best handle more difficult customer relationships? You mean pers interpersonal relationships? Yes. Yeah. Do, do you have a specific customer in mind? No, I'm just wondering what you have, have advice. <laughs> So, are you talking of a perspective of is of if of if somebody would ask something? Constantly changing Const environments. Yeah. Like yeah. Well, I mean, as I said, one of the one of the things that can help mitigate with things like that is having things like unit tests and integration tests. We have found that if we if we create something that is Class, you, know, you can class it as a stable platform. We know it performs all the functions to a specification, and we have unit tests around that. Then it almost acts as a barrier to people constantly changing things because then you know you have to make the change, you have to prove the things working again, uh, and uh, yeah, and it just makes it a more solid products all around. Do we have any other questions? Show of hands. Somebody. Reach out this guy. Okay, let's give Pete a round of applause again. And Pete, thanks again for sponsoring, showing your support. One more round of applause for Sourcebox, helping us out this year. Actually, uh, Nissan is going to be providing a presentation on our audio equipment later today. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's kind of a professional. <laughs> I'm sure you've noticed there's been a lot of less dying out of the microphones. <laughs> there you go. Keep it up. <laughs> You're getting a ribbon in the end. No, no, thanks, At least for, a second. thanks for reminding me to rotate the batteries now. So. Up next, we have Daniel Panaka. Oh, okay. um, he's coming to us from the Software Freedom Institute. He's going to be talking about monitoring and troubleshooting distributed RTC applications.
So we can have a quick question. Uh, show of hands, who's staying at the hotel? Still working. <laughs> Technology telling us what to do. Listen, you must plug in. <laughs> People have had issues with their audio and Tinder, so. <laughs> Who was that? Is that Joseph? No. Is this way scary? Of course. No. Just <laughs> You really want to get into wrestling? No, no, it was, it's a developer forum, actually. It's, I heard. it's not Tinder, it's uh, Xinder. <laughs> Open Sips in your. Okay. Take it away, sir. I'm going to talk about monitoring and troubleshooting distributed real-time communication software, and specifically about monitoring the logs. So who remembers the credit crisis of 2008? Uh, yeah, so I joined the enterprise monitoring team at Barclays Investment Bank in London at the time the crisis was beginning. And so for about three years, I was actually working in one of these towers, monitoring the impact of the crisis on the IT infrastructure of the bank. And so it's quite fascinating. We had a number of developers each focusing on a different area. We had one person who focused on logging, another one who focused on service availability, another developer just me, was focusing on gathering performance metrics at that time. So we actually watched the metrics of like the city use and memory usage as other banks were failing and having a huge impact on markets. And so monitoring can give a lot of insights both in the technology and also into the business. Um, So in the, in the beginning, who started off with an asterisk server set up like this, just connecting your phones directly to an asterisk server? Yeah. So you've got a single process, asterisk, that can do everything. The voicemail, the music on hold, everything is in one process. It creates one log file. And if you want to find out what's going on, you just have to look in that one log file. So it's, Hopefully it will be quite easy. But with WebRTC and with the types of solutions we build in a, in a business environment, there's more than one process. It's not just one asterisk process. So the simplest WebRTC setup, you probably need a web server, which we have at the top. You have a SIP proxy of some kind, which you have in the middle there. And you need a turn server or maybe even a Corento media server or something else which is at the bottom of that picture. So you've got three processes there, all generating logs. And if a problem arises, it could be in any one of these processes. And you have to either watch three logs at the same time. And all their logs have different syntax and different um, names for their errors uh, and so on. Some software uses the name trace and the other software uses the name debug. So grepping these text files can be a real pain. 
So how can we merge these logs together into one? How can we make it easier for people? Uh, another problem we had in, in reciprocate is multiple line log messages. We have a lot of SIP messages, like invite messages that can be quite big, and we just put them into the text you know, log file and they're, they're huge. And then we have a lot of other um, things like SIP info messages so with a message body, and sometimes we want to log those message bodies as they undergo various transformations. So we're not logging the whole SIP message, but we're just logging different permutations of the body. Uh, these are multi-line log messages. So this is another problem that text files struggle with because when you do a grep on that text file and you have those multi-line um, entries, then grep doesn't know which lines belong to which log entry. So a JSON you know, structured logging might look like this. So you have some tags um, like date and severity that are quite common to every log message. Uh, and so when you have these tags, it becomes <coughs> a lot easier to search for things, even if the messages came from different processes. And if you have multiple line log messages, then it also becomes easier because the new lines can be embedded in the JSON. So a few years ago, they spent some time developing a specific JSON standard called CEE. Uh, who has seen the CEE? Uh, so this is a, a standard that was never fully finished, but it was widely documented, and it has been implemented in various ways, in tools like RSYSLOG, for example. Uh, so they have published the last version of the standard, that's the 1.0 beta 1. I'm not sure which year it is, but they did publish a, a beta. Uh, and people have taken the beta and done a lot of things with it, despite the fact it was never finished. Uh, <coughs> and the reason for using something like C is because using a even an unsupported standard it just seems like a better idea than every developer making their own standard for their own process. So in, in 2020, uh, Camilio, uh, a custom JSON format to their logging, so it's not CE. Uh, I had a look at that and I submitted a pull request that lets you choose CE. Uh, the code is, is very similar, so in the end, um, Camilo today offers C. <coughs> then OpenSIPS has also just introduced it, so they're now completely compatible in their logging output. Uh, so it's, but this is a common pattern. You'll find a lot of developers have tried this in you know, making their own JSON log format, and and from time to time you need to go back to those programs and just say let's. Just revise this to make it more like CE. Uh, if you think about all the applications we have for SIP, for media, for things like Stun and Term, and also for XMPP and chat applications, and if they all go and do something different, then it creates a lot of work for us. Uh, but there are a lot of tools that work with CE. So using CE, means you get to use those tools as well. Uh, so I've put a screenshot of the search results. Uh, so we have a blog about linking our syslog with Elasticsearch, and we'll see some screenshots of that later. Uh, there are other tools available as well. And there are also documents. People have written blogs. They've provided you know, snippets of configuration that work, that just work copy and paste it and start using it, which is always better than starting to develop something new. And with JSON, you can still add extra fields if you really need to. 
So here is a summary of some of the projects I've worked with. Uh, Open SIPs has recently added it, so I think Bogdan mentioned it in the keynote yesterday, so well done on adding uh, CE to Open SIPs. Uh, Reciprocate did it, so if you use any of the processes from Reciprocate, they can all hog with CE. Uh, or Reciprocate is also a stack, so if you build your own application for the stack, then you can also profit from CE just by using our stack. Uh, so Camilo has done it. Uh, so that means you can, if you have an environment where you're switching back and forth between open SIPs and Camilo to test different things, you can get almost identical sort of log output. Uh, for GStreamer, I've submitted a patch. Uh, so I've been testing that myself. Uh, they have, a, they have over 500 pull requests there at any one time. So it hasn't been merged yet, but is anyone here involved in GStreamer development? Or is anyone dependent on GStreamer or Corento? Yeah. So if you want to um, test that or make comments on it, it would be very welcome. Uh, so for Corento, I submitted a patch, which is very similar to the GStreamer patch, is Corento uses a fork of GStreamer, but I had to adapt the patch a little bit for their fork. Uh, and then for asterisk, I, I opened a bug. <laughs> so does anyone here have uh, commit access on asterisk? Or is anyone keen on doing that? I might come back to it myself at some point, but the bug is there, and the bug includes some analysis of where the change needs to be made. So this is an example of how we do the C logging from Reciprocate. We don't use any JSON library. We just create the strings using well, this is C++, so we're using the string operators. But if it was just regular C, you could use printf or something to create the JSON strings. There's no dependency on a JSON library. Because it's logging, you don't want to have extra dependencies and things that could go wrong. So you just create the JSON strings and you send them to the uh, output destination. When you send a JSON CE string to the syslog uh, API, then you have to add that little at CE prefix. And you can see that in the middle of the screenshot there that we add that at CEE colon at the beginning of the string if we're going to send it to the syslog call. If we're writing to the text file, so if the process writes directly to a file, you don't put that, you just send the JSON itself directly to the file. But if you're sending it to syslog, you have to add that little prefix. So this is just to emphasize that this is the same thing written in C, that you put that at CE prefix, and the, the syslog daemon then knows how to treat this as JSON, and it will give it some special treatment for you. Now, what if you have uh, some library that you cannot modify the syslog calls? Uh, you may not have the source code for the library, for example. You can still work around that, because otherwise your, your code is going to be logging JSON while the libraries that you use are logging regular strings. But you can intercept the calls from the library to the syslog API using the LD preload mechanism. So I actually created a a library for this very purpose for something else to override the syslog socket to run extra versions of our syslog. So that library is on GitHub uh, and that library can be used to take text string and convert it to JSON before sending it to syslog. And there are other things you can use it for as well. Uh, so I hope that might be useful if anyone wants to fork that. And, sort of intercept logging from the libraries that they use. Ideally, if you're using open source libraries, then you can try to contribute patches to them. So the benefits of CE 
and not just the syntax, which gives us a common set of field names or tags, but also the semantics, like what do the different levels of uh, severity mean? When should you use the level of info and when should you use the level of debug, for example? Uh, so if everyone agrees on what these levels are, and if everyone agrees on what they mean, then you're more likely to get predictable results. So when developers are writing code, they know what level names they're targeting. Uh, and when a system administrator is reading logs from any of these processes, they don't have to think about what does that level name really mean, because it's the same meaning as in the other applications. So as critical mass grows, hopefully more developers will give you the option of logging with C. So library developers, for example, if they have logging in their library, then they might give this option. And, and also more tools are likely to appear. So we already have some tools, we have some documents. More people will develop things like that that are special for WebRTC and similar applications. A Homer coming, is that right? Does it and does it um, does it support structured logging or is it only text logs at the moment? Okay, we, we'll come back to Homer, um, but I think it would be really cool if we could get these structured logs into Homer and use that to order them and filter and things like that. That seems like the ideal place to have them. So there's Elasticsearch and Kibana, or the open search, which is the Amazon combination. Um, it's also just ready to go with um, CEE. So I was able to connect our syslog to uh, open search just by following, and I was immediately able to visualize my logs. Uh, this isn't my own screenshot, this is a screenshot from one of those other blogs that you can all find on the subject. So, so this is a, a great set of tools that many people know, and people are using this for other purposes in system administration, and they can just immediately apply it to their RTC stack. Uh, here's another screenshot from Kibana. And what you see here is that we're looking at individual messages now. So you can see how Elasticsearch or OpenSearch names of the fields and so on in the JSON log messages. And you then get the ability to use those little uh, filters there. It's quite laser. Yeah. Yeah. So there are filters for the field names, so you can search on a field name or you can sort on a field name just using these tools. Um, so there are different types of problems we have in development and there are problems we have in support where having the ability to filter or sort is really useful. Uh, so that is uh, structured logging and its benefits for for a distributed RTC system. Uh, I'd just like to open it up to the floor to see if anyone has tried anything like this or whether you have uh, questions. Uh, we need a microphone. So I'm using Loki uh, for Loki to do for our logging. And <clears throat> how does this? I don't really know anything about C. How does it compare to that? Are you familiar with that? So in Loki, yeah, you're, Loki. you're collecting text-based log files. Yeah, that's correct. So all that changes with C is that each log entry is a JSON string. It's not a, a plain, it's not a free form text string, it's a JSON string. So we can go back to this example. 
Actually, this example is. So our syslog has actually created some of these. Uh, it's taken a freeform string, and our syslog has actually created some of the fields before putting them in Elasticsearch. If we go back to the very trivial example, this is really trivial. There are actually a lot more fields than this. But these are some of the key fields. You have a date field, you have a severity, you have the message string itself. But you have other fields, like for the file name, like the name of the source file, the line number in the code, uh, the process ID, the process name. And each one of them can be represented like this. So each line in the log file becomes a JSON string like this. That's the only thing that changes is the tool that is reading it, if the tool knows that it's not a freeform text and it knows that it's JSON, then it can extract those values before storing them. So if you're giving um, bloggy freeform text, then it has to do what we saw in the last slide. This is where our syslog is taking freeform text and it's just adding some fields before storing it. Uh, but if, it already, if it's in C format and it already has the fields, then you get a lot more detail here. Uh, so the only change is that where the application is outputting lines of JSON. So you can still use Loki with that? Or you can... I haven't personally tried it. I've used, I've tested with the log st stash. So instead of using syslog to transfer the logs to uh, Elasticsearch or OpenSearch, I've tried using the log stash tool, and that is able to process the JSON lines and store them into yeah, the OpenSearch or Elasticsearch backend. Uh, so it's, uh, it's down to each tool whether it can recognize JSON and profit from the JSON. Because if it doesn't know it's JSON, if it just treats each line as a string, then you're not getting the benefit. But if you have all of these logs on your disk in, in files, you know, finding a tool to read them later is, or modifying the tool is, is fine. The, once you've captured the logs, the data is there, ready for you to find the best tool. Oops. Has anyone else tried loading JSON logs with, with Loki? I just I wanted to clarify too that I misunderstood the question. We we do ingest structured logs already, and then query itself can take any type of format like log MFT, JSON. And Grafana will do the parsing of the field. Like, like you're saying with the Elasticsearch, uh, you know, Elasticsearch will read out some of the fields, and uh, Grafana does the same thing. You can just pipe it into their text file or log a T parser and read it out the way you're showing it in, in this uh, screenshot as well. So, okay. Thumbs so up for structured logging. So, if you're looking at the Homer web interface and you see a SIP message, it's like a 603 or some sort of error that just killed your call. Is there an easy way to see the log messages just prior to that? Yeah, if you emit them as a HEP 100, then yeah. you can see the log. Okay, so you can see the last log error before the 603 SIP error. Yeah, yeah. so that type of thing would be really useful. So does your code, does it recognize the CEE schema? Okay. Yeah, it might be good to maybe try testing a sample of that from OpenSIPs perhaps. So as it's just been added, I think that's an excellent test. Uh, next. Hey, um, yeah, that interesting presentation. Um, uh, just curious, how did you actually check um, 
the lot levels in open sieves because like a uh, lot of times working on the code it's pretty much random like uh, especially between like critical and error so like how good are uh, actual levels in the open sieves code I think this is a question for Bogdan you just appeared at the right moment <laughs> <laughs> oh it's time to public shame <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only one to recognize that. Yeah, so the question was... No, I'm just curious how good those uh, levels, because you have specifically mentioned that uh, people often misuse... Uh... I think uh, right now we use, uh, we publish the load level uh, according to the text what six log understands. But uh, considering that it's a completely like a relatively new feature, you know, we have to um, uh, keep tuning it for the moment. So uh, it might be subject to changes just to see how it works. No, it's a real consumer in terms of uh, uh, logs. Yeah. So this is this is an interesting question though. If we look at the charts here. So here we're charting just the volume of logs. But what we can do is we can do a distribution of how many critical messages, how many regular errors, how many warnings. And if we see that the number of errors is actually more than the number of warnings, then you, just looking at a chart like this, then you might feel that, well, this application, the developers use the error tag too frequently, just by looking at a chart. And that can provide feedback to the developers. And then you can use the searching and filtering to say, well, which of these errors should we focus on reclassifying? Uh, so it, it, the, these tools provide a way to resolve the very problem that you've asked about. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sounds. Any more? Yeah. Okay. To emit logs for um, yeah. the schema, is there any library or add-on required, or how does it happen? No, you can just write them as text. You can use printf statements. Okay. You could, if it's C or C++ code, if it's Java code, you can use uh, strings and just construct the JSON by hand using you know, the simplest code you can think of. Because it's because it's logging, you don't want to depend on a library. Because if the library has a bug, then your logging fails. <laughs> and then the new peers, uh, if you want to make use of the peers that or tags that you showed in the JSON schema, do we have to? Um, does any does the underlying library does it for us, or do we have to pick those in? No, you just create them manually. So here, I've added the hostname field, and I've added the priority field, just using the C++ stream operators. So I can add extra lines here to create extra fields. In fact, this code that I've copied here is only part of the code. There are maybe 10 different fields, but I just copied and pasted up the, the beginning of that um, piece of code, just so the font would be big enough to read. Uh, did it work? Can you read that font at the back? Yeah. yeah. Because if I, if I actually put the whole code there with all the 10 tags, then the, the font would get smaller. Um, so, yeah. But you just use the simplest possible string manipulation to create the log yeah, output. If I may uh, fill in a bit here, because actually in opposite we are producing uh, such logs. So uh, how we do it? Uh, actually, we uh, okay. There is no uh, specific library, but uh, we have some uh, some uh, codes uh, we have been used for different purposes. And to read basically uh, JSON internal structure. So. There is nothing particular to it, but again, it helps a lot if you have some, uh, some generic JSON support uh, in your application. Yeah. I think that most of the SIP applications do have like a file where they have their logging code. So it's like it's not like a library, but it's just like in, um, in Reciprocate, we have a log.cxx 
where we have all our logging code and all the other code in the stack calls the methods in log.cxx. So I only had to do this in that one place. Um, but if you get to it adding your own tags, like if you want extra tags for information about your um, transactions and things, for example, if you want to log SIP transaction ID or dialog ID or anything, then you might need to have some sort of an API for passing those down to the code that constructs the JSON. Yeah, and these are all possibilities that I'm yet to explore. But uh, here's our next uh, question. Another question? Sure. Yes. No. Okay. What about? So the, the C is just basically a, a set of standardization of terminology, you know, basically for different, you know, you want to log a host and you use this string, in your case, on your log, you know, it's standardizing the, the, the levels, uh, warning levels, kind of, or critical level. Exactly. Terminology. Okay, so more like a terminology standardization. So you're taking it from all sorts of disparate systems, but the same thing means the same. Thing on every system. Exactly. It's just it gives us a common set of field names. Okay. And I mean, it, I know this. It, it, this is not a very advanced talk, perhaps for some developers who have been working in monitoring. But but it's an important topic because I keep seeing this again and again. That every time someone does something with JSON, they create their own schema. They use a field name that is slightly different. Or they they structure the data like their timestamp in a different way, or something like this, and then you cannot mix and match these JSON documents in the same columns because the they're not identical syntax. So the real point of CE is just to keep using the same field names and the same syntax for the values because that makes it really easy for people to mix and match the tools, the documentation. And everything else. So. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay, let's give this guy a round of applause. Thank you so much. Again. <laughs> Next up, we have. Uh, yes. Oh, it's oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. This is a table. Indeed, it is, sir. Yes, please. Is, it, is that yours? Uh, I don't actually have any more USB, so I'll be fine. Thank you, though. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it is. Okay, and the answer will be talking to us about something that's way more than a foreign language to me. Huh. Yeah, I have a friend, an Italian friend of mine, who gets really angry when people use Latin quotations because uh, he, he insists that uh, people say these things just to make themselves look smart. So am I looking smart right now? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you look as good as well. Yeah, but when you heard it, uh, for what is Jitsi means where are you going Jitsi in um, Latin. So very sophisticated stuff. That explains it. Let's give him Neil, he's from uh, 8x8, and let's give him uh, your undivided attention. I'm sure this is going to be really good. Okay, good. Hi, everyone. Six minutes. I'm going to give you a signal just because you're right before lunch. All right. And people might start like, getting more. And like, they get aggressive. Yeah, they get a little aggressive. Yesterday, I had to put some people down. You should have people drooling. 
<laughs> well, no, it's like people want to arm wrestle. You just get the lunch. Okay. Right. So, um, hi everyone. My name is Emil. I'm from JT, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about JT today. I'm really happy to be here because JT uh, has been around for a long time, and, and this sort of event, you know, the open source SIP, open source real time communications event, used to be the only uh, event that we did in the past, and now it's been a few years that we haven't done them for various reasons. Uh, and I'm very happy that we're back and that you all are back uh, on, uh, on the track. So uh, because it's cool, uh, I just like going down memory lane and showing old, old pictures. Now, if any of you here know Jitsi, you probably don't remember it like this. And um, I like these pictures because uh, they show me the, the, the number of complete transformations that this project has had. It started as a student project right there in the corner. Uh, it was just uh, some barely working SIP um, audio video phone. It then became a messenger. It then became a professional um, audio video phone. And then it became a, a phone that was capable of hosting audio and video conferences. Now, every time we went to one of these changes, it was because we saw an opportunity to be of use to people, to be helpful. It was uh, along our path, and, and we could just go and um, help people solve some problem in some way. Now, our most probably radical change since these old days was when we got here. Uh, so imagine, um, this is what, 2010, 2011. We were hosting video conferences on people's desktop computers. And we thought that's not a good idea. That doesn't really work out well. So everyone connects to someone's computer, and that becomes some sort of a conferencing server. Not a good idea. So we went and we extracted this and 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 made it a server side application, which was the first for us because we, we had always been a SIP client up until SIP and XMPP client up until that point. And this is how um, GT became what people know today. Because once we had the server-side component, then WebRTC came along, and we thought, well, actually, we could replace our front end with, with WebRTC. So GT today is a very complete open source meeting system. It's probably the most complete on the, 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 the open source market. I would say um, it, it just does everything, you know, from uh, large conferences with 500 people. We're about to roll out 10,000 participant conferences. It supports all the codecs, H.264, VP, AGP9. We're about to roll out support for uh, AV1 in a couple weeks. It has all the things from bandwidth estimations, um, low-level transport stuff, fax support, all the way to uh, advanced moderation in large meetings or raising your hand, um, personal messaging, all, all of these things. Now. The, there are a few deployments um, with which Jitsi is probably most well known. There's Meet Jitsi. Um, that's a completely free meeting system you can just go and have there without an account. Uh, it's likely the easiest way to set up a meeting these days, and uh, a few million people use it every month. So um, maybe you all have, have come across it. I also work for 8x8, which is a telephony company uh, that offers contact center solutions and uh, unified communications packages. All the manifestations of meetings in these packages are also based on Jitsi. So that's another popular manifestation of uh, the Jitsi open source project. And then the, the part that is probably most relevant to the crowd here is the deployment that we maintain as GT as a service, so we like to call it Jazz. So Jazz is what I like to call the world's easiest way to embed meetings into your existing web apps uh, or, or mobile apps. It is um, essentially um, can get you started. Uh, so if you have an existing app, it, it does something and it feels right that your users should be communicating at some point. Uh, well, you come and you use JT, and within 15 minutes, you have a working embedded meeting solution. There's a bunch of people that use Jazz, JT as a service. We host it, right? And, um, and you just use it and give us money. Um, and 
There's, for example, Brave, the browser they launched uh, about a year and a half ago, this Brave talk meeting service that is using Jitsi as a service. There's also um, this other company called Veerly. They uh, support if, hybrid events um, and they take care of uh, scheduling the events and sending the invitations and getting everyone, getting everyone ready, having uh, pre-presentation rooms and, and all of that. And once you get into the meeting, well, that's GT. Now, both Brave and Mirror you just use our most uh, high-level API, so they just uh, use the, the meeting layout that we provide, and they customize it to a fair extent. But there are also companies that use GT as a service to uh, imagine new layouts. Like, for example, there's this UK company called Call of Y who provides uh, remote uh, legal proceedings meetings, like arbitrations or court meetings. Um, and um, they arrange people in a way that's familiar to people in the, uh, in the Justice League, I guess. Um, where you know the lawyers will be on the left, the prosecutors will be on the right, and um, they arrange everyone the way that they should be arranged. And then there's also one of my favorites, which is Datadog's call screen app, which lets you uh, collaborate on. I'm sorry about this. Uh, that lets you collaborate on any app, even if the app itself doesn't support remote collaboration. Um, you can just um, share the screen. Uh, the window of that app, multiple windows at the same time, in a way such that uh, all participants in the call screen meeting can simultaneously interact with the app. So all of these are, are ways uh, that you can use Jazz, and I'm, I'm proud that we're powering these applications. Um, maybe that would be relevant to, to some of the people here. Now, I do suspect that the way of using Jitsi that is probably most familiar to people here is just having your own deployment. We do pay special attention um, to making sure that this is a very easy thing to do. Um, you, we have, you know, just pull up our Debian packages, our Docker images, and you can have your own meetings system up and running in, um, in, a, in a very short amount of time. Um, and, and people do do that for various reasons. They, um, People want to reuse existing infrastructure. Um, they probably want, some people want to offer a service that's, there's, there's some sort of a, you know, you can imagine a communications company that already has um, some communications features and they want to add meetings to it, so people download GT and, and they install it and um, start offering these functionalities. Um, and that works well. There's also the privacy use case, obviously, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but um, essentially, if people have an issue for whatever reason with trusting an existing meetings provider, well, running your own meetings deployment kind of sells that sells that issue for you because now you become your own provider. So, um, again, this is a very popular use case for the GT Open Source project. Download and you run it yourself. We have a, you know millions of downloads uh, from from our uh, Debian repositories and from Docker Hub. The issue. Uh, when you go down that path, is that while it is very simple to get the basic meetings use case uh, solved, you know, you just need one VM and, uh, and 15 minutes and there you are, the minute there's more than five people in your company that need, that need to use this, uh, let's say you have hundreds of colleagues or employees or users or thousands or tens of thousands, and let's say that you want to do uh, not only support meetings, but you also want the meetings to be recorded, you want people to be able to join over the phone, you want uh, to be able to live stream stuff to uh, platforms such as YouTube. Well, we do have solutions for these things, but it starts to be happy, right? Because you have to make them all highly available, monitor them um, with the right sort of logging, all of that. Um, so. This is one of the ways that, that at GT as a service, we recently started helping people. We launched this thing called Jazz Components, where uh, we let you deploy your own uh, PU system, but then at the end of the installation process, we invite you, if you want, you can just use our uh, recorders to let your live streamers. Uh, and right now, the telemetry is the one that's uh, easily productized, and uh, we're looking for people who, uh, you know, might be interested in uh, 
using the other parts of the infrastructure. So that's that's really cool. That's something uh, that's a nice hybrid between, uh, you know, uh, I found between maintaining an open source project and then offering a commercial service behind it. Um, so we also made sure that this is all embedded into the open source project. At the end of the Debian installation, for example, you get a prompt asking you uh, if you want to use uh, A38's um, Jitsi service to power your telemetry. Now, uh, you can check that out at jazz. It's jitsiservice.a38.bc slash components. Now, there's the, 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 the next little story that I wanted to talk about um, is, is something that I find really fascinating and it has to do with the privacy aspect of um, the, 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 the privacy reasons for using JT. And I have found in the past several years, and I'm not going to talk too much about this because we could probably spend days discussing this, is that when people claim that they do something for privacy reasons, this is usually extremely vague and, and it, 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 it turns out to be many, uh, many different things. But um, you could probably usually say that, hey, I wanna, what it means is hey, I want to be in this situation where um, I will have a meeting and I want to make sure that there's no one who can hear what's happening on that meeting. And one of the ways we used to address these things at a large scale was end-to-end -end encryption, right? When when um, email was one of the, the main ways of using the internet, you know, back 20, 30 years ago, uh, it wasn't even feasible to say, I'm just going to host my own uh, mail server so that no one can read my emails, right? Because then who are you going to talk to? Um, the, the answer then was we're going to use end-to-end -end encryption to make sure that uh, none of the people hosting the email servers can actually read our messages. And that was a great solution at the time, and people were trying um, now to find the same security using end-to-end -end encryption for meetings technologies. I would say end-to-end -end encryption kind of worked well for uh, the traditional, um, you know, SIP like real time communication, um, but it doesn't really translate well to meetings these days. And here's why I, I find this really fascinating. The way that end to end encryption works for things like SIP or uh, just email is that there's this common assumption that the entity that's providing you your client, right, the client is the thing that tells you, or some plugin of the client, right, whatever, the thing that's telling you your communication is secure, your, your uh, conversation has been end-to-end encrypted, verified, and everything, that thing has to be coming from someone other than the people providing you the service, right? That's kind of stands to reason. Um, because if it weren't, then the, 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 the assurances wouldn't be particularly interesting. Now, what has changed in today's world, and this is somewhat true of email, but it is especially true of uh, uh, the most popular ways of doing real-time communication, is that regardless of whose meeting service you use these days, these people, and I'm including us in that, uh, you know, in, in, in these people, um, they're also providing you, they're providing simultaneously the servers and the clients, right? So if you're using MeetJitsi, the JavaScript that you run comes from us, and the service also comes from us. If you're using Zoom, your client comes from Zoom, your service comes from Zoom. If you're using Teams, service teams, client teams. So in that context, getting um, a client to tell you your communication is end-to-end -end encrypted and the provider cannot read it, well, that really doesn't have that much value because if you're going, I'm not saying you should trust people telling you that, right? But if you trust them, then you might as well have trusted a message on their website that says, we're not doing anything dodgy with your data, right? You, it, it didn't really mean much 
to go in and, and do a, a, a ton of hoops so that you could have an additional label in the meeting that says, we're not doing anything dodging with your data, right? We might have just well trusted you the first time. So this is why um, when uh, people like using um, video on-prem, because, well, now at least I, I, I don't need to worry about all these peculiarities and everyone telling me exactly why this is, uh, you know, whether it's a turning or not, or why should I should or shouldn't trust people. I'm just going to eliminate the provider, be my own provider, and therefore I don't need to trust anyone. Now, the issue when you, when you do this, as I said, is that sooner or later, high availability and scalability become a concern. And in order to get high availability and scalability, everyone knows, you need to spend a lot of effort and, and it costs a lot of resources to do it. Now, what I, one thing that we're uh, working on right now, oh, gee, I really have to go fast, um, is we essentially let you split uh, the website and the video side uh, of Jitsi so that you can give us, let, you, let us host the video site and um, you keep the website and it is also the website that actually negotiates the end-to-end -end encryption um, and then you can uh, safely send your traffic to Jitsi as a service. Is that normal there? Um, well, probably is. Um, and, and then you don't need to worry about scaling your deployments anymore. Okay, these are cool things that um, I, I, I'm happy we're doing, but I have to get to the topic of the day. As someone said, you cannot have a presentation without talking about, uh, without talking about things like ChatGPT. So let's talk a little bit about ChatGPT as well. Um, so, you know, we've had things that pretend to be artificial intelligence for a while, there would be Alexas and the series and all these things. And during that time when people would say, during the past you know, seven, ten years, when people would say, why do you want to integrate Alexa in a meeting? I always used to think, what's the point? I mean, I have Siri on my computer. Um, I, I have all sorts of assistants around me. What's the point of having a bot within a meeting that acts like Siri? Um, and, and I still don't see that point. However, what changed with the recent um, popularization of, of large language models is that these things are incredibly good at understanding context, right? Alexa doesn't understand context, but large language models do. And there's a lot of context in a meeting, so all of a sudden, there's a, a, a ton that a large language model can help you with, right? It can, it can, it, it can understand the context and then it can help you do all sorts of things. You can imagine, like I, I have a bunch of people who work in health, a bunch of friends who work in healthcare in the United States, and they tell me that uh, they're being doctors about 25% of their time, and 75% of their time they're busy filling in forms uh, that describe what happened during a patient doctor meeting. So, what if a large language model can understand the context from a large language from a um, doctor patient meeting and then pre-fill these forms? So, I think there's a lot of potential there. But what I didn't want us to do, uh, because I don't think we're best placed for that, um, is to go and figure out the exact applications of large language models in, in meetings. I think there's uh, plenty of people who are better placed for that, including many people here. What I wanted us to do is to provide an easy way for people to add that support in GT meetings. So that's what we've done. Uh, I think we're going to have enough time to, to see all of that. So the idea is we want to give you a framework that lets you implement something like this, better looking, right? But something like this. Um, this is a real demo that we did. The idea is that we'd like to be able to run bots for people um, that get access to the meeting audio, the meeting video, the meeting transcript, and then they have an easy way of rendering audio into the meeting, rendering video into the meeting, and then accessing the internet so that they can use their favorite large language models um, to provide value. Um, so the way that um, we've made this work is we just need a user a JavaScript from you, right? Um, and that's just a script that would run in a browser. We'll be responsible about running the browser, we'll drive it with uh, Puppet, we'll take care of the internal infrastructure, and when the meeting starts, we're going to get your script into the meeting. And, and with script that you, you know, test it on your own, uh, browsers and, and develop very conveniently, and then you give it to us and we start running it to you. Now here's a very simple thing. This is a real script. I'm going to show you what it looks like in a second. But what you see here 
is that you um, we have a welcome message for uh, the bot to uh, greet participants. There's a toolbox that we provide to you that gives you access to um, the current meeting, to the audio and video tracks. Uh, we provide you with an avatar tool, uh, or you could probably write your own. Um, once you get the, act the, the tracks, you can unmute them. Um, you use, we use the HD text-to-speech service to um, actually convert that into an audio file, and then we render it into the meeting. It's really uh, you know, less than 30 lines of code. And this is what this gives us. Hello. Oh, sorry. Where's the microphone? That was, uh, there we go. Oops. Hello. It says hello. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Not even hello world, huh? No, no, it got stuck there. Gosh. The Wi Fi is not so. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm running the. Uh, to the, to the left? Not to the left. No? Uh, I think I put it up there. Oh, maybe it's. The guy is moving windows using command line. Yeah. Oh, probably I need to actually solve the... Yes. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Yeah. You good? I dropped it. Where did it go? Yeah. Bradley Bot. This is just an example of what I can do. Okay, so that was other examples for more. Um, that was uh, the the twenty five oh, lines no. of code. Shut up. Um, <laughs> very friendly <laughs> thought. That, so that was the twenty five lines of code that we saw there. Um, is enough to get a participant into the meeting and to get get it to say this to you. Now, um, I have another uh, example here, which is only. If I can only find my balance, uh, which is only, let's see, uh, is the uh, call. Let's look at how to write spots. By the way, for those of you who know so, this is so, I'm sure there's, uh, uh, there's, there's plenty of people here. Um, I'm going to go through this quickly because we don't have that much time, and I've heard that there's lunch waiting for us. Um, the point here is to show um, how to write a demo that will summarize a meeting um, and then do an integration with Zapier. I'm not going to go through the entire thing because it's three minutes. That's too long. <laughs> um, I'm going to go through it a little bit quickly, but I want you to get a sense of how little code uh, is, is needed for this. Uh, structure is pretty simple at this point. Uh, all you have to do is provide a JavaScript file with a single export function called automatic and then write your own code. You're going to get a reference to the room uh, or a conference uh, that what uh, has been connected. Let's look at a Hello World example. So well, we're going to use some of the tools in our toolbox to do that's paint forward. Check out other examples. Oh. Hello. Hello. I'm a hey, dude. I, so, um, I don't want to go through the rest of the walkthrough. It was 120 lines of code, and uh, this is what we generate with 120 lines of code. Now, uh, Tudor and uh, So, who are spectacular actors, uh, are reading through a script. You could never tell, but they're reading through a script, a conversation that we're then going to want summarized uh, and sent through Zapier. And thinking about the architecture of our to do web application, have you given it any thought? Yes, I will really not on it. I think we should go with the RESTful architecture for scalability and flexibility. That's a good idea. How about the database? We should make a SQL or no SQL. I think no SQL would be better for our needs. It's more flexible and <laughs> Yeah, I agree. And what about in the front end framework? I was thinking of using React. It's fast and easy to work with. Sounds pretty good. How about we get started on building the application? Sure, let's do it. 
So that's not just a transcript, it's a summary of the meeting so far. Thanks a lot, Dr. Let's go for it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Once the meeting is ended, the book will also send us an email with the summary of said meeting so that uh, we can read upon it later. And the summary will be sent to every participant. Here's the summer. And here I told us architecture, restful, no sequel, and yet. Thanks for watching. And then finally, as a as a result of the same conversation and with about 20 more lines of code. All right. One. So, Assistant, can you give me a summary of the above meeting? There we go. Let's let's come into that. The whole point is this is really um, easy to do, um, and uh, we hope that uh, plenty of people are going to try it out. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes. Is the code on GitHub? Uh, uh, no. That, uh, on the bots part? No, not yet. Okay, we have. Uh, I have time for one quick question. Mind you that you might get picked up if it's a long one because lunch is waiting for us. Nobody, but Emil will be here for a while. Today. You're here all day. Uh, I'm I'm here till the afternoon. Yes. Till the afternoon. So if you want to corner him, by all means do so. Let the man eat though. Um, thank you very much, everyone. All right, Emil. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the It's that time. Food. It's the food time. Food. Lunch is waiting for you. Go line up for the buffet. See you all in the hot hour. Lunch is brought to you by.
Maybe Corpus X is still. Like, really? Yeah. yeah. It's like DM food. Everyone You're wants up. it. You're up. You're up. You're up. How'd you all like lunch? Was it good? Yeah. 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 Not the street tacos. I would enjoy that. Though. Tastes like home. Where do you live? South Dakota? <laughs> California. <laughs> Any part of California, South Dakota. Yeah. How can you afford to live there? I don't. <laughs> you know, I, live, I live in my car. <laughs> on the side. Street time. Just like, well, where are you from? Appleton, Wisconsin. <laughs> Where are you from? <laughs> Fourth and Crenshaw. <laughs> yeah. You got a video you can set up over here. Show me. Can you really step outside and sweep them in if there's anyone in the hall still? Just as long as any announcement starts with, hey, motherfuckers. <laughs> I actually have a second presentation ready, and that's exactly how it started. I told you with a couple of things, listen up, motherfuckers. <laughs> Is that everyone in the hall for me? There's more people not coming. <laughs> they can't want to tell you they're not coming. They're going to hang out in the lunchroom. The cafeteria lady's hot. <laughs> <laughs> we all need to get out Yes. <laughs> All right, we have a video sauce. He's actually uh, one of the guys that does a lot of contributions to the, the code at OpenSIPS. Um, he's going to be talking to us about OpenSIPS trouble. Thank you. So, my name is Gordon Sass. I work with the project since 2000 something. I started by uh, uh, porting uh, a module from SIR into Open SIR, it was then. And then I was involved with the dialog module. Then, uh, uh, oh, I ripped Maxim's uh, module. I took the SDB parser out of it and put it in the core. Then I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> then. Into a microphone. <laughs> and then uh, I split this module in two, uh, keeping the net helper and then creating the RTP proxy module. Uh, then recently there were some, well, not recently, after that there were issues all the time with the XML RPC module because of the XML RPC library. So I, uh, uh, I, I uh, made the HTTP module. And on top of it, we have the MI HTTP, the RPC HTTP, and all the other um, modules that are uh, like the MI interface, RPC, and so on. Uh, anyway, whoops. Okay, all good. So, uh, OpenSIM has troubleshooting. Uh, first thing when we want to do troubleshooting is to be prepared. And what do we need? We need uh, to be able to collect logs and to deal with core dumps. Hopefully not, but just in case. Logs. What, uh, what, what do we want to do? We want to collect the logs in a specific destination. That's why we, we use uh, local zero in the config. Then uh, in order to split things and to have clean OpenCPS logs. We, want, we don't want to have the local zero, the, the OpenCPS log in uh, syslog. We want to collect them only in, uh, uh, in an additional file, for example, OSIP. And then we need to make sure that we have all the logs, because if we are losing logs, 
we can do a control trick. And of course, we want to rotate lots. We don't want to keep them uh, piling up. So, this is a this is pretty standard. It's by default in the in the complete. The log facility is set to, to local zero. That, uh, that's why I went with it. Uh, next, we need to prepare the uh, the syslog. So in syslog, to make sure that we we don't uh, collect uh, open CPAS logs, we just need to add local zero none into the usually. I just, uh, this is for uh, Ubuntu. For Debian should be pretty similar. For Red Hat it's a little bit different, but the idea is to, to, to give you like the, the steps. But there's no need to take pictures. The slides will be available and I'm the mailing list. Uh, and then at the end of the file, we need to specify that we want to collect local zero in, uh, in our file. Also, this little minus here is very important because we don't want to, to block OpenCPS while, uh, write, while, while it's writing logs. So we do it uh, asynchronously. Questions at any point in time, just let me know. You can clarify it, it's easier that way. Uh, then we need to make sure that we don't uh, rate limit, and uh, things got trickier as uh, Linux evolved. So we need to do this in, in two places. We need to make sure that we don't limit in syslog, and you have the, the config file. And under global directives, this is what we need to add. And then we need to. Uh, reconfigure the, the journal D. And after that, we need to restart uh, our syslog, and now we are ready to, to collect logs in a, in a proper way. Collecting logs is good, but also we need to make sure that we are rotating them. So this is just a very simple example without uh, compressing the files, without doing anything fancy, just collect them and keep them for uh, seven days. Then we need to make sure that we are able to, to capture core dumps. If OpenCPS crashes, uh, we are able to, to collect core dumps. Like uh, modern Linux distributions, they have all kind of um, helpers to, to collect core dumps, and actually those are just uh, in a way of uh, collecting uh, the logs. They are doing all kinds of things, uh, helping to send the logs to, to, to the Ubuntu repo or Red Hat or whatever, but we want to have them locally, we don't want to share with anyone. So these are three single steps. Uh, on a system if you want to enable core dumps immediately. So uh, we need to make sure that the OpenCPS uh, is able to, to create the core dumps, not just the root user. And then we want to have a nice uh, for the uh, core file. So we're going to save them under slash DMP core, and we're going to have the name of the process, the user, and uh, a timestamp. So identify, and sometimes with OpenCPS, when we have a crash, we have uh, a crash in a process, and then that crash can generate another crash in the, um, in the main C process, so we can have two crashes. That's why if we set this uh, core uh, finding pattern, it's good because we're going to have two core files and we can easily identify which one belongs to which uh, process. And uh, more info about uh, uh, the naming of the file can be found if we do a man core and also check that a port and core dump CTL is disabled. I think a port is for Debian and core dump CTL is for Red Hat and uh, CentOS. Yeah? 
just a quick note, if you enable this on production, you better put some different directory for uh, for the core dumps, because if you're crashing repeatedly, it will eventually overflow your <laughs> storage. Uh, so anything that I provide here is uh, like uh, to make you guys aware of what you should do. And it's up to you if you want to change something and uh, tune it. It's just to give that the basic steps in in a, in a simple way and clear way. So, yeah, anything can be customized and uh, everything can be yeah, customized to, to suit your needs. And also for the core dumps uh, on the OpenCPS uh, wiki page, uh, on the documentation page, uh, there's a troubleshooting crash. There are lots of information about how to, to get info from the, from the crash and uh, what to do with it. I'm not going to go into those details because everything is uh, it's there. And it's right. Okay, so with this in mind, now we are ready for, for troubleshooting. So there's no recipe for troubleshooting. Like if, if we have an issue, we have an issue and each issue is different and each should be investigated differently. So, uh, if, uh, if there's a simple bug that can be reproduced with, uh, with a single call, we have no control over the traffic, and uh, we need to, to, to investigate, just know that something is wrong. So, what can we do in this case? Well, we look in the logs for uh, the logs, and this will give us an insight of what's happening. Uh, we can have insufficient memory uh, or memory leaks, so we will have logs uh, telling us that we are running out of memory. And then sometimes we have issues with uh, the UDP queue or TCP queue being too small and packets being uh, dropped, or the OpenCPS uh, open uh, processes are, are overloaded. So, if we check the logs and we see that uh, we have memory issues, what we can do is uh, we identify what, which memory we need to deal with, the package or the shared. Package is for process, shared is uh, the shared memory for OTP. It and see if the problem goes away. Uh, increasing it, it's uh, it's done uh, either in uh, in the in its script or in the default file. Uh, again, this is for Ubuntu, for Red Hat, and CentOS might be a little bit different, but that's the idea. Uh, here are two links for, uh, uh, with more information about uh, dealing with uh, memory issues in, uh, in OpenCPS. I'm not going to go into the details because, again, it's on the documentation page and everything is well explained there. Uh, if we have uh, memory leaks, Okay, if we have memory leaks, so if we increase the memory and after that we are still having issues, probably we are dealing with the memory leak. So in order to troubleshoot uh, memory leaks, we have another link from the documentation page, which explains clearly how to identify them, what to do, uh, and uh, yeah. We check the UDP queue. So uh, if we look into slash prop net UDP, we have the statistics. Uh, we here we have the received queue. Normally this one should be prop should be also zero. This uh, these two counters. For more information about uh, also this information is available inside the OpenCPS as a statistic. 
please check the net class open C++ core statistics. It's it's all in the on the on the website under documentation for each release. Uh, now, if uh, sometimes, so we can run this command like uh, uh, using the watch command and we can uh, have it run continuously every second, half a second or whatever. And sometimes we will see that the receipt queue is not zero. And that's perfectly normal because it, it all depends when you do the interrogation. But as, soon, as long as the receipt queue goes back to zero, it's all good. Now, if we see this counter uh, going up and not being zero, uh, it's not good. It means that we are dropping back. It means that uh, OpenCPass is not able to, to process uh, the, the traffic uh, as soon as it comes. So what do we need to do in this case? Uh, we check. Uh, what's the size of the UDP queue size? And usually this is the standard one. This is how the, the, the operating system uh, comes uh, with. This is, these are the default values. This is 208 kilobytes. And most of the time this is not enough. So we can increase it. And we can increase it instantly uh, using the sysctl command. And uh, like in this example, we set it to, to 50 megabytes. And we need to restart OpenCPass uh, to take advantage of it, I think. No, no, I don't think so. So doing this, it's, it's, it's all good. We increase this, and after this, we should see that the counter stays the same. The, the counter doesn't increase. Uh, and then, uh, if we want to make this uh, change permanently, we need to, to edit the slash etc cctl.conf and we put the new values there and uh, now it's persistent and we are all good. Uh, after increasing the, the UDP QM, we, uh, we see that we are still having issues. Probably we are dealing with uh, some other problems. And what do we do next? We check the OpenCPass uh, prompt load. This is an invaluable uh, statistic. It's, 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 this should be one of the, the main things that you should monitor. The load of the process uh, is available to the load class OpenCPass statistic. And uh, it's uh, telling us the percentage of time spent in doing processing versus total time. Uh, this statistic is well documented on the, on the documentation page. And uh, just like the load, we uh, OpenCPass team implemented it uh, in real-time load, the load for one minute and uh, the load for the last uh, 10 minutes. So if we see a process that is loaded at 100%, that is not good. It means that the, that process is, is stuck, it's uh, overloaded, it's in a deadlock, something is, is not right with it. And by doing, uh, we can run the OpenCPS uh, CLI command PS the, uh, through the MI interface, and we get a list of all processes and, and all the bits, and uh, we can correlate the PID uh, of the process uh, with the one that is uh, overload it and we can see which one is uh, uh, creating issues. Um, to alleviate this, sometimes um, the, the load on a process is simply high because we don't have enough uh, workers. So we start with a certain number of workers and then the traffic increases, they are maxed out and an easy way to get out of this is to use the auto process uh, scaling. Documented um, on, uh, on the OpenCPS website, there is a nice blog. You can read it and you can learn more about it and uh, play with it. 
and uh, yeah. Uh, the next uh, thing that uh, we need to do is uh, monitoring. Like uh, when we want to troubleshoot something, we want to know when the issue started and what happened prior and uh, and after. Uh, one easy way to, to monitor OpenCPS is uh, via Prometheus uh, and uh, using Grafana. This requires a little bit of work. Also, some, uh, some monitoring can be done through OpenCPS uh, CP panel. Uh, I think there are some uh, ways to, to monitor all kinds of uh, statistics there. Uh, I haven't used it, but Prometheus is very light. We can uh, set it up to, to do every second, and uh, we can save everything into the, into the DB, and we just visualize uh, everything. Um, so, uh, we identified that we have an issue, uh, how to investigate it, that's a whole different story. Let's say that we, we have a fix, a potential fix, and we want to, to test it. And how to test it, how to test that, the, the, the fix. In order to do this, we, we need to, either we can, if we can reproduce it in the lab, it's nice because uh, we can validate the fix, we can push the fix to production, and everything is good. But if the fix is only, uh, if the issue, uh, we can catch it only in, the, in production, uh, what do we do? Well, we need to run a, a test version of uh, OpenCPS. Uh, and running a test version of OpenCPS is good also not just for validating, but for investigating. So um, we want to, we know that we have an issue with a module, and what we want to do, we want to add some custom logs into that module, recompile it and run it, or run a module, a single uh, module in full debug mode while having uh, all the other modules in uh, production mode. So we can download the code, we can uh, compile it, we can uh, modify, we can uh, substitute all the debug uh, probes into info probes, and uh, and like this, that module will run with full debug logs uh, without changing the log level in, in OpenCPS. Uh, so. How can we, we achieve this without messing up with, uh, with our production server? Because we want to keep it clean. So one way is we can download the source code under slash user local src opencms, for example. We compile it, make call, and we do not run make install. We don't want to, to, to install the test version of OpenCPS into the production server. We just uh, build it. Copy of uh, the slash etc OpenCPS under slash user local etc. We adjust the config file. Uh, one important step is to update the, the end path. Uh, this is the as modules are, uh, to point to, to our uh, repo where we build our test uh, open sequence. And then, based on what we have in the config, we might need to do some, uh, some other uh, tweaks. But usually, if we have this one, it's, uh, it's enough. If you are using a database, it doesn't matter where the OpenCPS is uh, next. Uh, we will create an uh, OpenCPS 
test service. Uh, and we are doing this by uh, copying the existing OpenCPAS service uh, uh, into a new file, the OpenCPAS test. And then we modify it. We modify the, the OpenCPAS binary uh, to point to our new location where we install the open, OpenCPAS. Then simply we stop OpenCPAS, we start the OpenCPAS test, and like this we are running the, the new version, the test version of OpenCPAS without uh, messing out uh, the system. Yes, Bogdan? Five minutes, okay. Um, how do we switch back to the production uh, after done with the testing? and? Okay, so we are here, we are running the OpenCPAS test. We want to uh, change something in the source code. We change it, we recompile it, we restart the OpenCPAS test service, and we are all good to go. When everything is okay, we want to we update our binaries, uh, like the, the production packages, we push them, and we want to, to go back to the production mode. What do we need to do? We stop the OpenCPAS test uh, service, we start the OpenCPAS, and then we simply we remove the, the directory where we have the, the source config. We remove the link to the, the sorry, not the link, we, leave, we remove the OpenCPAS uh, test service. Uh, it's like it was before. And all is good. And kind of, uh, that's it. So I managed to be on time. Um, yeah, so another here uh, going to, like, um, we have the slash interface. If on the production server we don't want to install the, the development packages, we want, don't want to do the compilation there, uh, we can build everything uh, in the lab. We can create this uh, directory in the lab and we compile open CPAS there. We tar it and we just copy it into the production server and uh, just run it. And yes, that's it. If you guys have any questions. <laughs> questions? No one? Okay, clear as mud. <laughs> Yes, I did. Can I dishes up? <laughs> yeah, it was open. <laughs> Not so. <laughs> Great job, Obi. I was listening from the back room. Okay. Wow, lots more people showed up. We got you right on lunch room. Next. Next on our list is uh, the Goodwin Brothers. Shlomi and Amit Uh Voice Center is one of the organizers, so let's give them a round of applause for them. <laughs> and uh, they're going to be talking to us about something cool, new, and exciting called OpenSips.js. Joe? Thank you, Alex. Thank you. So, generally, uh, we'll we don't get to introduce the uh, uh, project and uh, what we are doing in Open and Voice Center. So generally, Voice Center, we are a cloud contact center provider, a platform, a platform provider for a telco all around the world and giving our own SICAS uh, 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 solutions. Uh, we are around uh, 120 employees located uh, all around the globe, we are proudly partner uh, Alex here in Office Ring, so we are in our US activity, this part the guy. And uh, apologizing for any behavior on his behalf. They did it today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, beside that, we have a developer team in Israel and also in Ukraine. 
where most of our developers are operating there. And generally, the project that we're going to discuss about today is being uh, all made in lab inside the uh, lab in Ukraine uh, under uh, a war. And uh, generally, I wish they were here today speaking and uh, being a show the ability to show the work. Uh, unfortunately, they need to stay in their country and fight for it. I can use this opportunity really to recommend uh, the IT guys in Ukraine are being great uh, employees and they, they really need our support right now. So each one of you that can get any employee can get out of there. It's a, first of all, it's a very good they are worker guys, but it's also a way for us to, as a community, uh, to help them on this situation. Uh, so, finishing that, let's discuss a little bit about uh, OpenSafeJS. Uh, so, OpenSafeJS is, uh, uh, we will discuss what it is, we will discuss a little bit about our current states, and try to show you how to use it and uh, what our goals over it, and then speak a bit, a bit about uh, uh, future roadmaps in there. And, uh, we are really looking for uh, as much as community involvement and we'll speak about it from the uh, uh, presentation, but it's all really about creating some kind of an ecosystem that will help the front-end developers and the end user to get easily interact with uh, what we are doing on the backend from uh, as an open source community. Uh, so Generally, so what is OpenSafeJS? It's supposed to be like a, a fully generic application or SDK for any developer, especially web developer that have no idea about VoIP. And most companies, are, there is a big uh, gap in the backend that work over the telephony, over the front end. And we are seeing this also on the cooperation from the open source activity there that it's a little bit less. Uh, of course, there is the WebRTC mafia, and uh, I wouldn't want to get uh, in the way, but uh, they are really feeding our soul, and we are uh, based on JSC as being uh, the best signaling. Uh, client-side implementation that there is today in the market. And our goal is really to not uh, uh, compete, because we are all based on JSC, uh, is really to give another level of uh, application that are involving also about the media. Uh, later on, we are working over the MSRP and chatting and giving a lot of application level and not handling the, that are above what the JSC is all about. Because JSC is trying to be a signaling layer. And while we will try to start push uh, too much of application, the guys say, guys, this is not the right way to put it. And uh, from the second side, we're really trying as an open source community to get more and more uh, communities to get engaged and to work and more developers that never thought that touch those kind of stuff to be able to use them. So uh, this is the goal. One, uh, from a technical perspective, it's all been based on a TypeScript. I don't know who is aware what is TypeScript. Good, good, good. Much more web developers' knowledge than I expect. I guess the people are getting younger. If I would ask this uh, in the last conference in the US six years ago, I would probably have to react. But it's showing really that those worlds are getting more and more connected, and this is why we really believe that this is effort should be coming forward. Anyway, about TypeScript, uh, for you who don't know, it's a little bit uh, more. It's a the framework of writing for code in JavaScript that we did more of a strict way and uh, time <coughs> definition, uh, which is very important to have uh, for the stability of a project. <coughs> what the? What the? Take over. Okay. Okay. So. Yeah.
Shut your microphone up so you don't see that. Yeah. So, um, just to quickly uh, bounce in, and as usually I represent myself in this form as Shlomi's brother. As, uh, Arctic brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I had a few conferences which I skipped, so every time I came later on, the years after, everyone introduced me as Shlomi's brother. So, since then, that's my name here. Shlomi's brother, good man. Nice to meet you. <laughs> and generally, um, going directly from to the next slide by making the point that during all our years with OpenSIPs and working to launch more and more services and products on our network, we found a huge gap between the web developers and the telephony guys. And I'm sure you have in your companies as well. And you know, sometimes it's like they don't even speak the same language when it comes to integrating. And part of this project importance is to allow those two different business units, two of them are developers, two of them might be backend developers, not just front end, but uh, to connect the dots and be able to uh, integrate their web applications together with an OpenSIPS implementation uh, as part of the libraries. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Where we are standing now, pretty much at the basic and the most important uh, implementation of different voice. Uh, we will show it uh, later. We're building now the basic uh, library of uh, the under it will be the ecosystem of all of the other one. We'll talk a bit later. Uh, we are now doing a lot of other stuff, uh, everything about the media. Uh, statistics, so we are collecting all of the web RTC stuff, all of the RTCP stuff, and also giving the user the ability to display it, we will show it as well. So we are trying really to get side, uh, step by step <coughs> getting all of the different applications and all of the different features that we would like to have as uh, our dream for SDK. Uh, generally, so when we are talking about the ecosystem, so of course we have OpenSIPS as our backend, and we are trying to build like a very good, uh, uh, stable to work on it to build other libraries. So the idea is really to give the ability for each web developer to choose whatever framework he loves to work with. Right now we are. <coughs> We're already implementing uh, OpenSIPS and OpenSIPS VUE. Uh, generally, we are a very big fan of VUE. I think that, like, between uh, Angular of Google and uh, React of Facebook, we as a community need to choose VUE as the community driven one. And there is a lot of uh, things and bad things about it. It's like uh, each one of his own. Uh, believe and uh, thought about those directions, but in the end we do understand that we need to have frameworks for all of them. So this is like a goal <coughs> for us, for anyone that is very, that they have a React uh, senior developer, that they have Angular senior developer, call us, and we really want you to join them to help us build the other three libraries that will fill out this uh, ecosystem. Of course, anyone that has any other idea, uh, someone that has to do jQuery for the whole the website or anything like that. So, <coughs> as much framework that we will have there, it will be better and more people and more communities can engage it. We, and we are being added, of course, all of the different applications that we are building together based on, uh, today based on that. So, we will show you later our home extension. Uh, we have a lot of CRM SDKs, like we are putting our phones inside of Salesforce or any other uh, CRM. Uh, electron, desktop applications, uh, any embedded contact us, web page, uh, push to talk and stuff like that. Uh, of course, we have our next goal is to give uh, React more, uh, native or uh, Ionic of uh, Angular uh, native uh, libraries. So we can also have a mobile uh, application SDK for building those kind of stuff. 
And to for, so on and on, each one with his own needs, with his own requirement. And the idea is really to have one framework that can give the, the user and the members of this community to each car, any kind of front end application that they want. Um, a little bit about uh, how to implement it. We really try to make it as simple as we can. Uh, if anyone has any ideas, it's like everything very first draft. So we are very open to change interfaces, to have any uh, feedback from you guys about how would you like to see it. But this was the first draft that we got out of it. And looking forward to for, uh, getting any uh, feedback about it. So generally we can in, import uh, the Void Center team of LCGS library and just uh, with a simple constructor need of course to tell, the, uh, to tell which user, which password and the uh, WebSocket domain. Uh, of course, can add any custom layers, any other thing. Uh, we, have, we will later show you we are having an old implementation, so you can, for example, do login in front of Google, getting the JWT from Google, and then pass it here as an authentication header, and then validate through the JWT model inside OpenSeed in front of Google that this is a valid token. So, a lot of cool stuff that will be really easy to implement uh, that connect the web world and the telco sim world that we are living in time. Uh, going around the list of, uh, after running this constructor, uh, we have a list <coughs> of uh, functions that we can run with. Anything from, first of all, doing setting up the media device, setting up the a microphone, a speaker, all other stuff, and uh, generally uh, even a simple to call function that just calls somewhere. So if you know if any one of you, any, who is here ever to uh, implement a JS tip uh, call? So usually implement a simple call, you will need to do a lot of JavaScript behind the scene, you will need to to HTML element, a lot of stuff that uh, are very hard to people to understand. Just the idea of grabbing up an STP out of a packet, injecting it into the, the source of a audio element inside of the HTML, this is something that need to have a lot of knowledge of understanding SDP, which most web developer doesn't have. And the ability really to implement those kind of stuff in a simple way and implement behind the scene anything that needs to be done in front of the browser, that was our goal. We are giving any basic activity from code transfer to the complete environments that will come in our housing, so the ability to call all with, to talk to two persons, now move to talk to another two persons, give those other two persons to talk. Anything that we would love to have in the phone, that was our challenge, really to build uh, some kind of a SDK for the phone, barrier for any application that later on we will be made based on that. Um, Again, we can get uh, very easy functions and, uh, that will give us all of the state, which rooms do we have, which uh, calls do we have. Uh, the idea is really we are trying to work with uh, the Redux. Uh, Redux. So generally, Redux is the idea of uh, a lot of statistics, a lot of stuff that we have been able to collect, from, Correlated per call, also hosting it inside of the client uh, local storage. So you can really build good uh, troubleshooting tools and give a geek mode to show later. So any geek person 
that the world can see that you have some audio issue, can get the right metrics and understand what are the issue over the servers, over the client side. Of course, the, the, the mixing of the sound falling. So actually, if you will go, uh, can you click, uh, click inside the picture? Side of the look inside of the out of the uh, index JS, so we can see that we have this internal function that can do conferencing that actually gave in a list of calls and making sure that, that we are putting a mixer with all of those calls as long as we are making sure that each one doesn't get like we are actually building for each participant uh, its own mixer of audio that involved with all of the rest of the participant beside is actually inside of the JavaScript, inside of the main uh, really do those kind of stuff. But the whole thing is still giving you a very interesting interfaces on studio mixing without uh, a 10 participant feature. So a total of 100 uh, participants. Of, of course, it's not like a uh, best use case in the conference room, please to use free switch or something to be that you can do really whatever you want and to use the local computer you might be interested about looking on them if anyone again have any other idea how to do those kinds of magic and do better uh, giving them more, better features over there we are very happy and looking for it uh, a little bit talking about the uh, future roadmap so uh, we are uh, we will talk a bit uh, uh, next slide about the MSRP. We are also planning about doing all uh, the PA, uh, push notifications. Today, I don't know if most of you know, uh, you can already do like push notification home extension. So the idea is really to give the ability to pop up uh, a browser or to open the home. You can open your application when you get application uh, not running. So this is a very important and uh, good use case as uh, everyone uses push notification in the world of uh, mobile, over the world of uh, uh, web. It's still not something that's very common and we are trying to give a good framework for it. Um, as I say, we are looking for uh, React and Angular uh, developers to join the force with us and really build the libraries for those uh, frameworks. <coughs> Uh, later on, also in the last uh, long tail uh, roadmap, we are also talking about doing end-to-end uh, -end encryption uh, with the help of OpenSeed solution guys. Uh, we are open to we want some discussion, even to signal uh, lib or something like that, so to do integration of a chain. So it's still something that open and. Uh, Again, we all need the community support about it. Uh, pushing, uh, get some, uh, get the rest of Bogdan or throw money on him or beg him for stuff. But, ah. <laughs> what? You're explicit. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> we did it. We know what we want. Uh, so beside the, that, uh, uh, we are working heavily on the bio that you know. Uh, the idea is not that the uh, Open6 guy did and implement the MSRP. The idea is really to keep uh, the side of implementing those on web socket, on web applications. So we see more and more all of the instant method and in, uh, in the web implementation. We I say the behind it, we have virtual players. If you are looking over what are the main uh, players over the Eastern uh, and the way that uh, it's all about closed network of that made each one of us uh, pretty much like 20 different instant messaging, I think that we need to do a better job of giving uh, open source uh, instant messaging. Uh, we are working closely with uh, the metrics guy and uh, rocket chat that uh, just did this movement that building all of their backend based on the metrics API. Uh, also in the future we are uh, planning on having a metrics uh, to open SIPs 
Uh, so it will really be as a community to connect to another uh, instant messaging application. Uh, Showing a little bit of demos of it. Sure, sure. Do you let me? Yeah. Okay, I got it. Five, Five minutes. minutes. Good, Five good, minutes. good. Well, before I go into the demos, is there any questions? Someone wants moderation again. I know. I just want to make sure that everyone knows who's the older brother. So, <laughs> anyone can ask us who's the older brother, please. I see a hand there. So, were you stretching your back? No, so you, okay. <laughs> can anyone please ask? Okay, so I will answer you because everyone asked. Thank you. What's the question back there? Who's the older brother? Thank you, I am. <laughs> I got you first. No, the brother got me first. It doesn't work like that. So now, taking the time, the 10 minutes I have extra on him in my life and just spend two of them. Yeah, another question, Mike. Who is the smarter brother? Of course, bro. <laughs> so, it took him quite seven minutes to explain you what we try and do, and now in three minutes I'll show you what he meant, okay? <laughs> um, so, um, so, this is the way we got him. Am I ready for everyone? Open openjs.org. You can enjoy it, download the link, there's a link to GitHub, you can deploy the uh, project yourself and start playing with it. This is the demo page, which is some kind of a login page. I will have 12 tips for who doesn't have much experience with web development. Yeah. So, I was just opening the dev tools, going to network, and showing that I will refresh so we can see what's going on here behind the scene. I will clear the history now and I will quickly paste some username, password and the secret ingredient, the OpenSIP server behind it. And we will all say the Wi-Fi blessing. Hi man, got connected, good. And as we can all see, we actually have here a registered extension and I assume you all know what register 400 unauthorized means and then another register with an OK 200 but look that's weird we're not seeing it in an SNGREP or pickup trace it's actually over the browser what's going on here and uh, so this is the web socket that demonstrate the SIP uh, signaling over the web and of course I will also make a call Alex are you available right now with your local US American citizen number yeah I tried to reach you you were screaming I was trying to get sent for the demo, then you were going to go. So, what's, what's your number? 832. 832. 900. Wait, wait, wait. 1. 832. 900. 900. 8610. What? 8610. 8610. And I will call this. And now, uh, guess what? I get an invite. I get a giving it a try. Ringing, ringing, okay. Greetings and salutations. Yeah, so the HDMI doesn't get it. Oh, wait, do you mean that we only have one way audio? <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? With this Wi Fi, I'm excited we can sing them. I'm going to sign up to Wi Fi as well. So the job is with me. Anyone who's trying to do the mute, the mute, transfer. Can I transfer you to 911 or something? No, just never mind that. Can I transfer you to 911? They'll be coming for you. So, keep that thing So, um, just to give you another nice example of how we wrapped it up in our own voice center commercial application using all these nice backend tools. Um, so, of course, you can see here, let me just start by showing you our own home extension, it's actually, actually like a nice floating soft phone as part of the, we call it like the toolbar that floats above. Of course you can call any number you want. I will show you the history of Alex from before. Yeah, so all those numbers, of course it's all multi all right, I was calling you with my Ukraine number, sorry. And that's why you screened me. 
Of course, you can see that inside this application, other than, let's just do an article to show you that. By the way, you came across this potential spam. <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> Since the production is working, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> what I will do now, I will quickly control F5 this one while we already open up the F12 because the web socket is something you only see if it's open while the browser gets open after a few seconds, you wouldn't be able to see that. And now we see the same uh, SIM registrations uh, signaling, and I will call whatever some other toll free number. <coughs> And you can see the call is coming out, you see everything coming out, you see the call. You can have pop-up windows, you can have a, a before you can do more calls to the same conference. And let's just do our echo thing here, just to recognize that there's two different calls. That's the one that was answered. And, and the call we have to add more and more and more rooms or participants into the same room. And, and I'm really like one minute late, so I will just show you how we wrapped it up in a nice home extension. We can also show you, for example, the history of the agent interactions. So you can actually drill, see all the history of calls that I had with them. And then you can wrap it up with some forms or basic stuff that you want to send to the CRM or just manage internally yourself. So um, any web developer can take it really anywhere. The next steps are to add more tabs here for the chaining and the MSRB integrations and to have it uh, all part of the same solution. So thank you very much for your time, for your help. Thank you for that. Managed to get the product up for us and help us get where we are. one question. And while I'm coming back to the other next presenter, get up here and start getting ready. Me. I am. Well, I'm well, ten, minutes, 10 minutes. Someone was asking again, who's older? What? No, no, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I was just going to ask, does it only work with Chromium-based browsers? Uh, be honest, it shouldn't. We want to have something that is uh, can work everywhere. Get, you know, we do need to get to some stack first, so the Chromium uh, stack for sure. But if there is any other requirements or anything like that, we are uh, testing it also on Firefox and other stuff. But really, anything, uh, uh, any environment is uh, should be a good challenge for us to adapt it to. Yeah. One more question, because that was quick. There was a, there we go. Plan. There is in the project link, but uh, it's a uh, voice center team slash uh, open JS. Uh, it will be also on the presentation, and uh, anyone that wants welcome to come to pick it up. But again, everything and all of the information is in www.opensipsjs.org. So opensifjs.org. Okay, that's uh, all the room we have for questions. These guys will be around tomorrow too. They're going to be doing some uh, some demos. So uh, feel free to reach out to them, you know, later on during the day uh, and tomorrow as well. So let's give them one more round of applause. And one more round of applause for me, our organizers, one of our organizers this year. Thank you for all the hard work, guys. We really made it an impressive light show for everybody. Next up, we have Brett. He's going to be talking to us about the dark side of caller ID. He was also one of our panel members yesterday, so you can obviously tell that he's got quite a bit of knowledge in this area. I'm um, looking forward to seeing it. Brett? Um, so my name is Brett Nemiroff. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the dark side of uh, caller ID. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of caller ID and how it's failed us and how stir shaking isn't really helping the problem right now. Uh, so first of all, uh, uh, know your speaker. So you guys have heard me talk about identity. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my identity. Who am I? Why can you trust me? Uh, <laughs> I am um, a telecom engineer. I've been doing this for about uh, 25 years. About half of that time, 
I've been uh, building phone companies. The other half of the time, I've been building application uh, services. It gives me kind of an interesting perspective on uh, both the challenges that phone companies have, like implementing technology and scaling them out, and also applications on uh, challenges with regulatory environments and how we actually make phone calls that actually work. So I've seen challenges on both sides. Um, and before we get by a show of hands, likes receiving phone calls. Wow, how about not on your birthday? <laughs> okay, just, okay, like two people, three people, that's good. Well, I, I think that this is like a problem. It's something that we should think about. Like we've talked about like in telecom, this race to zero. This will struggle for relevancy in the industry right now. People, like, they don't want to use the phone as much as they used to. In this room, you probably have something to do with making phone calls happen, right? So we need to think about what can we do to become more relevant? What can we do to get people to, like, want to use the phone, right? Because the phone's kind of annoying right now. If the phone rings, uh, you don't want to get it. Uh, it. It's something that I, I think you should all think about is what would a world look like if every time your phone rang, you wanted to answer the phone, right? Like it was always a call that was interesting or something uh, that you wanted to, to hear from, right? Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, I, I ha I've been doing this for uh, about 25 years, but when I started this, I had uh, I was working with the IPTEL SIR project. So I followed through from SIR to open SIR to open SIPs. And, uh, and here we are, and uh, yeah, okay. Uh, and then knowing the audience here, I think it's interesting about who you guys are, and this, I, I said this a little bit yesterday when I was paneling, is uh, you guys are innovators, right? And you guys specifically distinguish yourselves from other people in the industry where you guys are building phone switches. So when it comes to like implementing new technology, you guys are gonna be nimble enough to like implement those technologies before other people are able to do it. So I think it's really important that you guys are involved in some of the, 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 uh, the brainstorming on, on what we can do to, to do things better. Now I may be dating myself a little bit, but uh, Colorado for 1995. In fact, uh, the, very, uh, the very first trials of uh, caller ID Oh, worked until 1984. Now, before 1984, we didn't have a caller ID, the phone would ring. We'd have no idea who it was, and it might even be exciting when uh, the phone was ringing. I don't know if you guys remember this, but when I was a kid, I remember sometimes it was even a race to answer the phone. Maybe it was a grandparent calling, but it was always something that you wanted to get. Um, and as time moved on, by about 1995, Melport Type II caller ID, which had these little caller ID boxes which give you a name and number, that came out. And that gave us an, a way to screen calls and know who's calling before uh, before you answered the phone. Um, now that that was great for consumers because you could see if you wanted to answer the phone before you answered the phone. In addition, because of the prevalence of CTI, uh, uh, telemarketing became a whole lot more popular. So you're getting a lot more calls that you didn't want to get. Now you could see uh, who's calling before you answered it. Uh, move forward to 1996, the Telecommunications Act of 1996 to regulate telecommunications, and it allowed uh, competitive uh, carriers to attach to the Bell Network and make phone calls. Now, had the Bell Network known that they were going to have thousands of network and making phone calls, they may have done things differently. Namely, they may have put some sort of security layer in the PSTN. But as it is right now, it's an easy thing to do. It's stir shaken really isn't solving that particular issue. So knowing that you know, caller ID was giving this, this great screening me me mechanism, in 2004 the FCC came out and basically said, if you're involved in marketers being clever, or thinking they're clever, uh, basically it's all uh, more interesting, so people actually answer the phone. Then the FCC in 2011 came out with the Truth and Caller ID Act, where they basically said, oh, if you falsify your information to defraud people, uh, well, now we have penalties and fines uh, to come after you with. The robocalling kept on getting more and more of a problem. In 2013, uh, the FTC came out with their robocaller uh, challenge, which based $1,000 prize to any business or person who can, could come up with a solution to the robocalling problem. Uh, the uh, challenge was immensely successful. They had almost 800 uh, submissions, and those submissions included Everything from best practice statements on how to protect yourself to hardware solutions and software solutions. Now, a lot of those software solutions are these, these apps that you can run on your phone, on iPhones or Android phones. Um, and uh, that really led to, uh, in 2017 or so, what I call the, the uh, 
proliferation of uh, call analytics providers, or the, I like to also call it the Wild West. Okay, uh, And there were hundreds, if not thousands, of these of individual applications that allowed people to flag calls as spam. And it would be crowdsourced data, right? So all that information goes back to a central database and, um, and helps other people block calls too. But of course, this meant for getting called at dinner. I uh, can't get uh, calls from that number either. This was a real problem for enterprises because your number could get flagged and get blocked on one of these databases. There was no API or mechanism to uh, to redress or off of one of those lists. So, in around 2018, uh, companies like Numerical came out to help uh, manage uh, reputation across multiple analytics providers. <clears throat> so, caller ID was a solution for the time when it originally came out. It gave us a way to know who was calling uh, before we answered the phone and raised some interesting privacy questions for the call originator. This is a funny thing to think about when call people who are calling you were complaining that the phone company was divulging their identity to you. And they thought that that was an invasion of privacy. Just kind of a funny <laughs> side note. But for this caller ID, this, this name that shows up, there's absolutely no verification of content is used generally for CNAP today. It's still like that today. Uh, caller ID has fundamentally failed us. Now, you see this screenshot right here, and I don't know if you can see this, but it says, this is Darth Vader. Uh, this is an actual call that I got when I was putting my presentation together. I couldn't believe it happened. I'm literally putting my slides together, and Darth Vader called me. And I was so excited when I saw this call, I had to answer it. Okay. <laughs> and I asked Mr. Vader uh, how, he, how he changed his name and how he, how he made this happen. Uh, and he explained to me that it was really easy. He just went onto his carrier website, typed in his name, Darth Vader, hit submit, and here we are. <laughs> Remember, without caller ID, we were excited to answer the phone, and it gave us a way to screen calls. And it, um, it made us think that we could trust the displayed information. I mean, after all, the phone company put this onto my phone, right? Why should I not trust that Darth Vader is actually calling me? At the end of the day, it allowed callers to impersonate a more desirable call. I mean, for example, the neighborhood scheme, right? Like, maybe that's my kid's school. I'm going to definitely answer that call because I just don't know. Uh, what people are doing is they're, they're, they're tricking people into answering the phone. Telemarketers are tricking people to answer the phone. And I feel like that method is dead, right? Everybody knows that now. Like, the number one way to get your calls not answered is, is, to, is to look like you're calling from the same NPA and to not recognize the number. Like that, I know, number one, if I live in Austin, 512 area code, if somebody calls me with a 512 number that I don't recognize, it is not important, never. It is not my kids' school, right? It's number one way. So what's the number one way now to get your call answered? It's identity, is, is tell them exactly who you are with 100% certainty. And if they want to answer your call, they'll get it. If they don't, you've got a bigger business problem. Um, so when I was talking about setting the, the caller name information, I took a couple of screenshots, and I'm sorry if some of you work for the companies of the screenshots that I took these from, but these are some examples of the actual screens to set caller name, and you'll see the, the common commonality here is for most of these, you, you, you just type the name of the business and just put Darth Vader in here, and you just hit submit, and that's it. Nobody asks for ID, they don't ask you to upload any proof of anything, it's just bam, it's done, Darth Vader. Please don't do this, I didn't tell you to. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how old-fashioned caller ID works. I'm gonna fly through this because I'm gonna run out of time if I don't. Um, everything in the United States, at least for caller ID, works off of LIDB, and the originating service provider takes your name and your number and transmits that into LIDB. And then when you make a phone call, you transmit only your calling number, and then the terminating service provider will dip that information, LIDB passes back your name, and then the name gets passed off to the call destination. That's generally how it works. Maybe your call is Darth Vader, and that's what's explained. Um, but it, it just doesn't work that way anymore because of the analytics providers. And we, we talked a little bit about the analytics providers yesterday, uh, and I'm going to slide here in a second, so if you don't know the pairing, I'll show you the pairing. But it's Hiya, First Orion, and TNS. Those are the main analytics providers. And the reason why those are the main ones after this whole proliferation of analytics providers is because they partnered up with uh, the major wireless carriers, which make up like more than 90% of the, the calling traffic. Um, 
So the courier solution for the robocalling issue, it came swiftly. The FCC basically said, you've got to do something about this robocalling issue. And so one of the things that they do is this local alteration of caller ID. Uh, I mean, I think I know the answer, but can you raise your hand if you've seen a label like this? Yeah, I mean, I would expect most. So, and I'm being really deliberate with my words, local alteration of caller ID. You know, collected your customer's name and maybe you did KYC, hopefully you did KYC. You put it into Libby, and then you basically trusted everybody else out there to like display that information. You transmitted the number across the PSTN. It got all the way to the wireless provider, and at the very last minute, they decided to switch it to this and then they give it to the customer. Like, how annoying is that? It totally ignores uh, CNAM. It's based on some sort of magical property. We don't know why they did this. It's effectively a reputation score. It's really, really hard for customers to manage. Them. So, I mean, you guys understand this probably better than most people, but a typical enterprise um, has no idea why this happened to their calls, or, or why is it potential spam? And sometimes it's scam likely. Like, the words are similar, but they're different, but why are they like that? And lastly, really, really negatively scored calls, and once again, we don't know how they're scored or why they're scored, they'll be network blocked. Well, I want to talk about network blocking for a little bit because for about 100 years on the PSTN, uh, carriers, common carriers at least, were required to complete calls. They had call completion obligations. Like if a call landed on the network, they were required to complete the call if they could complete the call. The 2019 FCC declaratory ru ruling uh, basically said that call blocking services do not violate the service provider's call completion obligations. Um, in fact, they normalize the blocking behavior by drawing similarities to methodologies to avoid toll fraud. Right? It effectively said it's okay to block calls. For the first time, like in 100 years, it's okay to block calls. And that's where we are now. Do, now, also by a show of hands, who here has problems with their customers' calls getting blocked? Right? Has this been a problem and a frustrating struggle trying to figure out how to navigate this ecosystem? Okay, here's the pairing here. All right, and it's really important. The names that show up here are a fingerprint for who the analytics provider is. This was done intentionally. This is not an accident. They coordinated all these names. You can see here. First Orion works with T-Mobile, and they present scam likely. Uh, TNS works with Verizon, and they present potential fraud or potential spam. And Hiya works with AT&T, and they present high risk or spam caller. This is not everything that they say, but this is the majority of what they say. Okay. Now, if you're having these problems, the number one way to fix this is to go to these companies, and they offer services. Actually, they, 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 each one of them has links where you can go to, and for free, you can say, please, uh, don't do this to my call anymore. And they'll. And most of this is done through like Zendesk. It's it's opening a trouble ticket. It's putting the information in an opaque opaque field without any kind of KYC or proof of identity. And maybe they clean it up. Maybe they don't. Maybe it lasts more than a week. Maybe it doesn't. Um, you can. They do also have commercial services too. Now. Um, I'm not plugging my company, but, but, but Numerical also does do this. There are other companies out there as well that will manage the reputation across uh, multiple companies as well. Uh, now, I'm going to talk a little bit about call labeling and blocking, um, the, the magic that's happening here. So uh, just like the caller ID, the CNAM uh, method, uh, when originators make calls, we just transmit the phone number. And the terminating service provider sends that phone number to the analytics provider. And the analytics provider uh, performs their magic. Maybe they'll take a look at like you know the call frequency that that that, that caller ID is using. Maybe they take a look at the call duration, the average call duration that that particular call is doing. Uh, whether or not you're making a lot of calls on the do not call list, uh, whether or not uh, you're using stir shaken or what the, the typical attestation is, or if the attestation is changing, and some other magic magic that we haven't thought about. And, and here, here's some magic that maybe you haven't thought about is whether or not your phone number ingresses the terminating service provider from multiple networks. Like it always came from this direction, but suddenly it showed up from this trunk instead. That could look suspicious because other magic, and that's why I use the word magic is because I don't know, I don't, I just don't, I don't, I don't know. And we'll never know. Now if you, if you pass all of that, your name will get passed. And there's, there's two ways your name might get passed. It might either get passed from, from Libby, from caller ID name, or it will get passed from the analytics provider. If you did any kind of redress, they'll, they'll pass on the name from, uh, 
the redress. If instead you, you fail some of this or all of it, you'll get blocked as spam and you'll get tagged with one of those, those, uh, those tags from the other slide. So like I said, there's two ways the name's discovered. It can either be old-fashioned CM, set by your local provider, it can take days to propagate. It's not always displayed reliably or the same way, and, um, and sometimes it's hard to change. It's limited to 15 characters. Um, you could have your analytics remediated through companies like New Miracle or New Star also does it, or with all three of the main analytics providers. And if you do that, uh, it's, it's possible that these guys present your name instead of CM. But, and this is kind of what I was touching on yesterday, um, why are we so focused on phone numbers? Now, I know the answer to that question. Uh, and I know Mike would probably point the finger at me, right? It's because we have phone numbers today. That is the thing we have, right? And for the foreseeable future, well, at least today and tomorrow, I know, uh, we're going to continue to be using phone numbers, right? But like we as like an industry of like smart people stuff, like we need to be thinking about yeah, how do we do better, right? If someone were to come to your house and knock on your door, and they weren't wearing a uniform or showing you ID, you wouldn't answer the door and say, hey, give me your address. I want to know how to get back to you, right? That's effectively what a phone number is. It's an address. It's how to get back to somebody, right? It's not their identification. If someone knocks on your door, you're going to say, who are you? I want your identification. I don't want your address, OK? We are so focused on phone numbers. But what are phone numbers? It's a routing indicator. It's a way to route calls. It's an ephemeral resource. We assign them, we unassign them, we reassign them, we give them to somebody else, we hand them out like candy, right? It's a requirement of phones with limited buttons. I always think that this is funny when I think about this. It's like the original reason why we have to use phone numbers is because, I mean, we had buttons on phones, we had dials on phones, we think about step switches and all of that. It's, it's funny, I mean, we're, we are so far away from that technology now, but we're still so dependent on this. I will say numbers are convenient, but uh, I personally, I'd like a phone number to look more like an email address, but that's another discussion. And it's a requirement to be antiquated and signaling. Well, why do we use it as an indication of identity? So what does search hacking actually do to for us? Well, first of all, uh, if, you, if you're in the United States, it is a requirement. Uh, so it's something you have to do. It ensures message integrity with cryptographic signatures. Uh, and it has a pointer to a certificate to a verified identity, and that's really important. I'm going to come back to that in a second. And it gives the calling party a tiny check that most people don't even know to look for. Can you raise your hand if you know what tiny check I'm talking about? Okay, so for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, and I know this works on an iPhone, I don't know how it is on an Android, go into your recent call list, do this now, right? Go into your recent call list and scroll through it, and you'll see some of the numbers, particularly cell phone to cell phone, will have a little gray check. Maybe you've never noticed it, but it's there, okay? That specifically happens when a call is verified by an STIBS, okay? Um, what SurShaken really does for us is it tells us where to point the finger. Because there's a certificate to a verified entity, it gives us a place to point the finger. Now, this, this point here about ensuring message, message integrity with cryptographic signatures, uh, like one of the things that prevents happening is this is like a typical shaken password. It prevents anyone from messing with the contents of this. That doesn't happen. Nobody does that, right? Like our fraudsters are not at an intermediate service provider monkeying with the contents of passports. Like that, that doesn't happen. Okay, I understand it has to be in there to make sure that it's the same message all the way through, but um, the fact of the matter is it, it just it does not prevent spoofing. Stir shaken has nothing to do with spoofing. And you guys know this because you guys have probably used the stir shaken module. Raise your hand if you've used the stir shaken module. Okay, a few of you, right? One thing I can tell you is the way that it works is you point to a certificate, you, you say what attestation it is. And you can put whatever phone number you want in there, okay? So a lot of what's going on in the ecosystem is raise your right hand, solemnly swear you're not gonna do the wrong thing. That is not a technical solution. Right? We're basically assuming that everybody is going to raise their right hand and not have their hands, you know, their fingers crossed behind their back. They're going to do the right thing. So a lot of what's in stir shaken today is dependent upon good actors being good guys. Okay? I'm not worried about the good actors. I'm worried about the bad actors. Okay? And bad actors aren't just call originators. 
service providers too. I hope it's not any of you guys. I'm sure it's not you guys. Okay. Of course there's, not. There's bad actors, actor service providers out there as well that will sign anything with an A. You guys may have heard of something like that before. So I'll sign anything with an A. D don't do that. Okay. <laughs> So how does search engine not prevent spoofing? Kind of what I said here a second ago, anything can be put in this password, okay? Carriers should really, really have a good KYC process to stop playing whack-a-mole. You guys play whack-a-mole? I play whack-a-mole, I play whack-a-mole for a long time, right? I hate playing whack-a-mole. The, the way we stop playing whack-a-mole is know who that customer is, like really, really know who they are, okay? Uh, and, uh, and don't let them back on the network if you know that they're bad actors. Don't let them on the network to begin with if you know they're bad actors, okay? I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about KYC in a second. Phone numbers are mostly meaningless, so even if we do put phone numbers in here, like what is it that we're actually saying? Anyway, you know, carriers do have to put their certificate into the passport, so if you're doing this, you know who you are because we know where to point the finger, because that's what search shape does for us. Now, talking a little bit about tracing, um, before search engine, uh, this, you guys probably are familiar with doing something like this. Call went from service provider to service provider. Uh, if we want to find this bad actor here, uh, we could ask our service provider to trace it to their upstream provider. Um, and you know that, that's not where the bad traffic is coming from. So if we ask really nicely, we may be able to get them to go one more service provider back. But at this point, we're in a funny spot because this particular service provider is not either a service provider or a customer to the destination or the originator. So chances are we're not going to get a whole lot of movement on that. But with Stir Shaken, when we have the originating service provider putting their certificate on it, now the terminating service provider can point directly to the originating service provider. This gives us a place to point the finger and pull the plug on back bad traffic. Before it starts shaking, we could not pull the plug on anyone because we didn't know where the plug was. It was so far on the other side of the network. And enforcement is happening, and action will be swift. Now, um, who here knows about like what happened with Twilio and NV Realty? Okay, all right, this is a cease and... I, would, I don't have enough time to get into the full detail over, but I encourage you guys to take a look at it. This is a cease and desist letter that was served to Twilio in, Jan in January, okay? You guys know who Twilio is, right? Okay, all right, that's a lot of heads nodding here. I'm just gonna read the bottom line here. It says, failure to comply with the steps outlined in this letter may result in downstream voice service providers blocking all of Twilio's traffic permanently. They're a $10 billion company. That's like a pretty strongly worded letter there, right? Enforcement is happening, okay? It's really important you have got to identify your traffic or you're going to be identified, right? You've got to be participating in this ecosystem. And it would be better for enforcement to come to your door and for you to know your customers and say, I know this guy, that bad actor, I'm going to get rid of him like that, okay? The last thing you want is for your upstream provider to be saying that about you, right? So you've got to identify your traffic or you're going to be identified. KYC can help you avoid this very uh, situation. So the basics of KYC, identity. Who are you and can you prove it? Don't just tell me who you are. It's not just a contract with an ink signature. Prove to me who you are. And just because I know who you are does not mean that I trust you, right? Uh, identity and trust are different things. It's really important to understand that. What is it that you do and why can I trust that that's what you do? For service providers, there's a couple extra things that we should do. This is not an inclusive list, uh, a fully inclusive list. Uh, you should know about their stir shake and adoption status, and you should know what their entry is in the robocall mitigation database. There's also ongoing things that we have to do for KYC frameworks. For onboarding, we need to be uh, verifying and authenticating the information that we've collected from them. We need to do due diligence by conducting risk assessment. And we need to do continuous monitoring. We can't just do this once. Every time that they change their traffic patterns or every time they renew their contract, we need to uh, review and make sure that we've got all of the uh, most current information. Start shaking is good, but we can do better. Uh, we know where the calls ingress the network. And we have a point of authority, so now we can pull the plug. But what should the long-term solution be? Well, I like to think what, what I want, that, that example of somebody showing up at my door without identity, I want a guard booth, like at the front of the neighborhood, right? And when somebody who I don't want to talk to shows up at the guard booth without identity, they say, see ya, you can't come in, we don't want you here, 
right? That's, that's kind of how I want it, okay? But part of the problem that we have right now is there's no way to identify traffic from enterprises or bad actors right now. The only thing we're identifying is service providers, right? So we need a mechanism to identify enterprises. Who here knows, who here who is not TransNexus, knows what a delegate certificate is? Does anybody? Okay, I'd encourage you guys to take a look at the spec for delegate certificates. In my mind, it's broken, it's not very usable. Okay, this is a way where service providers can offer a certificate to an enterprise. Now you might be thinking, this sounds like a great idea, but two big problems with it is that service providers are allowed to offer these certificates and they don't have to have, okay. <laughs> they don't have to have um, a certificate policy statements. So in other words, they could just offer them to anyone. And the second part is, is that delegate certificates have to have phone numbers in them, cooked into the X509 certificate. Okay, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense because chances are your numbers are changing all the time for ephemeral resources. Now I know I'm out of time. Um, what I'm asking you guys to do, because you guys are so smart, and I really mean that, okay? Like I've never met such a smart group of people. Like telecom is hard stuff and it changes a lot, okay? Get involved, ask questions, okay? KYC, if you guys aren't doing full KYC or if you don't know if you're doing full KYC, we recently published model standards for KYC. We uh, 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 filed this with the FCC as an ex parte. Uh, you're welcome to download it. It has processes and procedures. It has forms you can fill out and adopt as your own. Okay, I'll give you a full process. Um, I've also included the link here for Steershake and Delegate Certificates. I wish I could get into this more. Um, they're broken, okay? And, uh, and I think we need to find ways where we can make a model like that work, okay? In addition, we have our Insights newsletter, which uh, you know we publish some industry insights, which may be interesting to you. And we have our Tuesday Talks podcast, which I'm not just saying you should listen to it, but I'm saying if you feel like you've got something to contribute, reach out to me and be on it, right? In addition to that, if you want your mind blown, I think we should start talking about distributed ledger technology for identity and, uh, and number identity as well. So this is something that we can use to keep track of like who has what numbers, who's allowed to use what numbers, and where can we store identity where everybody can use it. And lastly, there has been so much talk about like regulation at this particular conference. I knew you guys are, well, I hope you guys are interested in it. Um, if you really are interested, I would encourage the, SIP, the SIPNOC conference in September. Uh, there's a lot more detailed discussion about this kind of stuff at that particular conference, and I've provided a link to it. I think I'm out of time, so. You are. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Questions? Pick it up. Okay, let's get these guys here. We've got two questions. Number one. Uh, thank you. Um, Earlier you mentioned about the little check mark showing up in the stir sheet. It's valid. I noticed on uh, my test it's not really showing up. What's not showing up? The, the little check mark on the iPhone or Android. So do you not ever see any check marks? No. It doesn't even say potential span. It just says it just shows the name of the caller ID, but no check mark. Even though I'm citing so, my own calls. So uh, I just check and figure out what it is. So. Uh, if you have that number in your contact list, yes. you don't see the check. You need to click on the number and then you will see the green check. If you don't have that number in your contact list, the check with the green will be next to the number in your recent call list. No, I don't see that. Oh, okay. come, come, come see me after and I'll yeah. I'll, 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 I'll take it. Yeah, I'll the <laughs> no, on your mobile. Oh, right. I have the right to it. That's how it shows. Yeah, you. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you after. Yeah, I use a SIP P simulation. Well, that, uh, might, that might be why. We have one more question. Aaron, thank you for coming to me. Hi, Mark. That's community. Hi. Uh, you were talking about, I think, one of your companies, like I think yours, does remediation uh, for to resolve problems when they've been mislabeled or like a customer can do it themselves is there um so is the actual process that your company goes through to work with the the providers and such to remediate the problem very different from the way an individual might do it um That's except for that you have like time and resources and to actually do it it's it's a little bit of both but i will say that it does start with a contractual relationship between us and those entities. So we're not simply sitting there and filling out the same forms that you're doing. How would 
Yeah. Okay. How much is the how much of this is commercialization? Uh that's a great question because as it stands right now, like the individual carriers aren't terribly inclined to do anything if they can't monetize these individual solutions. But this is what I will say. Is that Akia. Uh, I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> What I will say is that we all have a problem, okay? And even the carriers have a problem. If we don't do, if we don't start adopting technology to fix these problems, you are going to continue to receive calls you don't want, and like your phone might be ringing in your pocket right now, and you're ignoring it because you know it's not something that you want. And it's not just you doing that. It's everybody in this room. It's everybody. It's everybody everywhere, right? We have a relevancy problem. So yeah, I think. Commercialization is definitely a problem. If there is a way that we can find a way to, to make this make money, we can get people to adopt it quicker. But on the other side of it, we have to realize that if we continue to allow bad actors on the network and we continue to erode trust in the PSDN, we're, we're just not going to be relevant anymore. Right? People are going to move to asynchronous communications and text message instead. They're already doing it. Right? So you could look at commercialization two ways. I mean, it's really about making money or saving money. We're going to start losing a lot of money if we don't you know, start restoring trust in the PSTN. Right. So, so if you think about it, they lock down email. Son of a bitch, I told you I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they lock down email. Yes. OK, let's give Brad a round of applause. <laughs> Brad, thank you. So we have a coffee break now, and that's sponsored by uh, Stippy Soft. Let's give them a round of applause. For <laughs>
Sit down, stop, Ladies and gentlemen, Please accept a round of applause. Darren Jenkins! Yeah! Hello. So, is this the end of WebRTC? So let's get started. I've got 98 slides to in 30 minutes. So I'm going to talk very quickly and uh, hopefully fit everything in. So I'm Dan Jenkins. Uh, I'm a WebRTC and real-time media geek. I'm Dan underscore Jenkins on the thing that no one uses anymore. Um, and I'm the founder of Nimblink and Everyclass Labs. And I also organize a conference called ComCon. Um, Everyclass Labs. Um, we've got a product called Broadcast Bridge, and we simplify bringing in remote collaborators into professional AV workflows. Um, and then Nimblake, we are a real-time uh, media consultancy based in the UK, doing a lot of WebRTC type stuff. Um, so on to the content. Is this the end of WebRTC? So an important reminder, I think, considering this is OpenSIPS, where we talk about signaling, not necessarily media. WebRTC is media, and so you can all leave now. Um, so SIP is signaling, right? Um, and WebSockets are not WebRTC. Um, so let's get back to about how um, WebRTC is ending. WebRTC is now 12 years old. It, uh, I think it came 20, 2011. Um, so it's, it's properly old now. And I mean, you'd think at 12 years old, it would be done. I mean, it's technically done. It's a, w, it's a W3C and it's an IETF specification, um, but it's definitely still not done. Um, the browser implementations are just completely and utterly incomplete. Um, however, that's for video. I'm doing a lot of complex type stuff. Not a lot of that incomplete stuff really matters too much when it comes to just doing, say, a VoIP audio call, right? Um, but Everyone keeps asking me about the shiny new thing that's on the horizon. Oh my word. I thought I'd get a couple of giggles. Nothing. <laughs> Media over Quick, um, or Mock. Um, so Quick is this new thing. Well, not, not really new thing. I'll come on to that in a minute. But we've got Media over Quick, we've got SIP over Quick, and we've got RTP over Quick. Quick is this thing that people keep asking me about, so that's why I put this talk in. So let's take a quick look at SIP. Uh, take a quick, sorry. That's UDP. Okay. It's encrypted by default. If any of you know about WebRTC, then like, this is kind of like, ah. Oh. Um, so it's encrypted by default. Um, the payload, also encrypted, um, is just a transport mechanism for via quick. Um, via this new this new way of sending things. The most important thing is it allows us all using UDP. Because of those unencrypted head protocol, um, and so in the browser that's the free, or the web transport and web, and web coder, uh, it's also a server to server <coughs> thing. Um, and obviously in a client to server outside of the browser you can just kind of just do it anyway. But yeah, like I said, this isn't meant to be a quick learner because learning quick isn't quick. Huh? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Luke Curley from Twitch has one of those learners. Um, I'm going to put all these slides up on mine afterwards so you don't need to try and get a picture of that URL. 
um, but over quick and what Twitch are doing around quick. It's really quite interesting. Go watch his talk about how quick really works. But is this the end of WebRTC? So what about WebRTC? Well, we know WebRTC um, carries media, it also carries data, um, but it's also UDP. And it also transports RTP, and it's also encrypted. But that's where the similarities really end, with Quick and WebRTC. So WebRTC is a media and data, and data transport, um, typically from a client to a server, but primarily it was designed for two clients to really talk to each other behind two different NATs, right? It, that's what it was designed for. And now we're just using it for mostly sending media from a client up to a server, whether or not that server is, say, asterisk or free switch or an SFU. Um, we're generally not doing a lot of peer-to-peer -peer behind that transport. The really cool thing about um, WebRTC is that it has mandatory codecs. And this means that whenever you're using WebRTC, you can rely on Opus being available, which is a really great thing. So it works in every browser. Every single device that's in your pocket or on, your, on the table in front of you supports WebRTC. Whether or not you installed anything, whether or not you installed a native app, it, it supports it. And that's because the default browser, we now, like, I mean, I mean if you've still got like, you know, a 10 year old iPhone, then that doesn't support WebRTC. Everyone in this room, you could open up a web browser, you could go to a URL, WebRTC today, and that's a fact that does not equate to, say, web transport. But that's also the problem with WebRTC. It works. What's wrong with WebRTC? Let's concentrate on client server, the browsers. Browser limitations. Um, it isn't just a WebRTC issue but I'm kind of piling it onto WebRTC today. It's a web issue. Restrictions make developing um, WebRTC applications like a soft phone in the browser almost like you can't do it. Even if you were to build a progressive web app or a trusted web app and put it onto the phone as a app, you're still gonna lack um, an integrated toolkit. You can't do that with a web app. Partially implemented, funny and utterly half-baked um, let's go and like chuck out this version and then it never gets updated. A new um, to, to implement and then just random new features that part magically. Like recently we got um, AV1 simulcast um, and just appeared in Chrome. No one asked for it, but it just appeared. Um, so unless Microsoft or Google want them, new features take forever. Which basically means unless you're building a really simple click to call app you're building a native app, right? You're not building in the web, you're building a native app. At which point, what is the benefit of WebRTC over building something with Quick, right? So let's take a look at Quick RTC. This is all meaningless. So I wanted to give you a really great kind of talk around Quick. And to be perfectly honest, I knew enough about Quick, but I'd never actually like gone and built something with Quick and looked properly in depth at RFCs. So, as part of my prep for this talk, what did I go and do? I went and built some little things with Quick, and I went and tried to read RFC. So, I have an RTP over Quick draft. So, Quick is a standard now, built off of a standard. So, we've got RTP over Quick, and it's a draft in the IETF. Who? I mean, ITF isn't like be all and end all, right? But ultimately, we don't want to build stuff unless we know that it's, it's going to go somewhere, right? And the ITF is a really good kind of mechanism to, to, to see whether or not that's, that's whether or not that's the case. So um, <coughs> RTP over quick is a draft. That's great. SIP over quick is an expired draft. So we might be able to send. Uh, so like we, we'd never actually go and implement SIP over quick into open SIP, right? Because it's now an expired draft. No one's going to look after it. So why would you go and you know implement this non-standard thing? How do you set up media in SIP? It's a question. 
Someone shout it out. SDP. SDP, exactly. So what do we need to be able to set up our media in in uh, quick uh, in SIP over quick, or even just SIP generally? Right? <coughs> even let's say we just sent a normal SIP over UDP or TCP. How do we send our media over quick? Well, we need something called um, RTP over over quick in in SDP, um, and it exists. This is great, and this is the URL to go and go and take a look at it. And this this is um, this is the draft on on the IETF, um, and oh, you can't really see. Oh, God, oh, no, no, damn it. Um, it's expired as well. So no one's looking after it. Um, yeah. Oh, the lights have gone down. Hold on. Show the movie again. Show the movie show, again. Show the movie yeah, again. yeah. No, the card. Uh, <laughs> Simba. Um, anyway, yes, it's expired as well. Um, so, yeah, we're now left with um, WebRTC or um, or SRTP to encrypt our video. Um, because who's going to go and implement something that you know is expired and doesn't necessarily have support? I mean, you're all protecting your media when it goes on the public internet. I'm looking at all of you. you. How many how many people in the room encrypt their media when they send it over the public internet? I count. I count three. One. <laughs> <laughs> Four. Some of them. Some of them. Yeah. Yeah, some of them. None of them. <laughs> we should all be encrypting our media, right? Because we, we, we want to protect the privacy of our users. Um, and if that requires us to, you know, um, scale up a little bit to be able to handle that encryption and decryption, um, and to be able to still get our the same calls per second. Um, that's a worthwhile course. I'm looking at So yeah, WebRTC is probably winning. Um, is this the end of WebRTC? I'm going to have 82. I'm only 12 minutes in. I'm going to have loads of time for questions. Um, so yeah, is this the end of WebRTC? In short, no, not at all. I really wanted to come to the end of my journey investigating um, RTP over quick, SIP over quick and go, this is really interesting, and I can see, and I can see this going kind of forward. Um, gives us all a different different option to be able to do something slightly differently in whatever scenario, right? <laughs> WebRTC is 12 years old, like I said, and it's used absolutely everywhere. Quick is 11 years old, and it's barely used anywhere other than for HTTP 3. This isn't necessarily a bad thing about quick. HTTP 1/1.1/2 is TCP, and HTTP 3 is UDP. There is real gain to be had there, right? And that is why HTTP 3 is making real waves, um, and it has real benefits because you're removing TCP, you're moving to UDP, and you're you're moving where we do TLS um, handshakes and things. So there's a real win for HTTP 3. Will quick change how we transport media? And I really expected this answer to be yes. And the answer is I'm really not sure. So for today, WebRTC remains strong. SRTP remains strong as well um, for, <coughs> for server to server. So I wanted to end with long live WebRTC, um, and thank you very much. Um, ComCon, like I said, ComCon is happening 19th to the 23rd of June, so only three weeks away um, over in the UK. It's a residential conference um, surrounding open media. Um, got two tracks over three days, and it's just crammed full of fantastic chances to network. And it's one thousand two hundred pounds all in. No having to pay thirty dollars for breakfast. Um, 
it's all in, and I'm even giving you 20, uh, 10% off with that code there. Um, if you want to talk about Compound, you can come talk to me about it afterwards. That's not why I'm here, but I wanted to tell everyone about it. So that's me. Thank you very much. We're hiring, um, and if you're interested um, in doing stuff with real-time media, with WebRTC, with other other forms of media, um, then let me know. Um, and that's me. Thank you very much. You need to get through 98 slides in 15 minutes. Yeah, each one of your slides was one world. And that, that's, that's the best kind of slide, right? I like, I like the best. So, questions for them? They can be about quick, they can be about WebRTC, they can be about anything you want. If, if WebRTC is, is on the way out, it's not. Why not give the radio a go? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I heard rumours that there's a draft around ham radio over over the WebRTC data channel. Um, and um, no. Um, it's really tough. Like, uh, I mean, the media are putting in the eyes, yeah. I've been arguing over the last <laughs> several years and not really getting anything done. What now we're going to do? First question is the Welcome, David Fett, the nerds dedicated to avoid suboptimal presentations. Wow. Thank you, That's great. Okay, yeah, so welcome a lot. Thank you for uh, being here. Uh, this is an opportunity that I wanted to take to help nerds because my firm belief is that sadly, Sometimes nerds don't make the best job of their presentations. So I'm not talking about in a room like this, because this is kind of geek to geek. I'm talking about when we get out into the wide world and we have to talk to people that are perhaps a little bit less technical. And so this presentation, the Nerds Navigator to Avoiding Suboptimal Presentations, is all about that. And why have I chosen to do this? It's because 
I love geeks. My heart is with the geeks. And having worked in a lot of telecom companies over many, many years, I came to the conclusion that although the geeks were not abused in any way, you know, they got their corner of the office, maybe with the curtains or the drapes closed a little bit and the lights a little bit lower, maybe they weren't talking to each other very much. Maybe they even got pizza on a Friday, but around the corner in the office were the sales guys. You know the kind. Now, of course, I know that Ron Burgundy is not a salesman. Uh, he's an anchor man. But, you know, I'm just using this for illustrative purposes. The thing is, these guys, the sales guys, are getting sent to Florida on golfing holidays when they hit their targets. They've got fully expensive BMW X5s. In other words, they seem to be getting a lot more than the geeks. Even though it's the geeks that build the technology, that support the technology, that maintain the technology. And what I didn't want to do was I didn't want to take anything away from the sales guys because that is a great skill in and of itself. But what I did want is to do more for the geeks. I wanted geeks to be able to do more, to be more, to have more. And my theory was if that I could help geeks communicate more of their value to the outside world, then that would allow them to achieve more success. Whatever their definition of that emotive word success might be. And so over the years, I've been delivering training uh, from teaching people the asterisk dial plan and various things like that. And back in the days of T1s and E1s, teaching people to hook up to telephony and stuff like that. I've also been working on presentation skills training for a long time as well. And I thought that I could help because over those years, I've been around the world and I've given and seen a lot of presentations. And so that's the reason for wanting to do a session like this, which brings me on to the agenda. The agenda is this. I thought it's going to be good to identify the problem in the first place. Then, and that problem, of course, is the geek communication skills. As I mentioned, not geek to geek, because we're fine in a room like this, but when we're talking to less technical people. Then the trouble that arises from that problem and it's really one of lost opportunities. It could be as straightforward as losing a job because you don't communicate your value well enough during the interview. It could be losing a promotion. It could be losing funding for your company or your project. It's just lost opportunities. And then the last thing to talk about is how we, salute, how we solve that problem, how we can massively improve geek speaking. So that's the agenda. How does that sound? Would that be all right for the next few minutes? Good, okay. I, I do like to encourage participation, so I've brought some English chocolate with me to uh, reward participation. So let's jump in. But before we carry on, I do have an educational video. This is where I need Nitsan or Slow Me with the microphone. Where are they when you need them? Slow Me, Nitsan. Where have the guys gone with the mic? Oh, yeah. You can probably get down to the. Ah, okay. <laughs> So this is just a bit of a get to know you kind of thing. Okay, you've perhaps seen this video. I don't know whether you have or not. If you have already seen it, you're going to love it. And if you've never seen it before, you're going to love it even more. Here we go. Uh, I'm an anchor. I'm not a geek. I'm a nerd. What's the difference? You probably ask what's the difference. I actually uh, have a, a Venn diagram to show you the difference. <laughs> It's extreme things, three things to be in earth. If you start so tolerant of things, that's all kinds of things, all very expensive. Go down. Geeks, on the other hand, they're not the hardest part of stuff. They're like the comic books, comic book geeks, Star Trek geeks, they can dress them up, they can cosplay, they can think about the intermediate thunder, so we stay at home and don't do anything. The tech city can't help us out of this. Now, if you're smart, you can say, oh, uh, you're ready. <laughs> We were just enjoying it as well. Uh, no. 
Well, that will help the waste again. Excuse me, excuse me. Now my PowerPoint crashed, that's what happened. Oh, I will show you why. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I now they need me to open the windows because I have like company yes. accounts. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Don't excuse me. Talk amongst yourselves about nerds and geeks and things like that. Or is something jumping? Yep, there's something at the bottom. Something yeah. bottom jumping. How do I find that? <laughs> I said uh, That's it, like. It's all seems it pops up. It's a dog. I don't know. Just Yeah. Spear. Yeah. Feeling a little bit lost there. <laughs> Go to the recent files. Looks like it, but yeah. Okay, we can't see that video again for a minute. Uh, I'm a nerd. I'm not a geek. I'm a nerd. What's the difference? Probably is what's the difference. Actually, I have a, a Venn diagram to show you the difference. So. Microsoft. Yeah, what do you get when you use Microsoft? <laughs> it's a Microsoft issue. It's gone again. Can you see PowerPoint disappeared from there? Yeah, it's just crashing. Yeah, I reckon that. You can just open it on YouTube directly. Probably. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. 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 Ye
but it's it's had that kind of physical effect on people, the butter clenching the core. Up at the up at the excellent end, we've got SOG, which is standing ovation great. That's a presentation that's so good that at the end of it you can't wait to do whatever the person is telling you in the presentation, whether it's rush out and buy something or change your behaviour or whatever it might be, that's standing ovation great. But here's here's part of the problem. Part of the problem is that in that low half, right near the buttock clenchingly poor, not always, but right near it, that area is disproportionately represented by geeks. Geeks are sadly responsible for more of that lower half of the presentations than many other people. And so one might ask, why is this a problem? Well, the first thing I want to say is geek to geek is not a problem. In a room like this, it doesn't matter. Because geek to geek, we can do anything. You know, when anybody comes and stands here and does their presentation, then it's automatically accepted because, you know, if Max does a presentation, you know he's a city soft guy. And if Bob Dan does a presentation, or if you, there's, an, there's an inordinate amount of credibility in the room. So it's not a problem. However, when we get out into the real world, one often finds that the decision makers or the people that are holding the purse strings are not so technical. So that could be the person awarding the promotion or the person awarding the job. It could be uh, a number of different uh, things or the person giving the funding for your next project or, or your, your next endeavour. So we need to cater for speaking to those people because while being a geek is very important and knowing your stuff is very important. Sadly, when we're out there in the real world, knowing your stuff is not enough. It's the ability to communicate what you know with power, with passion, with confidence, with clarity that's oh so important. So, what trouble does that cause? Well, the big one is that geeks miss out. They miss out on the next job. They miss out on the promotion. They're, they're, perhaps their company misses out on the sale of the equipment or the service or maybe even the project somehow misses out. And so that's why I'm on this one-man mission to solve the problem of geek communication. So please remember this, that the better you communicate, the more you generate. And when I say that, what I mean is you generate more of whatever it is your objective is, whether it's uh, awareness of your strengths, whether it's awareness of your product or service, whether it's sales, the more you communicate, or the better you communicate, the more you're going to generate in sales. Okay, so now in order to address this, I've come up with seven power presenting protocols that any geek can use and immediately make a difference to their presentations. The first one is considering the purpose of any presentation. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail of each of these in a moment. The next one is planning the presentation for maximum effect. The next one is the preferences, identifying that we as presenters probably have our own preferred learning style, but not to push that on our audience, because our audience may have a different learning style, as an example. <coughs> then there's practicing the presentation, and you won't believe this, but I've actually practiced this presentation three times in a row, and the video never crashed. But there was no HDMI thing plugged in, or whatever. Okay. Then we've got participation. Um, what do you think I mean by participation? People. Yes, sir. Asking questions. Asking questions. You're quite right, Brett. Uh, Brett. And uh, there's a little chocolatey prize for, um, for participating like that. Yes, we'll be talking about participation in a moment. Then there's performance, the actual art of getting up in front of people and making an impression. And lastly, post-event, what do you do after the event has happened? Okay, so the purpose. Here's, here's the tragedy that happens in the geek world. Your boss asks you to do a presentation, or somebody else asks you to do a presentation, and instead of sitting back and really thinking about the presentation, your mind turns to your slide deck. And you think, oh yeah, I've got that slide deck. If I just kind of clip out a couple and move a couple around and shuffle with, everything will be fine. Whereas really what we need to do is take a step right back. In fact, slides are the very last, literally the last thing we should think about. So we need to take a step right back and consider the overall purpose of the presentation. Not just the actual presentation, so the presentation might be to familiarise people with our new software product, but the company level, the wider, in the Kirkpatrick model by using training, the behavioural changes that we're looking for in the organisation. And so the, the micro level might be to familiarise people with a new product or project, but the wider one might be to receive less support calls 
for our stuff in general, as an example. So we need to think about the purpose, and the purpose happens on many levels. And what I would suggest is in order to clarify the purpose of a presentation, we write it down. Not in a weighty document, this can be a couple of paragraphs in an email. The important thing is that you articulate what it's going to be, and then you use it as an agreement between you, the speaker, the person who asked you to do it, the conference organiser, or your boss, or whoever, and then the audience. And then you just circulate it round until everybody is happy. It's an iterative process, and within a few short, even minutes, you could end up with something that everybody is happy with, and so when you get to your audience, you know you've got a spot-on presentation. But I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are thinking, hang on a minute, maybe there are circumstances, just like a conference like this, where you can't know who your audience are going to be until you get there. Exactly. And so if that's the um, situation, then what you need to do is agree it with the sponsor, in this case the conference organiser, and then the very first thing you do when you meet your audience is ask them if they're happy with it. Do you remember just a few minutes ago I said, <coughs> in our agenda, how does that sound? And there was actually even a little round of applause. It wasn't just people nodding their heads. And so you get your audience to buy in. So that is what I might call the learning contract or the outcome agreement. So that's the purpose. Then there's the plan of the presentation. Now, if you ever look at the human attention span, you come to understand that at the beginning of any experience, the attention span is up, it's high. Over the duration of whatever it is, like a conference speech, it goes down, and then it peaks back up right near the end. So the beginning and the ending are your prime time. For instance, you might know that in TV ads, the first ad and the last ad in uh, an ad break are the more expensive ones because advertisers understand that it's the first and the last. And so we have to use uh, this prime time to get our key message across. And as the audience attention span can wane, we can use tools and techniques to raise it up in the middle. And you can see that I've got overemphasis, outstanding things, familiarity. No uh, time to dive into them right now, but the key thing is that you create a map of your presentation so you know roughly what you're going to be using the first 10% of your presentation for, the, the middle part, the end part, and so you come up with a plan to take advantage of people's attention spans and to lock the right things into their memory. That's the plan. Then there's preferences. You see, we all have different preferences. I would say sweeping generalisation. In fact, let's go for a show of hands here and I'll randomly throw out some chocolate during the show of hands. But when, when I'll, I'll make sure you get one, Norm. When you get a brand new thing, let's say a coffee machine, you get a brand new coffee machine, how many people are going to read the instruction manual first before they do anything else? That's fine, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. All I'm doing is highlighting the fact that there are differences, okay? So some people are going to are going to read the instruction manual. How many people are going to rip it out and just play with it? Oh, and that's what you would expect in an audience like this, isn't it? <laughs> but the reason I'm making this point is imagine if you were going to deliver a presentation that had some technical people in the audience, but also had a bunch of HR professionals. There'd be some different learning styles. And so the point I'm making is to acknowledge that and to work with it. And re really to walk in your audience's shoes, which reminds me of some very important advice from Jack Handy at Saturday Night Live. And he said, um, if you're going to criticise somebody, you should walk a mile in their shoes first. Because then, when you do criticise them, you'll be a mile away and have their shoes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very wise advice. Okay, so we need to consider preferences. And I say I've automatically advanced my side there. Yeah, we need to consider preferences and just be sure that we don't impose our way of doing things onto our audience. The next is practice. Very, very important to practice your presentation. So let me give you the geek version of practice. The geek version of practice is you flip open your laptop, you go through your slides, you go, yeah, when I get to that slide, I'll say this. And when I get to that slide, I'd better remember to make sure that I say that. That, my friends, is better than nothing, but it's not practice. <laughs> what you really want to be doing, the what of the practice, is to practice the whole thing, but even with throwing chocolate, even with throwing a little bit of chocolate, I'm going to give you a bit of chocolate for mentioning throwing chocolate. It's kind of a meta kind of thing going on there. Um, yeah, you have to pick that one up later. 
given what i was saying about the beginning of your presentation and the end of your presentation being more important than the rest then wouldn't it also make sense to practice the beginning and the ending even more because those are your prime time and also with the beginning that might be when you're feeling a little bit more nervous. So the more you can practice, the more you can be on autopilot, the better that's gonna be. So the what is your whole presentation, particularly the beginning and the ending. The when, do it as soon as you can. As soon as you've got some kind of skeletal framework for your presentation, as soon as you can, can bring yourself to do that. And the how is what we've said, it's gotta be out loud, ideally to colleagues who have got your best interests at heart and can give you holistic feedback. But if you can't find value colleagues, what about your family and friends that want the best for you? You can practice your presentation to them. And if you can't find them, then your phone or your laptop have got voice and video recorders in, and you can go ahead and practice to them. Who can tell me, for a little bar of chocolate, what is the advantage of practicing out loud? Just tell me an advantage. Yes, Brandon. Because you can feel that physical. Yes, and you said confidence, sir. so one for you, sorry, not very good at throwing. Try this one for Brandon. More practice of throwing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do that in my hotel room. I didn't stand there and get through chocolate. Out. So, yeah. One of the great advantages of practicing is you'll know the duration of your presentation, right? So if you're in a multi-speaker conference, you can fit inside your slot. The other thing is, inside your head, words and phrases sound fine. And then when you start practicing them out loud, you realize that you stumble over some of them. And so by practicing out loud, you can avoid that. So it's well, well worth practicing out loud. Okay, then we've got participation. Now participation is absolutely crucial to any presentation. Because otherwise, people tend to feel they're having something done to them rather than done with them. Who can, I mean, I've got pictures there of people putting their hands up, you know, for a show of hands or a question. But who can tell me some other mode of participation in a conference speech or, or any kind of training? Yes? Question. Sorry? Yeah, absolutely. You've just given them an example of it. It's not a show of hands. Yes, no. Asking for ChatGPT questions. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> yeah, well, that's another way of participation. Yeah, so there's lots of different modes. Let me give you a couple of others. How about involving people in your demos? How about asking for people to, step, to share their stories and share their experiences? There's no end of different ways that we can put participation into our talks, our training, our presentations. And here's the reason we do it, because involvement equals commitment. The more involved people are in the experience, the more committed they're going to be to the outcome. And so it's crucial that you build participation into your presentation. Okay, and then there's performance. Now performance is just all about avoiding this, the yawn fest, where everybody's kind of sitting back and they're a little bit sleepy and not necessarily fully engaged. And what we want to do is we want to get to this. There is a room full of very, very engaged people, standing room only. That was a talk I did in um, Dusseldorf in Germany at the, the Lean Dust gathering. And really, it's all about attitude, isn't it? It's all about getting out there and uh, getting people uh, going. We can do that using our voice, using our body, using our posture. Uh, the main thing is, is to modulate your voice, to use pitch, pace, and pauses within your voice to keep people interested. And again, there's no end of depth we could go into about performance, but that will suffice for now. And then there's the post event, and this one, is very, very often forgotten about, and yet it's so important. What I really don't like is the drive-by presentation. The drive-by presentation is when there's no consultation about it at all. The guy just comes in, drops in, does his presentation, and shoots off very quickly without any buy or leave, without any further ado. And what we need to do is get rid of the drive-by presentation by making sure that there is proper consultation ahead of the presentation, and do you remember that agreement that I talked about? Well, if we had that agreement in place with the sponsor, with the audience, then we've got the perfect thing to go back to after the presentation. 
to make sure that the objectives of the presentation in its micro level, teaching people about the new product has been achieved, but also we can talk to the sponsor to make sure that they really are getting less tech support calls or whatever the example might be. And so to coin a phrase used by Stephen Covey in the seven habits of highly effective people, we're beginning with the end in mind. If we begin by having that agreement in place, we're looking at the ending, then we can come back to it. So those are the seven power presenting protocols. Did you notice that they handily all began with a P? Very useful indeed. Okay, now has anybody ever seen this kind of thing? Not this exact picture. Show of hands, how many people have had this kind of problem? Yes, indeed, we, we've all experienced this. And what does it indicate? But where are we talking? Who said that? Just over there. Buffering. Well, yeah, it says buffering now. I should really have given you a bit of chocolate for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Wi-Fi Wi at the conference. Could, could be the wife, could be the conference Wi-Fi. <laughs> Fortunately, I've got another bag of chocolate here, just in case I ran out of the first one. Yeah. Yes, it could be the conference Wi-Fi. It could be the underlying network. It could be the internet. It could be even the infrastructure at the data center at the other end that's serving the video. What we do know is that we've got a problem of some kind. And here's what I'm going to submit to you. We're getting near the end of the presentation. I just want you to focus on this, that your connectivity with your audience, the bandwidth that you have with your audience, the quality of the connection is nothing other than your rapport with them. And so you've got to work hard at establishing maintaining and growing a rapport with your audience because that's the way that your information is going to get to them but even more importantly that their feedback is going to come to you whether it's body language facial expressions whatever it might be and when we look at those seven power presenting protocols very carefully we find that when they're arranged in a certain way and you look down the middle of them we find that rapport has been woven through every single one of them to make sure that we really do connect with our audience. Well, look, I'm going to finish, but before I finish, I don't know what the time is. I've lost track of it because of all that mumbo jumbo at the beginning. We've got about two minutes. Got about two minutes. We've got ch a chance for one or two questions. Well, you got more than that. I thought you got that's still more presentation. So you've I, got, I, I've got about two I, slides left after this. Oh, that's uh, awesome. You've got a total of five minutes. A total of five minutes. Okay, so has anybody got any questions on the art of presenting? Go for you first, Daniel. Oh, you want a mic? Uh, oh yeah, uh, there we go. Can you give me another yeah. chocolate? Okay. Oh, it's a chocolate related question, is it? You know, I saw this on the Big Bang Theory. Wait, it's called it? Positive Reinforcement. <laughs> <laughs> it was Daniel for that question, and, and then Mike, Jersey Mike. Neil. So I've got a mic and a chocolate, which is great. Um, has anyone ever visited Toastmasters? Yeah. Yeah? So Toastmasters is a great system. It gives you a place to practice where you're away from your colleagues and your, your boss. And instead of like practicing with your dog or cat at home and whatever, you can go to a Toastmasters meeting. And it, it's just a great way to practice and get new skills and also be exposed to other people who are trying to improve their skills. Uh, it's like going to the gym. It's, if you, do this regularly, like every couple of weeks, and after a few months, it just becomes more natural um, without deliberately having to plan for a specific event or conference. That, that is valuable, and it's going to give you help on your style, but not necessarily the content, of course, because you're not delivering to sort of people that know the thing. And I would add to that, I'm, I'm, I'm not dismissing it at all, I think it's very valuable, but if you can do it in front of your colleagues, even though it's embarrassing to do, it will pay dividends. Okay. On the content, I think the people here have great content. You don't need to worry too much about content in, in a group like this. It just, it's just, it's a great opportunity. If anyone wants to know more about Toastmasters, feel free. Let, and let's go to Mike there, at the back. Is this a chocolate related question, Mike? No, it's not. It's not a real question. I forgot my question. You were just coming to the end of that previous chocolate bar and you wanted another You already one. start drinking back there? <laughs> For those people in the UK, in addition to Toastmasters, there's another one called PSA, the Public Speakers Association, which is also worthwhile. We've got one there with Michael. Yeah, it's more of an observation or comment. I don't know. Have you ever seen a TED Talk by Simon Sinek called the Gold Star? 
No, I think start with why. Why? Yeah, that's that. Yeah. Why, how, what? Yes. About how most people communicate. I think engineers are notorious for this. You start with what you have, right? And he goes through. I'm not going to put the whole thing, but I encourage everybody to look at it. It's about 15 about, minutes. It's very good. Yeah, it's, but it's, you know, we have a car. It's got wheels. You should buy our car. And uh, versus people buy why you do things, not what you do. Everybody can make a car. But it's like, I'll give the example of Apple. It's their computer company, just like everybody else. But like, why do people buy from them? Why do they buy so many different products from them? It's because the way Apple communicates, everything we do, we challenge the status quo. That's why. Yes. It's the way we challenge the status quo is by making our products simple to use, easy to operate, and beautiful, right? He is the Simon Sinek of the Open Six Way. Right, probably the whole thing. But yeah, but well, yeah, a yeah. lot of this aligns. And, and, and here's something that compounds our problem. And that is if you're working with a sales guy, and the sales guy's got the appointment and he's moving the customer forward, when he involves you, it's like the night before. And he says, oh, can you come and do it, you know, like 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or half an hour in this sales meeting that I've already organized and I didn't tell you about? He doesn't give you a proper briefing, and so you go in, and because you've not been briefed properly, you tend to talk about the stuff you know, which is the technical stuff, and not necessarily solving the customer problem. So part of this is a briefing issue as well, but you're bang on with the wine. Any other things before we finish off? God, we've got a few up there. Let's deal with those three, and then we'd better move on. So we'll go with, uh, is it Sean there? Yep. Just more of a statement, we're in, we're in the States, say no to drive fires. <laughs> For sure. Uh, secondly, um, just to what you were saying, it's okay when the sales guy wants you to come into the sales meeting unprepared, but it's even worse when they want you to go to a customer we, who, in whom you're actually you know, applying to a vendor for a bid. And right. they say, by the way, can you come in here and talk to their tech guys? What am I talking about? Yeah, exactly. Use <laughs> the context. So, yeah, yeah. yeah that's like a briefing. I expect to back here behind you and we'll pay this for uh, there was a point on performance. Uh, uh, performance. Yeah, yes. how will you improve that? Okay. Well, there's lots of different ways. One of them is, of course, to deal with nerves. How many people have a few nerves uh, about speaking in public? Okay, keep your hands up if some of those nerves come from a feeling of being ill prepared. That's interesting, isn't it? That's interesting. So my theory is this, that while there is a genuine fear of speaking in front of people, most of it comes from other things underlying it that masquerade as a fear of speaking in public. Could be the fear of being unprepared, could be the fear of trying to be someone you're not, because you might have seen your favourite speakers think, oh, I need to be like really out there or whatever, when actually the best thing you can do in a presentation is to be you. The absolute best thing. I'll give you a very, very quick example before I finish. And that is many years ago, I was teaching presentation skills in a telecoms company, and one of the guys in the in the uh, class was the facilities manager. You know, he looked after the buildings, and he was a very straight kind of guy in terms of his uh, uh, outlook. He wasn't particularly charismatic, but we worked with him, and he started a presentation like this. He sat on the edge of a desk and said, "Okay." How many people would like the afternoon off? And everybody put their hand up, he went, in hospital. <laughs> because that's where you're gonna be if you don't listen to my 30 minute talk all about the safety of the facilities. So, you know, being yourself is the key. Listen, I need to finish off, so let me just jump onto this very quickly. The main points we remember are the problem of geeks not communicating as well as they need to. And the thing is, nobody shows them how to do it. They go on courses about how to write in Rust, they go on courses about how to do different software development methodologies, but nobody sends them on the training to help them with their presentation skills. And even worse, if they do send them, they send them on a very generic one, some fluffy soft skill stuff, and not something delivered by a real engineer that's going to help them. Then there's the trouble that arises, and frankly it's opportunities that are lost. And so we need to avoid those. And of course, the secret is by working on your presentations to massively improve your geek speaking abilities. So remember, the better you communicate, the more you're going to generate 
Listen, it's been a pleasure talking to you about geek speaking. It's been an absolute pleasure to go through those seven power presenting protocols. But here's the most important thing. It will be the pleasure that you get when you implement them and thus receive the rewards of being a geek that can speak. Thank you. We have the first three people. No, no. I was just saying we had a party. Party. It's not going to do it. <laughs> 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 huh? No, no, no. So we're having our first telecommuter uh, of the event. Giovanni Mazzarelli is going to be uh, talking to us about. Uh, 4G and 5G, the multi ecosystem and efforts that are being made on this on this front. Look at this beautiful face. Hello! Can you see us? Can you see us? <laughs> we still can't hear. Giovanni, say something. Okay, we just can't hear you, but we know you're talking. How are you both talking up there? So uh, you can see, yeah. you can see the screen that uh, we can see this uh, some uh, remembering about uh, last year, and uh, so the presentation would be uh, like, uh, let's say where we were last year in, uh, in Athens, and uh, let's see where we are now. So. Uh, let's start from Athens, uh, and uh, please, uh, can you confirm uh, that uh, all is working uh, and screen sharing uh, and we Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. And, uh, cool. And, uh, yesterday here in Athens, uh, the title of the, my presentation was uh, Open Sips and IMS. Uh, uh, voice over LTE application server. So with uh, all the uh, complexity that uh, was involved. And uh, that, uh, that was the agenda. So uh, it was uh, uh, targeted to us, so people that had already uh, voice over IP services uh, and that uh, want to uh, enter the market uh, and for uh, future proof uh, uh, their company and their products. So, um, deliver their uh, products and uh, real time communication over uh, LTE and all the future networks. And where we are now, <laughs> we're like uh, uh, so far from uh, last year. And in uh, 2023, uh, we have uh, OpenSIPS uh, as uh, IMS core into um, a community airport uh, that uh, we, we told uh, to uh, name uh, Open IMS, uh, so uh, Open Source IMS. And uh, we see that uh, all the lessons that uh, was learned uh, since last year, uh, we're trying uh, to uh, reverse and uh, uh, to use them uh, to uh, build uh, open IMSs. Mm -hmm. 
I want to, uh, first of all, uh, to, to, uh, to let uh, you know that uh, the, the, uh, it is in this moment the uh, main sponsor uh, that makes uh, uh, open IMS is uh, uh, Voice Center. And, uh, but uh, as you know, and he is also a sponsor of uh, uh, this, uh, this year uh, summit. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, the Voice uh, Center is very uh, friend of uh, open source uh, tentacles. But uh, too long, don't rant. I know what you're waiting for. So, yeah, let's start with uh, some, sexy, some yeah. porn. <laughs> and uh, tell me you can see. That, uh, we have uh, an invite that is coming uh, uh, from um, uh, OnePlus uh, uh, cell phone in uh, LT. And uh, he's arriving from uh, uh, number, then it goes to the uh, proxy SLCF, uh, then to the serving SLCF, and then it goes where? Uh, and this is uh, open SIPs as uh, uh, SNCF. And uh, then it goes uh, to an application server that uh, will get, get back uh, an uh, eco, uh, eco uh, service. And uh, that application server, in this case, uh, is uh, an asterisk that uh, we've got just uh, to use the. Uh, AMR uh, wideband uh, codec uh, for the eco. So uh, we just saw uh, that, that it actually works, uh, and uh, then back to don't read. So now the rest of all the slides. And uh, that's mine. Okay. And uh, what is uh, 4G, 5G? And uh, what the, the first slides uh, are very similar, the same, uh, like uh, uh, yesteryear, and that's because uh, I want to give a uh, um, brief introduction, and I will go very fast. And then we will see that, that there is a change of background, and there is the new stuff. So uh, 4G, 5G, LTE uh, is just a network. Uh, so you can think that it's uh, uh, like a Wi-Fi, like Ethernet, uh, it's something that you can see It has nothing to do with voice, with video, with nothing. Uh, it's just a network, all that is running on it is applications. And uh, uh, 4G, 5G uh, can exist and do exist and uh, mostly are used uh, without any kind of uh, uh, real time communication, voice communication. Here's a data network. With uh, uh, the important the, the things about the uh, 4G, 5G, etc., radio, uh, is that it's uh, uh, very fast uh, with very low delay. And uh, you can uh, um, manage uh, the quality of service and the reliability of the delivery and the services uh, in a very fine way. Uh, and this has a lot of implication then for in our cases. Uh, what is the difference uh, between IMS uh, and C? IMS is a voice. Uh, let's say, application or the video application, the real-time communication application that is running on top of the uh, uh, 4G by uh, open rate. And uh, uh, this is important because uh, IMS uh, is the uh, standard toward which uh, they are already converged all kind of carriers. So, fixed carriers, mobile carriers, uh, and the above, whatever, and any kind of carrier use IMS. So, uh, the, uh, the differences uh, from, uh, let's say, uh, the traditional SIP, the SIP that we were uh, used to, uh, is that uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, more headers, uh, 
uh, very complex uh, media, data uh, service, uh, resource booking, uh, etc. Uh, that that because it's a community. And uh, I think uh, so encryption uh, at the level of transport uh, is uh, everywhere. Uh, inside of the NMO uh, or the carrier uh, can break out the uh, uh, application servers. Uh, very often, uh, uh, the uh, connection to application server are, uh, is done uh, with the plain simple and uh, is guided uh, by the uh, main database uh, or main uh, yes, main database of the uh, uh, IMS that's a uh, home subscriber uh, and Giovanni, can you maybe stop sharing your screen? The network uh, we have uh, uh, our resident uh, IP server yes can you not share your video? It's not your ugly face uh, that's disturbing. Can you? But uh, you're a bit choppy, so yeah, maybe it will help. Thank you. You were just discussing quality of service, so. Was... Now it's back. Can you hear us now? You have a choppy network, it's not. Oh, sure. No, Colonel Sanders, you're wrong. <laughs> okay, uh, I go forward, I go to you. Yeah, but close your video. Close the camera and go on. Okay, uh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. Um, uh, so, uh, and, and that, that is about application server. Um, uh, so, uh, it would be easy to uh, use uh, uh, this network, uh, just uh, like uh, we were using uh, uh, the uh, internet uh, to deliver our uh, services. And, uh, uh, but that is not uh, exactly what you want. Uh, it's, it's totally feasible, uh, you can do it, but uh, what you want is uh, uh, to be at the level of uh, the carrier, to uh, use the real uh, latency and uh, quality of service, and particularly uh, what you want is uh, to interact uh, with the HSS, uh, so the uh, carrier music database, uh, profiles, uh, and all that. Why that? Because we want uh, a total, complete transparency uh, between uh, desk phones, soft phones, uh, and native smartphone. So, uh, not uh, an over-the-top uh, application, not an app, but uh, your real uh, smartphone, your real uh, LTE phone uh, will interact with uh, uh, your uh, S phone uh, exactly uh, as uh, they are on the same network and managed in the same uh, way. So uh, you can think at, uh, at what is uh, obviously the uh, advantage uh, in an enterprise situation or uh, in a uh, call center, etc. Et uh, it's probably is that it's just very, very complex. Uh, what we need, uh, we actually do we want uh, to be able to model our uh, services in the uh, most native uh, way possible. So, uh, at the level of a carrier or an NDNO exit. And uh, then, uh, last year, uh, we, in, in my uh, presentation, I was delving into uh, more details about how 
uh, to implement a proof of concept that those were LT, uh, but the, the, the core and uh, the application server. And now, let's uh, uh, go back to today. And uh, today, uh, we have uh, open IMSS, and uh, I'm uh, announcing it in here. And uh, what it is, it's, uh, it's a community effort, uh, so to uh, be open with uh, the other things that uh, you will use uh, to uh, a reliable uh, platform that uh, will be able to go into uh, production, but uh, from any kind of uh, uh, point of view. Uh, how we started? We started exactly uh, from uh, my presentation of last year. Uh, so, uh, with uh, um, a Docker complex uh, that, that was uh, uh, built by a superintendent, and uh, from there on uh, we uh, generalized and expanded. Uh, this is uh, the original project from uh, the LSE Red. And uh, uh, what we uh, almost uh, in my life uh, learned is okay, now the concept uh, is okay, uh, we had a lot of fun, now let's uh, talk business. And, uh, so, uh, in, uh, in that project, uh, uh, there were uh, OpenGS and uh, SRS RAN that are uh, contemporary uh, 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 packet core and the radio uh, access network uh, uh, software that are actively developed and uh, the most used. Outside and uh, with uh, some uh, uh, patched uh, canal MS and uh, uh, FH OSX as uh, uh, home subscriber, uh, and uh, then uh, you can add uh, an, uh, an access uh, radio and then uh, you can uh, start your test. Uh, so, uh, we were uh, working mainly on uh, uh, part, that is the uh, real-time communication uh, part, uh, was uh, uh, more or less uh, OpenIMS. That is uh, a project uh, that was uh, uh, ready in 2004 and, uh, from uh, from Hofer, that is uh, the uh, let's say the, the, the German uh, powerhouse for uh, communication technologies. And for example, they made the MP3, if I uh, remember correctly, and uh, they made the uh, SER. Uh, SIP Express router that then uh, became OpenSAR and then uh, became uh, Canary on the basis. So uh, our ancestry uh, is there. And uh, uh, then the IMS modules uh, for SAR were uh, later, later uh, I uh, thank you him. A lot of that, and then uh, let's wait, uh, get uh, get it all and uh, integrated uh, with uh, some patches uh, to those models. Uh, uh, what uh, we want, uh, want uh, when we start, the house uh, of the production ready and complete solution. And uh, that, uh, that was uh, two days. Uh, technology when we are uh, used to, uh, to implement it uh, to, uh, to be able uh, to, to uh, shape it uh, for any kind of uh, contemporary services. And uh, so we have uh, started uh, 
substituting the uh, open IMS or network elements uh, uh, ICNCF, PCNCF, SCNCF, and the uh, HSS, so the database and uh, the various uh, uh, processes, uh, with the contemporary and uh, production ready uh, ones. And what we are trying to achieve uh, for the most uh, performances, uh, observability, maintainability, and uh, the uh, possibility to use uh, uh, this platform in a uh, real uh, environment or with uh, the real production. Um, where we are, uh, we are uh, at the beginning phase, so uh, trying to keep uh, the open source uh, publish often publish uh, early, and we have, we have uh, as soon as we had uh, the uh, whole system ready, working and tested, uh, we published it, and that is uh, on GitHub. Uh, and uh, uh, there is the web site. OpenIMS is using uh, uh, OpenFactJS and SMS Grant uh, by default, but uh, uh, we will see that it can, uh, both of those components can be switched uh, by commercial line or ready uh, in house. Uh, right. And then uh, the uh, tanks uh, to the just incredible uh, work uh, that the open tips has made over the last year uh, about diameter integration and uh, uh, about the programmability of diameter integration, uh, we uh, were able and uh, particularly uh, with uh, a lot of help uh, by uh, uh, OpenSIMS developer uh, to uh, implement uh, uh, the uh, factions of uh, CSCFs uh, into OpenSIMS. So, uh, as uh, we saw uh, in the beginning, uh, now uh, we can have uh, all the uh, IMS uh, 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 proxies uh, as uh, open sims uh, uh, network functions. And uh, then we have the uh, Purin uh, for uh, monitoring metrics and telemetry, and Purin uh, is a uh, companion of uh, uh, Homer and uh, uh, the, uh, we all know, and Purin uh, we will know uh, very soon. Uh, was, uh, uh, let's say, is uh, the companion and uh, uh, next generation uh, kind of big data metrics, telemetry, observability, etc. And then uh, we have Grafan, we have Kurot, uh, we have Protector for the management, etc. Uh, OpenIMS is a complete platform on one uh, Docker code. Uh, you can then uh, use any kind of radio uh, access. Uh, for example, uh, I use the also with the ASL, but uh, uh, can use with uh, different uh, kind of commercial, EMD, uh, GMD, uh, etc. So it's uh, is uh, great. And, uh, and uh, any kind of uh, uh, a packet or uh, that is uh, <coughs> that uh, you can uh, you can use. Then, oops. Yeah. okay, and uh, and uh, it's uh, very easy, and uh, you just need to play a Docker. And then uh, you clone the repository, you build the image. After you get the image, uh, uh, 
you, uh, you can just uh, start uh, all the uh, mm -hmm. and uh, what, uh, what we have now okay. I want to show on the screen okay Okay, and this one. Okay, and uh, uh, this is uh, the interface for uh, uh, setting uh, uh, the subscriber. Uh, so it's the HSS that uh, 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 we uh, are beginning to uh, substitute uh, also FHOSS and it is uh, very heavy and uh, not performing uh, Java application. And uh, so uh, it's where uh, you manage your subscribers, so the SIM cards uh, and the connection between SIM cards uh, and uh, uh, other things. And uh, this is uh, uh, Grafana and uh, is able uh, to show all the time series uh, about uh, the uh, container uh, that are running into uh, the platform. And uh, we have then uh, corrupt that uh, give us uh, 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 a view uh, into the uh, interworking of all the application. And, uh, you see that uh, we have a lot of uh, network functions uh, that are uh, on the uh, on, uh, on the. Uh, on the left, and, uh, and then uh, we have uh, uh, all uh, the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 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 additional and uh, uh, optional uh, monitoring metrics, etc., that are on the right, and uh, in the mid, uh, more or less, uh, we have. Uh, uh, most part of uh, uh, the uh, IMS uh, uh, network functions. And uh, that's uh, again corrupt, that is uh, showing uh, uh, how it goes. And uh, that's container that, that uh, gives us uh, uh, management of all the uh, for all uh, our uh, container that are uh, put and there are. And uh, this is uh, our, uh, let me go back. And uh, that's what I was willing to uh, show you uh, in uh, really in a flash. And uh, I would like to uh, invite you uh, to check it out uh, in, uh, in GitHub and uh, let me uh, show you uh, the GitHub. Uh, Uh, so we, uh, we have both the uh, uh, so we have uh, 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 our website that is uh, openimss.org.com etc. So openimss and uh, uh, 
and uh, we have a GitHub. Also, you can uh, uh, search for Open IMS S, and uh, you immediately uh, find uh, in uh, GitHub. So I hope uh, that I was uh, on time, and, uh, and uh, I, I hope that you were able uh, uh, to hear me. Unfortunately, uh, I had. Uh, uh, Person because I had a little surgery, so they told me uh, not to. Uh, but uh, as you can see, I'm perfectly okay, and uh, I, I miss so much. Of it. There we go. And uh, so, if there are questions, thank you very much, Giovanni. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you. So, um, uh, the last panel of the day here. So we can use some of that time to actually ask some questions about what you just saw. Um, as well, we've got the rest of the members here that have all taken part in. Where are you going, Dad? Where are you going, Dad? Who's here? Yeah, I'm going to go back. We're going to collect our panel members here. Giovanni, you're going to stay with us, right? Can you hear me, okay, Giovanni? Uh, I guess they're uh, directly uh, like that, or uh, I don't know if there is uh, so. It's kind of, it's kind of touch like the, the the Microsoft, Bill Gates, like Apple, you know, Bill Gates on the screen, Steve Jobs down here. <laughs> Do we need a chair? Do you need a chair, you like? Pardon? Do you need a chair? All right, we're collecting our, uh, our members. <laughs> no, I like this. I like. We need that. Yeah, they need that. You don't need that. All right, fine. I won't say anything. Next. Here you go. Here you go. Test. No. Nope. <laughs> Test. Test. Yeah. Look at these people eager to talk. Hold on, hold on. I'm more excited. Yeah, it's cute. Someone's trying to take a picture. Yeah. Yeah. I'm comfortable. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Giovanni, are you in the Summit Slack channel? What, what the? Again? Are you in the Slack channel? The Summit Slack channel? I'll show you one thing. Sure. <laughs> Don't show us your <laughs> Don't stand up. 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 Don't that's that's from my window. Uh, this article is definitely not Texas, definitely not uh, warm. But uh, I know that uh, many of you would like to be here. <laughs> yeah. All right, no man, you haven't eaten the food yet, so. Yeah. All right. Um, that's it. Where's Vlad? Come away. He's in the back of the room is where he is. Hey! Hey! It's kind of <laughs> Come on! It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just for you guys to get familiar with who our panel members are, we've got the Goodman Brothers from Voice Center, 
as Giovanni said, they've been uh, very uh, active in pushing and leading this effort. Um, we've got Razvan from the Open SIPs project who's been helping uh, the, the, uh, the effort along with uh, a lot of the diameter stuff that you saw Giovanni update us on. And you've got Vlad Pai who's also had his hand in some you know, relatively different parts of this. Usually when something's broken and it needs to be fixed fast. Vlad is the man, he's a triage surgeon. Um, why do you have an extra chair over there? Just out of curiosity, was there someone else that we <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, now let's take the opportunity to say congratulations to 50. Wow. Alex became 50 this year. Thank you. And so, uh, not, not recently, not recently, it's not like a happy birthday, but you know, if you need to go like out, you, you made it. Or you can <laughs> sit down and just let us know. We'll no, I'm good. I can do one sandwich. <laughs> so um, I just want to start this panel with this, is that a lot of you guys that are operating in the U.S., obviously this whole thing is based on radio access. So from the perspective of you're not really getting access to you know the providers and the radio networks here, doesn't mean that tomorrow, well, maybe not tomorrow, but shortly down the road you will be. Really, at the end of the day, it's all about money. But what you do need to look at is these types of ecosystems provide a really cool, like, closed network for things like universities, um, for special events, and being able to roll out an antenna yourselves and provide service is pretty cool. So from that aspect, I just want you all to, to look at it from, this is coming for you as far as getting access to, like, the national radio networks, and also there's a lot of facility and being a lot of uh, good stuff you can use it for today, right now. And for you in Europe, you'll obviously know that the radio networks, you know, you're getting access to them much quicker. And probably in several countries you're getting, you already have access to them. So with that, um, I wanted to kind of open the discussion with you guys and say, what did you find to be the most challenging thing as of the update from where Giovanni was showing us where we're at in Athens to where we are today. What was the most challenging aspect of the work that you've done in the last year? I can answer that. Really? Okay. I'll start. Okay. Sure. Uh, the most challenging part was for me to find out how quickly things change uh, in terms of specifications. So we have a version that was released a few uh, months back, then they released a different one which are not compatible. So we need to keep up this work every single year, every single release, every single time they need to change something. This is quite challenging because it requires a genius effort, right? So yeah, this this was quite uh, quite hard for me to to understand the reason behind it. Of course, there are technical reasons, most likely, for the guys that are defining this uh, IMS and 3GPP specifications. But yeah, that, that was for me. Shlami? We think that again, it's a journey that we are just all starting, but uh, there is a big gap, uh, was a big gap, and we are trying to make it uh, shorter and shorter by uh, getting a better observation, better uh, uh, help of the two XIP guys, and really to keep. Because it's such a big uh, system, I think that like most of us not used to have uh, uh, now getting uh, checking uh, what happened with a specific invite over thirty something microservices, and the way and the needs to do a good observation and have one good Docker uh, compose that also giving you all of the logs and the metrics with the. Uh, Quick tools that Warren and uh, Hux and Pega is giving. Uh, so I think it's not uh, just making it work, it's about making it maintainable uh, as well. Uh, um, I think but the most thing from my angle as the CEO was the ability to monetize and to find uh, the right opportunities with this new technology because. Up until now, most of the companies here in the room, I assume, are on voice over IP landline telephony, and let's be honest, it's dead, it's dying. 
and everything is moving to mobile, all termination, but eventually becoming pro or two mobile subscribers. The only part that is obviously left there are the businesses, but then again, if you were to ask any business user uh, why is he using his landline, you would say it because it's part of the business network. Now, and going back a few years forward, I do believe that you know most of our day-to-day uh, -day voice or video communication will be involved around the mobile and LTE network. And recognizing this um, opportunity, I think, was one of the you know largest uh, motivations to try and drive this effort forward. And I think. We this room should be you know, aware of the amount of huge opportunities that there are out there as soon as you are exposed and can have those. The extra feature, as Alex said, just bring your own antenna and start offering a coverage and with a more holistic solution. And not only that, also finding the business flexibility to offer other local network providers that provide the infrastructure to be their voice solution. So there's a lot of going on out there, and uh, I ask you all to join the effort. What happened, Giovanni? Oh my God, we lost the network connection. Oh, um, thank you, Nitsan. So, Vlad, I know that like you've only touched uh, you know certain aspects of this, and I know probably the, the answer is dealing with all these guys coming at me with things last minute, but. For what you have touched, what did you find the most challenging? I guess most challenging I found that uh, the way 3GPP likes to spec out stuff and to... It feels like they did the IMS first as most complicated as possible in order to like, you know, make a, like a high barrier of entry and then they're changing it as often as they can just so that it still stays the same, so like you're always like one step behind the PGP. And anyway, the standard is way, way complicated, complicated role for the internal like pieces of the puzzle that you need. I can't get quite it was like that in the beginning. I feel like they did it on purpose. So that, yeah, yeah, you're you're as upset as the rest of the people that are working on it that they did a really messy job. <laughs> Just like basically threw your puzzle down and then put a a half a box of somebody else's puzzle in there and said major puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I must say that like most of us, the first reaction of uh, looking at the IMS spec is why the fuck they made it so complicated. <laughs> but um, after we were thinking, diving in, and really understand the needs of supporting of roaming, of supporting of multiple regional uh, mobile operators. So. When you are coming up to implementation of a, nation, of a huge national mobile operator and the ability of supporting home, supporting multiple national operators connecting to each other and everything, so the spec is starting to be a little bit more sense. But uh, still, if they can do it a little bit simpler, yes. In the end, the 3GPP is not the IPF. The 3GPP is run by the mobile operators and they have their own interest. And they first of all, to make sure that the tools are there for the big ones and also might be out for the small ones to get into the market. So there is the overcomplicating of the spec but for money, but from the second end, really, when you're looking at the requirement, they almost make sense. Giovanni, can you hear me? Yeah. What do you think, what did you find the most challenging this last year? <laughs> what what I can say is uh, I mean I, I was like a throwback uh, uh, 10, 15 years because uh, uh, one would expect uh, that uh, I mean when you implement the basics. Uh, uh, all will work. And uh, it's not at all like that. Not at all. Uh, so it's uh, IMS uh, and uh, uh, radio is uh, a kind of system that, uh, I mean, is uh, 
supposed uh, uh, to cost you uh, in the probably uh, 10 of millions uh, or more. So it uh, is a very, very, very complex uh, and uh, you uh, must implement the best practices uh, uh, that are kind of uh, uh, complex. Uh, for example, you uh, will never have uh, a basic working without uh, IPsec or uh, all that is uh, related with uh, booking bandwidth for the quality of service, uh, particularly, uh, I mean, about the, the latest ones, but uh, the, the, the most uh, popular ones, uh, they are kind of buggy, or they have maybe, uh, for example, a codec. Uh, at the H264, you expect uh, to have it working and on the OnePlus 6 uh, is back, etc. etc. Et so, the uh, video over LT uh, doesn't work, uh, on uh, uh, OnePlus 6 uh, cannot work, but uh, it's supposed to work, etc. Okay, a lot of things. So, it was kind of a throwback. In uh, the uh, heroic uh, uh, period of uh, our industry, and uh, in, in our day uh, is uh, is a lot of fun, and uh, is uh, something that uh, really uh, let you understand that uh, there is a market space, uh, there is a need for uh, integration, expertise, services, uh, and uh, uh, capability to interact uh, with the ladies. And, uh, okay, stop. <laughs> okay, so basically what I'm hearing from all of you is this is like the perfect time for an effort like this to get kicked on uh, underway. So you guys should consider yourselves, again, being in a space where you have an opportunity to early adopt to something that you know is coming. It just, I think, has been off of a lot of our radars, especially here in the U.S., because just like they said, the barrier to entry is so high, and that's just the technical side, right? In, our, in the U.S., the barrier to entry is money. You know, you look at Comcast, who's one of the only ones that are truly on that Verizon network, right? And you know what? Guess what they put up? Probably hundreds of millions of dollars guaranteed to Verizon to get on that network. So the barrier, that barrier is the one that I'm saying is going to come down. Be ready for it. Yeah, but Alex, Alex, there is a one thing that is very important, particularly for us. Yeah. And uh, 5G uh, will be mainly uh, implemented as a, a private network uh, brought on the factory plant and uh, in the office buildings. So uh, each one will have uh, its own 5G as a network, I mean, instead of uh, uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, so let's offer services on top of private 5G networks. And that's a huge market because uh, uh, you can use uh, uh, CDRS, uh, that is a, a prime um, Aggregator, let's say user band. No, user, uh, user band. Uh, it's like Wi Fi. Uh, you can buy uh, legally uh, a tower for a CBRS uh, 5G uh, that is in that frequency. You can do that. And uh, so uh, a lot of uh, uh, both factory plants and uh, office buildings are doing that uh, for having a, a very uh, fast uh, network instead of Wi-Fi, and uh, uh, I mean, the, the next step will be let's offer services uh, for enterprises, uh, for uh, private companies uh, that runs uh, on top uh, of their uh, already existing 5G networks. Yeah, maybe one a little bit, like the, anything that is based on the U.S. market or citizen-based are starting to get a very high use. 
אין ביטוי. יוז'י אוניסי כמו כמה עם טורקי היום, פרק שאומרים זה לא טוב פרק פיסטי, ארפו דימים, לייקאי, ג'אסדר, ברדי יוג' פירפינג, פרק 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 as just to manage the electricity of this uh, bill. So it's coming, uh, so we are seeing more and more uh, private 5 js uh, uh, project and uh, implementation, and then they are coming to the point that they are saying, okay, if we are having already a cellular network, why we cannot sell uh, phone calls to it? And then they are going and looking on commercial IMS, and then a commercial IMS usually, as uh, Giovanni said, cost like uh, half a million dollars or something like that, and then they are not getting into the IMS world. Uh, this is part of our responsibility and the requirements that uh, we are calling, in, we are, I see it as call for duty for our community to really give the solutions of having an open source IMS that you don't need half a million dollars to implement. So my, uh, my next transitioning question you guys already kind of transitioned to was, you know, what, what are some of the best use examples? So you've said, for instance, enterprises, large factory footprints. Where do you see in one year the best use scenarios moving to? Or rather, what new use scenarios do you see happening as this te technology starts to get more seasoned? So, first of all, we definitely see security companies, security companies, security companies, not just cyber security, but also physical campus territory security companies and a large scale enterprise that would like their own secured, encrypted, wireless network, so everything goes inside the network, nothing goes out. Um, we've seen, of course, governments and several other contracts that we have uh, for uh, security networks that are um, mobile and not necessarily fixed on specific territories. Um, really, really an amazing uh, market that is expanding now. Um, I also been uh, exposed to a drones that fly the mobile network. So. The need for all of those microservices like we developed that maintain some or most of the mobile network, but having that edge computing password, you know, having the important stuff as close as possible to the end users, uh, really in these kinds of situations. So that's the definitely in one direction I recognize the market uh, definitely has high demands for these kinds of solutions. I think that more than all, like, uh, again, it's not the market is a little bit different, but uh, because most of the carriers already move into totally voltage because the bridge is there. But we are seeing, like, the US uh, move closing the bridge, making thousands of operators around the world needed to do the move for an IMS because they cannot be working anymore in the US because there is not circuit switch for them, I don't know if uh, one is aware of it. This is like when you are making a call from a 3 or 4G and moving between of them because of network uh, ability. So most companies move to 4G and over their data network and then took them a while uh, today, I think only around 50% of the mobile operators, even a little bit, uh, have done the move for the IMS. So, it's like a Christmas time that they all of the mobile operators in the world are looking now to uh, for a move. They must move from the circuit switch for a fallback solution into 4 or 5G because. Uh, most countries started to close their bridge. Um, so it's a big demand that uh, in Germany that everyone will be needed to finish in the next few weeks. Uh, I see this uh, very interesting to, uh, the possibility, possibility to add some sort of custom or private solutions to uh, small communities, right? So you can have, I don't know, 
to checking the weather for small communities within a small village and stuff like that. Uh, who probably wouldn't have like a good connection otherwise. So yeah, that's uh, that's one of the things I I'm thinking of. Yeah. Yeah, I can add to that. Like just one month ago, I was uh, uh, with one of our clients and they were they did a project uh, with the Indian government, which working on the mobile hospital network. So all of the uh, Services uh, will have their own mobile uh, 5G network so they can have like uh, emergency situation and a good communication uh, with hospitals and, uh, and uh, the doctors themselves. So I really think that there is a lot of applications that doesn't make sense for the big operators to go and manufacture. But those technology should save life and give better communication uh, to the to us as a human beings. And uh, again, this is motivation of uh, pushing those projects up because it's could be given much more benefit for us as human beings. Like, and what and what You're area next. You're next. Hold on, Jimmy. Glad, glad. Right in front of you, I'll get you in just a second. Go ahead. Yeah, I think it, once it will be easier to do uh, MS with open source, uh, there will be a lot of uh, like just enablers showing up and saying, yeah, I'm MS compatible, and um, here's what uh, like I can offer you to your MVNO platform. And I can see like a big competition going on with lots of MVNEs just showing up, proposing their value-added services on top. And then, of course, we will probably get aggregators. Like, uh, I'll give you like uh, some features from this, and you need some features from that. So I just can see like the whole market going on with various services value added on top. Giovanni, your turn. Sorry to cut you off. Okay, uh, I, I think that uh, another area that is uh, interesting and uh, will have a big growth uh, is all that is connected and uh, related to RCS. RCS is the, uh, let's say, messaging uh, into IMS, uh, into uh, new radio. And, uh, uh, we are, we are used to, to think in terms of like five communication, but the, the real five communication is the smartphone. And in the smartphone, uh, there is the uh, application that is uh, managing uh, the SMS, that actually is an RCS uh, application. Uh, RCS uh, has uh, I mean, one billion uh, features is uh, extremely advanced uh, and uh, uh, we will uh, get more and more uh, used to it uh, uh, really uh, rich uh, services. So, uh, totally and uh, uh, totally integrated into the smartphone, integrated to the core network of the carrier, and uh, that, uh, for example, is already uh, managed uh, uh, into uh, one call center of uh, uh, Open Six, and uh, uh, you know, in the. Uh, what the carriers are uh, very strongly pushing for advanced usage of RCS uh, into commercial environment, both for uh, customer uh, interaction and for uh, internal use uh, in the enterprise. And uh, I think that that uh, will be. Uh, anyway, I, I, I can think of the, uh, thousands of uh, uh, applications uh, uh, for it, and uh, it will uh, for sure uh, one of the places where uh, you can uh, offer services uh, as third party. Okay, so we are pretty much at our time limit. But I wanted to take a few to see if we can field some questions for the, uh, for the panel here. So I'm going to turn it over to you guys to finish out the day. 
Who's got the first question? Why are we here? Right over here? Why are we here? Right over here. <laughs> no, 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 no. You need Why to... are we here? No, right over here. <laughs> Why are we here? Okay. Who wants to feel that? Why are we here? Okay. Smash. Other than the fact that the world chose Houston uh, to come, I would say this. Like, think about how simple it would be. Like, every time you're traveling abroad and you fix your APN configurations or this thing called, and just to get it, to get the internet in the new location when you just arrived with the new SIM provider or whatever. And the board is so many, just provisions a different, just like the NPN we all used to, it provisions a different kind of provisioning to the end user device, which is the IMS part. Now, having the mobile subscribers out there be provisioned automatically to your network, which means each one of the Android or iPhones will now be registered to your IMS. And you will be forwarding the calls. You can do media relay, you can record the calls, you can do real time, you can do all the different applications you could have. But instead of looking at it in the level of a, a MAC address of some IP phone device or some soft phone or web RTC you're running, actually be the IMSI card, okay, the IMSI code over the SIM card, that really, really simplifies services deployments with the uh, you know really wide stack of features especially and with this especially with this thing so you can really provision it remotely immediately the subscriber and uh, to your own core IMS so you don't need that internet infrastructure last mile like you all see us suffering here from Wi Fi and everything and it's always been a struggle. And once you're just sending him a QR code and you're activating the mobile device on your network, gives us a huge opportunity in the near future. Did, did that answer your question? Yes. You sure? Yeah. We have no chocolate, just so you know. Do I have any other questions out here? Okay, great. So just on, uh, just on IMS and private IMS, um, I suppose, how, how are we talking, or how are we, what's the line of thought, you know, when we come into a new country, even with an eSIM, you know, we're connecting to another VMO and getting you know, a roaming or you know, some sort of chart. So, you know, how, how do we sort of, I can understand the use case scenario to private LTE, private 5G, makes a lot of sense, you need to register to something. Um, but when we're talking, you know, this future scale, like what do we think it looks like? So, the, definitely the spec uh, was written to that. So, maybe again, uh, tomorrow we can uh, we didn't mention it, but the second part of the day we are doing the IMS tab and uh, uh, showing everything out that works, so we can uh, show exactly the concept of it. But the concept is that once you are uh, getting into a roaming uh, phone call and getting a phone out, the call already going into the IMS of the, your operator, and then you've been able to end it. So the idea is that uh, it's going from the PCFCF to the ICFCF and then to the ICFCF of the, your hosted operator. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's it. Part of what I was saying earlier, that uh, it's a little bit of a complex uh, uh, infrastructure and uh, complex protocol uh, adjustment, but in the end it's because it's a complex uh, situation that needs uh, some good generic solution for the rate of scale and stuff. Another question? No, you guys want to get out of here, don't you? Uh, it's what? You're hot. Thank you. You got a pretty mouth. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's give these guys a round of applause. Thank you for the knowledge. Thank you for your time, Giovanni. I know it's late there, but thank you so much. We appreciate your commitment.
Ciao, ciao. I'm, I'm sorry for that, really. I'm <laughs> terribly sorry. <laughs> I'm not sorry, YouTube watcher. <laughs> All right, guys. So uh, just let's cover a couple of things. Uh, tomorrow we start at 9 a.m., right? Yep. Nine. Don't look at me like that. I look at the schedule. 9 a.m. Max is at night. Um, we'll have our design clinics tomorrow, so this will kind of roll up our sleeves, get a little dirty. Um, you get a chance to see some of the stuff working rather than just talking theory. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Uh, we'll have a full day. Expect lunch and coffee, all that jazz. And uh, have a really good night. Again, awesome second day. You all did amazing. Proud of you all for like not losing it, going crazy, tearing off your clothes. You know, you guys held it together. Very proud of you. No loss no loss of over uh, big things wrong. Uh, <laughs> well, so. Not yet. Yeah, yeah, that's the other thing. Not yet. Give them my I think somebody lost a tooth in the back from a frisbee, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all dismissed. Have a great night.